It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. Hello again, everyone. I sure hope you're doing well. It is a great day to be alive. It is beautiful outside. Wow, what a lovely day in New York City. I mean, it is just spectacular, and we have a spectacular show for all of you. Uh, First time in a very long time, four in-studio guests. Yes, I said it on Monday, four in-studio guests, and we shall deliver four in-studio guests on today's program. Also want to let you know in a matter of moments, major breaking news. I have major breaking news. Let me get through the business and then I'm going to get right into the breaking news right off the top. Very exciting stuff. As always, we are presented. We have no time to waste today, my friend. We have no time to waste. It's a lot going on. Four in-studio guests, PFL's in town. I mean, this is just a takeover of epic proportions, but the breaking news is not PFL related. I want to let you know that right off the top. As always, oh, that's cool stuff. What is that? Oh, that's Patty the Batty against uh, Stevie Ray back in the day? Yeah, I'm going to talk to him about that. As always, we are presented by our good friends over at uh, DraftKings Sportsbook. They are the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code Hour Again, that's code Hour for a special offer when you sign up. Again, that's code Hour. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Please support them because they support us. Now, like I said, Wednesdays are a very fun time on this program. We answer your questions, and I love doing that. Back end of the show, moderator Lewis already on top of uh, his his gig. I mean, he's already done. He's already submitted the questions. So the buzzer, we need to get a buzzer sound, Frank. Do we have a buzzer sound? Or something like that? Yeah, you could do that. Just record that and play that every Wednesday at around 1 p.m. Eastern, okay? You got it, man. Let me hear it again. There it is. Uh, Buzzer has sounded, so no more questions being accepted. On the nose, back into the show, we answer your questions. The biggest uh, shoot segment of the MMA week that'll come your way at around 4.05 or so. Uh, Around 3.45, we're going to check in with GC, get his picks for the weekend. UFC back at the apex, the palatial, the historic, the iconic UFC apex. Uh, Jamal Hill versus Tiago Santos. It's not a bad card. It's not one of their worst offerings, if I'm being honest. Definitely feels like there's like a three-tiered system now. Pay-per-view, fight night, Apex fight night. That's what it feels like. We're, you know, There's pay-per-view, there's a London card, there's a Long Island card, there's the San Diego card next weekend, and then there's these Apex shows, which are a step above Contender Series. So I guess it's a four-tiered system. Maybe even five, if you want to include. Okay, so we're going to go with pay-per-view, we're going to go with... Fight Night on the Road, we're going to go with Apex, we're going to go with Contender Series, and then Ultimate Fighter. I feel comfortable with that. Uh, so we'll get his picks. Also, what everyone is waiting for, the third leg week of our official MMA parlay, but now with the twist of having Mysterious Frank, and I'm actually going to add a twist to the twist. Stay tuned for that. Anything goes, can pick any fight, parlay it up. And uh, you'll go home a winner. We'll get into the four in-studio guests. We're going to have Stevie Ray, the pride of Scotland, who had that incredible body triangle win over Anthony Pettis just a few weeks ago. They're going to rematch on Friday, MSG Hulu Theater in the main event, semifinals of the lightweight tournament. And we're also going to be joined by Anthony Pettis in studio to talk about that. Of course, we've had Pettis on a gazillion times. I mean, a million times. Never in studio, I do believe. So that's going to be fun. So Pettis and Ray, not together, in studio today to talk about the Friday fight. Semifinals, of course, million dollars up for grabs. Joshua Silvera, who's one of the absolute rising star prospects in the sport, light heavyweight, the son of Conan Silvera, headman over at ATT, grew up with BJJ around him, obviously, 9-0 and now, light heavyweight prospect, going up against Omari Ahmedov. Who had, I mean, this dude has been there, I mean, for a long time in the sport. UFC fought wide men, fought everyone. Now in uh, PFL, this is a semifinal fight in the light heavyweight tournament. So we'll have Joshua Silvera in studio too. Very high on him. One of the brightest prospects in PFL. And the PFL CEO, Peter Murray, is going to stop by, talk about a lot of their business dealings as of late. They just announced PFL Europe. They announced um, some changes to the playoff format. 
Uh, they're going to Cardiff. They're going to London in the next few weeks. Uh, they've been active as far as signing guys are concerned. Obviously, we had the ESPN deal a few uh, months ago. We had the Kayla Harrison deal a few months ago. So a lot to talk to Peter Murray about. He'll join us in studio at around 1.15. So four in studio guests, no Zoom guests today, which is great. I'm looking forward to it. And of course, PFL in town, Friday, Hulu Theater, New York City. There's a rumor, you know, that Hilwani might be in attendance, a rumor. All right, I can't. And, what? And, and, and my streak of not going to an MMA event since March of 2020 might come to an end. We'll see. It's TBD. Now, Frank, we do have some breaking news. Thank you for that, Frank. Uh, breaking news, speaking of New York City, speaking of Madison Square Garden, speaking of the Mecca, speaking of the world's most famous arena, speaking of the home of the 2023 NBA champion New York Knickerbockers, uh, I'm being told right now, multiple sources telling me that the highly anticipated, much discussed grudge match between one Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler is close to being finalized for that return card at MSG in November. I do believe it's November 12th, if uh, memory serves me correct. And so it is uh, close and likely for that card, slated for that card. Not quite a done deal just yet. Oh, look at look at GC with the lower third right there. Uh, not quite a done deal just yet, but it would be UFC 281. And you will recall just a few weeks ago, I said, this is the card, have Izzy at the top, with Pejeda, I know they're talking about that. Still TBD, whether that would be the main event. Glover versus Yuri would make a lot of sense as well. Have Patty on there, have Molly on there, and then you give everyone what they want. The fight that's been discussed, dating back to when Chandler signed with the UFC. Chandler versus Poirier, we saw in July, uh, earlier uh, last month, International Fight Week, they're in the arena. There's a bit of an exchange of words. Gilbert Burns got it on his phone, and we all needed to see what would happen with Nathan Diaz. And once that other shoe dropped, so to speak, and once we knew that Diaz was not going to resign and they were going to give him Hamza Chemaev, that left Poirier open. And once we found out that Conor McGregor isn't coming back this year, um, at the earliest 2023, I mean, that fight just made all the sense in the world. world. Remember, they were in Abu Dhabi, uh, when Dustin beat Connor in the rematch, the second fight, there was a lot of tension there. Uh, Dustin didn't like how Chandler was kind of being used to put pressure on the whole situation, also being used as the backup without fighting in the UFC coming over from Bellator. And you'll recall both of them talking about each other on this very show. Uh, there's, there's, there's a rivalry there, and this is a heated grudge match. I can't wait for this. I mean, this was the fight to make. And so, again, Michael Chandler, Dustin Poirier, close, likely, not finalized. Let's not get crazy, but it's all moving in that direction, and uh, I think that's very exciting. I think that, it, I mean, that's the fight to make. What do you think, GC? Is that the one, or were you hoping for something else? Nah, I'm down for that. That's going to be fireworks. I mean, that is... We'll be in attendance as well. When you say we, who are you referring to? The whole crew? Uh, the MAR I, Mafia? Oh, I think he's Will. I, 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 I could guarantee Frank will be there. I will definitely be there. That much. You're going to that, Frank? Because of this news? Because of this news. Wow, this is what put you over. Yeah, I was actually like, look, I'm never going to MSG again. And then you found out about and this? And then this, I'm like, I... I last two minutes, last you changed your minutes. mind. Wow. Right when I hit the breaking news button. I mean, that is big. That is big. Um, I can't... I mean, I, I love this fight, and I can't wait to see what... I... I am hearing that uh, Jones Stipe is still something that they want to make. Not a lot of headway there. Curious to see if they would put this on the MSG card or curious to see if they would try to do it for the year-end show in Las Vegas. If it's uh, if it's the year-end show, then I think Izzy and Pajeda are the main event. I think you might want to put a second title fight on there just for kicks, give Glover his MSG fight, and uh, have him rematch Yuri. I mean, I feel like the, the main card is like an easy one to make. Patty Molly have to be on there unless you're going to put, you know, Molly on the prelims just to boost it a little bit on ABC or ESPN or whatever. Uh, and then Dustin Chandler as the third fight under the title fights. Or, I mean, you could really, I mean, Dustin Chandler is a co-main event fight. So there you have it. Uh, looking forward to seeing if that will get finalized, moving in the right direction. Speaking of uh, 
Conor McGregor, uh, some news this morning, first reported by Deadline, he is going to be uh, featured in the Roadhouse remake. Uh, Roadhouse That's is a awesome. film. Yeah, you're excited about this, Frank. Super uh, we were, excited. Have you seen Roadhouse? No. Oh, you haven't? Why Honestly, are you so excited? I yeah. Well, what are you so excited about then? The excitement. <laughs> How could you be excited about something you haven't seen? Okay, did I ever say I was excited? Yeah, you did ask Yeah, me you did, yeah. Look, I'm excited. It's fun news. Not only that, you texted us about it yesterday. You're breaking the fourth wall here. Uh, and then New York Rick had to give you the history lesson that, and this is what's, I mean, weird about the whole situation even more so, is that way back in the day when she was on top of the MMA world, Ronda Rousey was tapped as the sort of Patrick Swayze role, whatever that role is. I don't know what that name is. Um, name of the character. Uh and then that fizzled, and now it's Connor. Now I don't think Connor is reprising that role. I think that's Jake Gyllenhaal. Are you big uh, Jake Gyllenhaal fan? I heard. Yeah, I could say that. Yeah, favorite. I actually love Gyllenhaal. Really, favorite oh, Gyllenhaal great. movie? Prince of Persia, obviously. There you go. There you go. He's great in Spider Man. He is great in Spider. Prince of Persia. That's the uh, the cartoon the video about game like. One. Hmm. Oh, it's Prince of Egypt. I'm thinking of. Yeah. What's the difference? I love Prince of Egypt. That's a good one. Yeah, it is a great one. Um, but I would say Zodiac is probably my favorite film with him in it. He was in that? Yeah, he was the main character. I once saw him riding a bike in Central Park. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's random. It is random. But I was Jarhead's very, good? Uh, Classic. Jarhead is, cl yeah. I don't know how many Jake Gyllenhaal Donnie movies. Donnie Darko? Like. Donnie Brasco? It said Donnie Darko, but. Mm. Okay. <laughs> the day after tomorrow. October Sky. God. Brokeback Mountain. October Sky. Broke the sequel back. to No. No, November Rain. Is Brokeback the biggest one? Uh, it's probably what he got the most awards for, yeah. I don't know any of these, if I'm being honest. I mean, heard of them. Enemy, Prisoners, End of Watch, Source Code, Brothers, Lonely Island. What are these movies? Day After Tomorrow. I can promise you I will see the new Roadhouse. You're going to see it? It's, a, it's an Amazon Prime exclusive. Does that make you feel differently no, about it's it? It's actually a huge bummer. Frank loves these movie theaters, Alamo, Draft House theaters. Uh, he's always trying to get me to go. That would have pushed me over to go. Yeah. By the way, I didn't know this. He was in City Slickers. Do you know City Slickers with Billy Crystal? That's, I mean, I've heard of it. One, oh my gosh. See, that to me is shocking. Uh, anyway, I guess he had a small role because that was 1991. I'm a big Jake Gyllenhaal fan, as you can tell. So that's big news. Uh, congratulations, Connor, his first motion picture. Um, and also I just want to say that I, I am doing today's program, despite all the breaking news, with a heavy heart. I was very sad to hear about the passing of Vince Scully, the legendary baseball broadcaster, in my opinion, the greatest baseball broadcaster of all time and one of the greatest sports broadcasters of all time, but without a doubt, the greatest baseball broadcaster. I would listen, especially when the Expos were playing the Dodgers, I would try to listen to the games, try to watch the games later on when we had like MLB.TV and all that stuff. And it was just such a pleasure to listen to Vince Scully tell you stories, put you to sleep. The way he broadcast baseball, and that's the greatest compliment that I could give him, is almost like he was telling you a bedtime story. It was so poetic, and it was just so lovely. The sounds, the fact that he knew when to lay out, when not to speak. Um, everyone loved him. Everyone respected him. Kind of the closest thing that I think sports broadcasting has ever had to Walter Cronkite. Everyone loved Uncle Vin. Uh, everyone trusted him. Everyone enjoyed listening to him. Everyone wanted to listen to him. And he's had some of the greatest calls in the history of the game. Uh, most notably, 1988, of course, Kirk Gibson, injured ankle, walks up to the plate, hits the home run off of uh, Dennis Eckersley. And then he has that line. And you know what's crazy? I actually said the line uh, in my crappy way, because I'll never be one one hundredth as talented as that man's left pinky. Uh, but I actually said the line on the night Tyron Woodley knocked out Robbie Lawler, July 30th, 2016. The anniversary was just three days ago. I was doing the uh, the post-show wrap-up with uh, Jed Mishu in Atlanta. And 2016 is the craziest year in UFC history. And I said, in a year that has seen, uh, what was it? In, in a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. And that was a nod to Vince Scully because he he said that when uh, Kirk Gibson was rounding the bases going like this. You know this moment, right, Frank? You've heard of this moment? Clearly. In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. And it's just one of the greatest 
calls of the history of the game. And also what I love so much about it is then he just lays out. He's quiet. You don't always have to. That's actually one of my big pet peeves with uh, fight sports and broadcast sometimes. Like there's too much talking. There's too much speaking during the walkouts, during the moments. Like sometimes it's okay to just let it all play out. Let it all just kind of breathe. And uh, no one did that better than Vince Scully. What an absolute legend. And uh, he will be missed. He will forever be missed and the game will not be the same without him. So I just wanted to say that heavy heart, condolences to his family, 94 years young, what an incredible life and legacy. And uh, we appreciate all the memories. It was great. I wish that I could be one 100th as good as that man's left foot. I will never be that. He is just one of a kind. Anyhow, let's get into our uh, in-studio guests. Our first one is ready to go, PFL CEO. What a great pleasure and honor it is to be joined by the one and only Peter Murray. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hey, Ariel. Great to Good be to see here. You. Great how are you, sir? You. Welcome, welcome. Have Thank a seat. You. I mean, what a busy day for you guys. New York Stock Exchange, MMA Hour. Talk about going from the penthouse to the outhouse, right? No, you're there ringing the bell. You got some great. This is a great setting, you guys. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yours. First time, I believe that uh, you have been here, right? In studio. Yes, yeah, of course. You've been on the show. Yeah, you were on Zoom not that long ago. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for stopping by. We've got the three other fighters stopping by as well. Yeah, you got Pettis, Stevie, Pettis, Ray, Silvera coming. It's great. Uh, you guys are in New York, uh, Hulu Theater. I was just laying it all out. Uh, Friday night, uh, the beginning of the playoffs. You're going to New York, Cardiff and uh, London. London, which is huge because you're going to make your debut over there. Right. And so a lot going on. I actually asked uh, the audience this earlier today, and I was polling some managers, by the way. I don't know if you know this. I was texting some managers. I wanted to know who's the number two promotion in mixed martial arts in the world right now. I was curious. And I'll tell you, I asked six managers, four said PFL, one said one, one said Bellator. And then I polled the audience as well, right. and I got some interesting results. Who is the number two promotion you know, in the majority world? Majority rules. Yeah. You know, the Stop the no. count. Yeah, you know, listen, by, by all metrics in all sports, you know, we're the number two in the world. You know, as, as you look at the quality of the production, the caliber of the roster, um, broad reach in terms of our premium distribution, uh, access for fans, U.S., international. We distribute to 160 countries. Our commercial business. Uh, so when you, you, you really compare that way. And, and what, I, what I want to tell you is you know, we're, we're happy about our leadership position as number two. There's so much growth ahead, A, for the sport, B, for the PFL, and we're not concerned about anyone else in the sport. We're focused on what we're, what we're building, and you know, quite simply, we're, we're, our focus is on advancing the sport, growing the sport around the world, and giving fighters an alternative – and, and an opportunity to compete on a major stage against top competition here in the U.S. and now internationally. Well, I would agree with those managers. I think you can make the very strong case right now. Uh, your production, the broadcasts have been great. I think very highly of your announced team. I love the announced team. Um, the deal with ESPN is huge for you guys, obviously. And I will be the first to say, and I think you know this, I was critical of the format. I was openly critical. I am now buying in. I now like it. There are stakes. I understand that on Friday, Stevie Ray and Anthony Pettis are fighting for this. I understand that Olivia O'Brien, I get it. It's not just a bunch of fights. And I like that. So I want to give you guys credit for that because I was openly critical and now I'll say I was wrong. Well, I remember, I mean, there are many skeptics. And anytime there's, you know, disruption in any space, and in this case, a sport, you know, there's always going to be naysayers. That's not how it's done. But our view was we were solving something, solving something for athletes, solving something for fans, solving something for, you know, candidly, uh, sports media platforms and companies. And so, you know, at the end of the day, and you know this better than anybody, without great fighters, nothing matters. But our differentiators, the sports season format, the technology, as well as our storytelling, you combine that, it's, it's different. It's premium, it's innovative, and uh, it, it's a new experience for fans. And we cater to avid MMA fans. So fans of other, uh, you know, properties, uh, they want access to more quality MMA. And we also have the data that the PFL is bringing over non-avid fans because of our true sport principles. Mm, okay. That is interesting. Uh, by the way, do me a favor. If you don't mind just bringing that um, microphone a little sure. bit closer to you so we can hear you. I understand that you are changing up the playoff format a little bit, right? Or at least the way things are going to 
proceed from here. Can you explain that? Uh, there's nuance and, and changes each year, A, to the rules of, uh, of the league and the season. And, and as it relates to the playoffs, at least on our cards, what I could share is we really thought about how to curate an entire event beyond the semifinal you know, fights, the four fights on, on each event, which those are the main events. Those are the fights where it is. Win in advance, lose and go home. The winners in that semifinal get to the, get to the championship. Our championship, six world title fights, and you know, major belt for for the calendar year, so to speak, in the, in the PFL, and a major purse of one million for each for each athlete. But the other additions that we made is, I call it a card with purpose. It's do or die for every fight. We have two uh, two lead in fights to the semifinal fights, where those fights will determine. Who gets a, a a slot on the 2023 PFL season roster? Mm. And, you know, the, the two fighters who win, they'll punch their ticket and they're in. And and some of those fighters may return. The the losers, they're no they're either gonna no longer be in, in the season or or they're they're gonna miss that shot to get in at this time. So there's high stakes. And so uh, we're really focused on curating every fight counts, you know, not just the semifinal fights. And then on the top of the card later at night, we have, uh, you know, additional four matchups where we're focused on you know, our Challenger Series franchise, a new franchise we launched this year for with Fubo for early stage fighters who are in their pro career, who are looking to further develop and get their shot in the season. So those four fights um, will determine who gets a, a, okay. a, a slot in the 2023 Challenger Series. And one of those fighters from this past season, Josh Silvera, now in the tournament fifth seed after Antonio Carlos Jr. had to pull out so he could end up winning a million dollars. It's amazing. And but he earned that slot. Sure. We didn't put him put him in there because, you know, by chance, listen, he was the alternative who who earned that position. He had a great knockout, earned him six points or or, or the finish. And then unfortunately, you know, there was an injury, but he's stepping in. And this is a big moment for for Josh. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of business things that I want to ask you about. You mentioned the championships later on uh, this year. That's where you have the titles um, and the million dollars on the line. Will that be on ESPN or will that be on pay-per-view this year? Uh, we haven't announced that yet. Okay, uh, you could so, do it here if you know, you'd more like. More to come, and we're working. No with better the, place than we're working. Yep, yeah, we'll come back. Okay, and uh, we're working with ESPN on all those details, and uh, it'll be broadly distributed. I mean, you know, working with ESPN here in the U.S. Uh, and as you know, our, our partner up in Canada, and uh, but outside the U.S., there's a number of ways in which to access the championship through our, our, our media partners globally. Uh, will you do a pay-per-view this year? Uh, we haven't announced that yet, but okay. we, we, we have announced that, uh, you know, we're, we're launching our pay-per-view division next year. Okay, next year. Correct. Okay. Is there a chance you might sneak one in? There is a possibility okay. this year, but uh, we are focused on the, the Super Fights division next year. And what does that mean when you say super fights? Yeah, the, the, I mean super fights. Uh, you so know, non-tournament, we, non-season, non-tournament, non-season format, and uh, we will put some major cards together, major events together. Uh, that will be global. That will be made up of you know what I would call needle moving uh, matchups and talent, and some creativity in how we put those cards together. You know, fights that fans want to see, including crossover. So for us, it's fun. You know, it's going to open up the aperture, I think, of our brand and of our model. And, um, you know, if you envision a, a pyramid, as I, as I look at our talent development uh, system, as well as our sort of content portfolio of franchises, what sits at the bottom is now the Challenger Series. You know, we're developing that next stage of, you know, ideally future champions and stars. Uh, and then in the heart of that pyramid sits our season. You know, that, that is the cornerstone of the PFL, that format. But now we're layering on top of that a pay-per-view division. And what that all means is, I mean, last year in 2021, we had 10 events, our season. This year, 18 events. We had eight with our Challenger Series, 10 with our season. We're in our playoffs right now. Next year, there'll be 30 events from the PFL. Really? So, yep. Wow. 30 events. And, 30 event, and that includes PFL Europe? That's right. So Tell me you, about PFL Europe. Sure. So like, I'll break down like as it relates to numbers. You got Challenger Series this season. So Challengers will be eight. Correct. Ten for the season. Yeah. And then we're we're estimating at least two uh, pay per view fights for you know that's you know twenty events. Wow! And then you have uh, PFL uh, Europe, which we announced, and we're also going to launch a combine, and those are unique you know events, and and that's going to be part of the system too. 
So a combine works for like the NFL like combine. Like the NFL, like the what NBA. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it's an opportunity to identify, a measure, and and sign talent, and uh, through invitation only, athletes around the world measuring physical, mental capability inside wow. and outside of the cage, working with all the top gyms in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, supporting some of those athletes to try to get into the PFL. So a new way to uh, identify talent. And then we have the Challenger Series. And uh, on PFL Europe, what we're excited about is, listen, global expansion. This sport is global. It's really why we launched the league. You know, the premise, fastest growing sport in the world, uh, more room for more than one leader, uh, fighters, athletes, uh, candidly, uh, that, that have the caliber talent, they just didn't have enough opportunity and, and stages to compete on against top competition. And so um, with respect to outside the U.S., 80% of the fan base in MMA, over 600 million fans, outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we really assessed first for fighters, you know, is there, not, is, is there enough talent around the world who can compete uh, on a global stage like the PFL sees it? Um, and then regionally, we, we quickly ass assess that there's so much regional talent. I mean, Europe is massive. And, and, I mean, fighters are hungry to compete. And there's no real system. So we say, you know what, we're going to launch regional leagues around the world under the PFL brand, the PFL platform, the PFL format, regular season playoff and a championship. Mm. And we'll have multiple weight classes in Europe, men and women, who will be – Competing in that uh, in that format starting in uh, 2023, where then we'll we'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, bring up European champions of the PFL, and those champions will then have an opportunity uh, to for a path to get into PFL Global. So it's really part of the system, and then our vision is multiple regional leagues around the world. And because I know so, you've talked about UAE as well, right? Will be PFL UAE. There will be PFL Africa. There will be PFL Asia. Wow. Uh, perhaps China. It's not going to all happen overnight. Right. But we're very focused on it in all of those markets. And, you know, it starts with one. And what I could tell you once, you know, we announced the one and, 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 and you know, we, we will fast follow with additional announcements. And then essentially we've created the Champions League of MMA. Interesting. So um, PFL Europe. Will we be able to watch that? Absolutely. We'll distribute it. Those events in Europe will be staged live in Europe in yeah. prime time, different cities throughout uh, you know, that region, uh, but we'll also distribute it globally. And I'm assuming they're not fighting for a million dollars, right? They're going to fight for a big purse relative to where they are and right. you know, their journey as professionals in the sport. When do you think that launches? Like, when's the first? Uh, event? That'll launch in first quarter, twenty twenty three. Oh wow! Have you guys started to sign people yet? Absolutely. For that? And wow. then on signing, you know, as, as we look at the Cardiff cards, yeah, and we look at the London cards, we, we're we've launched we're launching the the first ever PFL uh, Europe qualifiers. Okay. So we'll have four fights on each of those cards where we'll and fighters from throughout Europe, including UK fighters, who will be fighting for for the first spots. In PFL Europe. Wow. So it, it's already on. Game on. So this uh, combine, I, I just want to ask you one more question about that. Like I'm, I've watched the NFL combine. I love the NBA draft, obviously the draft combine. Yeah. I know what they, I see them running. I see them. It will it be something like that. That'll be televised where like I'm a two and O guy training at ATT. I come in and there's scouts who are working exactly. for, we'll have, we'll have some of the best experts in the sport measuring striking capability, measuring kicking capability, technique and power, measuring strength and condition, uh, measuring grappling, measuring defense, even mental sort of capabilities and reactionary skills um, with, with other technology. So, and then, you know, there'll be a skills competition and, you know, getting in the cage will be part of it as well. So, um, you know, we think the sport is ready for it now. There's enough talent. And, and for us, we are the league of access for fans. Fans want to know, you know, how, you know, who these athletes are, where they come from, why, why, you know, what do they fight for? Why do they fight? But how do they get in? Mm. How do they develop? So we're really going to, you know, bring the cameras behind the scenes. And with Ray Cepho, our president of fighter operations, our fighter ops team, plus a broader advisory group within MMA who will help us measure and make decisions as we, you know, again, develop athletes and sign them at different stages of their career. 
as you know, that's very important, but it's also important to have like, you know, the big time names, right? Sure. And you guys have been active in that regard, you know, signing a Rory, signing a Showtime Pettis, guys like that, established names. Sure. So that people tune in and then there's a trickle down effect and hopefully sure. they stick around and see a Kayla Harrison who at that point is a one and oh and stick around for her in the future. How active are you guys going to be? You know, there's some big names who are about to hit the market, probably none bigger than Nathan Diaz. And I know he's still under contract. He has one more fight, but like, do you have interest in guys like that? Of or? course, of course. And and what I could tell you is we're in all those all the conversations when fighters go into free agency. And, you know, now we're, we're a global brand and we're trusted. You know, earlier days when we were just starting out, it was it was challenging. It's okay. You got to build trust. Mm. You got to prove yourself. You got to execute. And we we have proven that uh, you know we have a model that works and we're built for the long term. And it's now an alternative for not just fighters who are uh, on the come up, but but established fighters who are ranked in the top ten, the top five, the top three, and number one. So, you know, we're here to stay, we're here to play and compete. And uh, not only are we going to develop our own talent through our system, we'll certainly continue to sign major, ma major fighters. So specifically, like once a Diaz is available, Nathan Diaz, you will have that conversation? Uh, absolutely. Wow. That's, a, that's absolutely. I mean, I don't think a lot of people would expect that, but you guys are ready for that. Well, I mean, what is there to be ready for? Right. Uh, you know, he's obviously going to command a lot of money. Uh, we have we have capital, you guys are good. <laughs> we have the wherewithal. I like it. And um, you know, we're we're you know, I mean, we're not a regional player, we're a global player, and now we're investing in the future. You know, as I talked about new franchises and year round content, year round events for fighters at every different stage, including the top stage. Mm. Uh, I remember a few years ago when Shane Burgos was a free agent, you guys were very sure. close to Love signing Shane. him. Now he's going to be potentially one again, right? He just fought his last fight. Any interest in revisiting that? No, the Shane, Shane's of the world. Listen, we, we saw him early days. Uh, you know, he's currently locked up. And when he has the ability to talk outside of his contract, you know, we look forward to that opportunity. Do, do you feel like managers are starting to respect you guys in terms of like when someone is available, a Shane, a Nate, they're coming to you as opposed sure. to just, you know, back in the day, I feel like it was like, all right, you know, last fight on the deal, let's just re-sign. Let's not test the market. Let's not test the waters. I was surprised Anthony Smith didn't test the waters. He did sign it. Maybe it was for the 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 best because he ended up injuring his leg. But like, are they coming to you? Are you, are you yeah, getting a heads have, up? Of course we have more inbound. Okay. You know, we, we have relationships with the top managers in the world. And, um, you know, we have a tracking system and uh, we're open for business. Fighters know that. Managers know that. And in the end, you know, our focus is on fighters who are confident. And, um, you know, there's a different aspiration today as, as fighters grow up in this game. There's more alternatives. So, you know, as you look at and, and we, we look at all different sports as we're building the PFL in in soccer and i know you're a soccer fan as well and you know beyond basketball and mma but there are nine leagues in the world made up of the some of the best soccer players or football players depending upon you know what part of the world you're in um nine leagues that generate more than a a, a billion dollars in revenue wow and so you know the world's number one sport you know soccer um there's talent from all over the world that it's the highest level and they have alternatives and you know we view this sport very very similar to that and that's what we're creating, those options for athletes. And, and candidly, this fan base is underserved. It's underserved. There's not enough quality MMA year-round on the calendar for fans. And who says they just have to watch on Saturday night? Mm. And uh, so, you know, that, that's what we're excited about. You have a long history in the business of sport, working for Under Armour, NFL. Uh, you come over to PFL. What year was it? 20... 2017. 2017. Yeah, like 2017. We launched, the, we, we launched the league in 2018. Would you have imagined, you know, four years later that you'd be where you are right now, or is this happening sooner than you expected? No, I, listen, this is a high growth venture. I mean, you know, the vision was from day one, what we were building um, with our co-founders, my partner, Don Davis, the other co-founders and our ownership group. I mean, we, we, we've assembled, you know, one of the most impressive ownership groups in sports uh, with investors and capability across the NBA, NBA owners, NHL owners, you know, Ted Leonsis, uh, Major League Baseball owners, Mark Lerner, Major League Soccer owners, Ted Siegel, he owns the Houston Dynamo, and, uh, and other, um, you know, major investors in, um, you know, not only broader business, but media and technology and entertainment. 
You know, we just closed uh, our last round with Alex Rodriguez. We're very excited and privileged to have Alex not only invest but join the board. Um, you know, major media moguls like uh, Waverly um, sort of capital. So, you know, when, when you talk about do you have the ability, are you mm -hmm. ready for, you know, we have industrial strength in our ownership group, on our management team. We have a vision that we've been focused on since day one. And now we're on that next stage of growth. And, you know, it starts with more, more content and uh, a more robust year-round calendar of events with different franchises. Were you worried at all during the pandemic? You guys took the break. Was there any type of fear that you wouldn't be able to return? It halted your momentum a little bit. Sure. Naturally. Was there any sort of fear that, wow, we had something, we were building something, and now it just came to an end? How are we going to get back on track? Yeah, no, listen, that was, uh, you know, the, I mean, you know, 2020 was, was tough on everyone, right? In society and, and in business and, of course, in sports. And, you know, MMA, I mean, what UFC did throughout that time period was really, really impressive and great for the sport. For us, um, it did stop some of our momentum. Uh, we did uh, reschedule that season. But candidly, I'm really proud of the team because we then focused. We got back in the, in the bunker, back in the lab, and we focused on making the product better. Mm. We focused on expanding the roster and, and, and you know, essentially uh, elevating the caliber of talent, which we did. And so that time together really was a good opportunity to sort of look at what was working for us, look at where we had challenges or opportunities. We focused on that. And then really we came out, you know, super strong in, in 2021. It was a real catalyst for our business and helped drive to where we are today. This is all very positive stuff, but I do want to ask you sure. about Chris Wade. He's been very vocal about being unhappy with what he's getting for the playoffs. He's been in the organization for several years now. I'm sure you've seen his comments. I believe he said he's getting 30% less was what he, uh, you know, kind of uh, approximated. What do you make? Is there any truth to what he's saying? And and where are you guys at with Chris now? Oh, uh, you know, hey, listen, I, I like Chris Wade. You know, he's a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. He's a fighter. And, you know, we're seeing something out of Chris that we didn't see in earlier years this season. He's hungrier. Hmm. And he's in a different weight class. He wants it more. So it's exciting to watch that. He's got a healthy chip on his shoulder. I respect that. With respect to his compensation, he's, he's got an opportunity to earn a million dollars. That's what he should be focused on. Okay. So what he's saying about the 30% and all that? Is... I, I think he's interpreting the mechanics of our, okay. our of our playoffs and how it works. But uh, we're good with Chris, and uh, we're appreciative that he's he's fighting for us. We don't get a lot of uh, complaint. You know, it's, it's kind of in vogue these days to complain about fighter pay sure. and fighters complaining about their pay and whatnot. Don't get a lot of that from you guys. So I guess that's why the Chris comments kind of stood out because I don't hear of a lot of unhappiness. Yeah, I your... think, you know, prof you know, the one thing that makes me really proud, Ariel, is I can't tell you how many times fighters within the organization or fighters who come to our events uh, talk about how well the PFL treats them. But it's first on a human level, and then it's on a professional level. We treat all of our fighters as partners, not transactions. Uh, you know, from Ray Cepho down throughout the entire team. You know, the fighter ops team, the events team, the marketing team, and um, you know, professionals in our name. And I think these fighters really now understand that. Again, going back to alternatives, like this is how. It should be structured. This is how fighters should be treated. And what we do provide them is, in our view, an opportunity to make more money. Mm. And that's an incentive for them to come on over, not just in their show and win, but, you know, in, with a big purse, you know, for, for champions and so much more to come. So, you know, again, we, uh, we pride ourselves in how we treat the fighters. And listen, you can't make everybody happy all the time. Where are we at with Cyborg? We going to make this fight? Cyborg, Kayla? What's I, going on? Listen, I think that's the fight that fans would like to see. That's a fight that uh, the PFL would like to get behind. Kayla said she wants that fight. I think it's going to come down to Chris Cyborg. Does Chris Cyborg want that fight? And whether Chris, Chris decides to come over to the PFL to make that fight and perhaps other fights happen, that's one scenario. And another scenario is a co-promotion. So and we're proponents of both. Right. Any talks with Chris? Because isn't she free, like, right about now? Uh, our understanding is she is a free agent. So what do we got? We'd like to make that fight happen. Any talks yet? There have been, there, there's certainly been outreach. Okay. And, uh, we're looking forward to getting into it in earnest. This is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is great. I love the way you're dancing around this, but no that's dancing. exciting. That's no, ex there's no dancing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the, there's, there's no 
it's not a surprise or it's not new news that, you know, this is a fight the PFL would like to make happen or Kayla. And so, um, you know, I think uh, in the coming weeks, uh, you know, we're looking forward to uh, seeing what's possible. Any uh, names that you're talking to right now that you can share with us? Some of the top free agents who uh, who, are, who are out there, and then we're we're we're, we're chomping that the bit for uh, the next you know stage of free agents to uh, actually be confident enough to be free agents. Right, that's and, a big thing, and it's in their best interest as athletes. Right. Um, I saw you with Clarissa Shields today, right? She was at the New York Stock Exchange. When is she going to fight for you guys again? Well, she she's tra- training for one of the biggest fights in sure. her pro career in boxing right now. Um, uh, it's for Savannah. Uh, and that'll happen uh, in September. Yep. And uh, following that, she's going to make her third pro uh, MMA fight um, in November. Oh, wow. On our championship card. We haven't announced that. So uh, she's going to, in September, after that boxing uh, bout, she'll then transition into full MMA mode. And she'll be on the uh, November card. Okay. Do you know where the uh, championship card will be at? We do. We haven't announced it yet. (laughs) But you know what? I'm going to tell you first. And we can announce it here. And it's it's coming up. Oh, I thought you were going to do it right now. It's coming up. I can't. You know, we're excited about it. And and, uh, it's a market that we're we're looking forward to uh, returning. Uh, I was very excited about this weekend because it was going to be you guys on Friday and then Jake Paul on, on Saturday. Unfortunately... The Jake Paul fight didn't happen, but you guys are still uh, running in New York, which is great. Sure. You've held some big events here back in the day at the uh, Hulu Theater Championship events. I know there was like some flirtation with uh, Jake on social media and whatnot. W- w- did anything ever come of that? We, we have a relationship with, with, with Jake. And, you know, listen, you, you think about what Jake has built for himself and, and in, as, as now an athlete. Uh, versus where he came from, what he's taken on, and the opponents, and and the platform he's built. It's, it's nothing short of impressive. Yeah. And he's ambitious, um, you know, from a business perspective as as well as an athlete. And um, you know, should he want to take on um, MMA, uh, that's something that we, we'd certainly be excited about. Any concern about oversaturation? Oversaturation, meaning of, too much of a PFL g- product, or yeah, but not. I mean, so you say thirty next year. Yeah. UFC has forty three. Sure. Uh, Bellator has their 20-something. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a lot of events for sure. the consumer, right? Now, not everyone has to watch every single one of them, sure. but is there ever the concern that too much of a good thing is not yeah, a good thing? I think it's a good question for any organization. You know, the NFL, it's, you know... You know, they, they have, have their little short window. Six, only 16, right. you know, regular season yeah. you know, games. 17 now. 17 now, yeah. excuse me. Uh, 17 regular season games, and there's a focus on every game counts and every, every, every game is a big event. Uh, and I think you do have to manage that. So for sure, and you know, for us, there's global, you know, events, and then there's regional events, and there's a role for each. Okay. And so, but it's definitely something that you know is part of our strategic plan. One last thing for you, and appreciate the time. This is a lot of fun. Um, I love talking about the business of fighting, and one thing that I've always been very passionate about is I think every organization needs a face. You know, you need that guy, right? You need that guy at the podium saying, "On Friday night, you got to watch this and that." You know, Dana has done it sure. for many years. He was great. Vince for many years, WWE, you know, one of the greatest of all time. Don King, Eddie Hearn now, et cetera, et cetera. Are you that guy now for PFL? I'm the CEO. I'm focused on the business. But But I feel like you're the guy. You're the the face. And I'm I'm certainly a face for the organization. And as it relates to a promoter, you know, we're a little different than other promotions. We are a league. And leagues tend to operate a little differently. But we're all promoters. (laughs) You know, so I'm banging that drum. Don is kind of spicy. Banging that drum every day. Don Davis is banging the drum. Ray Cepho as well. You know, it's, it's... it's certainly a team approach. So you don't think you need that one guy? Uh, yeah, listen, we have a number of advocates that are that are promoting the PFL in our fights. And at this point in time, this model is working for us. All right. Well, I wish you guys the best. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. There's a rumor that I might be there on Friday. I don't know if you've heard the rumor, but We'd love it's, to have it's circulating. You. It's percolating. Uh, so we've got... This Friday, August 6th on ESPN. That's a big thing for you and guys. ESPN Plus. Yes, of course. But being on linear was big, right? Sure, main network Friday yeah, of night. Of course. Uh, we don't want to be on like ESPN U. We want to be on the mothership. Listen, with all due have, respect, they have ESPN. Great U. platforms <laughs> across ESPN. Right, but no, right. but yeah, hey, listen, it's an honor to be on ESPN main network, ESPN proper, uh, in prime time. And and candidly, you know, with all of our events are simulcast. 
So we have broad access and reach through Linear on the ESPN main network. And then, you know, it's a totally a different consumer on ESPN+. Plus. It's highly targeted. Those non-avid fans, they're looking for these occasions. Um, so, you know, we're really, really excited about the playoffs. And after New York, Cardiff and Cardiff London, and London, as you said earlier, Ariel, that's our, our you know, while we're a global property – and brand when distributing to 160 countries, fighters from 25 nations around the world. But, you know, this is our first time to execute outside the U.S. So it's a moment for us that we're really, really excited about to, to bring the show on the road to the U.K. Wish you the best. Thank you for stopping by. Ariel, thank you. Appreciate always, it. as always. always pleasure, yes, there friend. he is. Peter Murray, CEO of the PFL. I believe we have uh, Anthony Pettis coming in. We're going to do like two ships in the night you here. got it. Thank We're you, just, Ariel. Thank you Be so good. much. Good luck to you guys. See you Friday. Oh, there he is. Showtime with the drip. Look at this guy. How are you, hey, sir? What's up, man? You've been on the show good see many you. a time. I don't know yeah. if you've ever been in studio, right? No, I haven't. First this time. is a big deal. How are yeah. you? Good. How much do you hate me because this is the day before uh, weigh-ins, right? I'm chilling, bro. Like this, You're good? The season format makes it pretty easy to go. Okay. How, like, how much you weigh right now? You're looking very um, svelte. I think um, one, 164. Okay. And that's okay for you? Yep. The the day before weigh-ins, no problem. Because yeah. some people might say, oh, nine pounds. Actually, you get you eight get pounds. eight pounds, right? Because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a non... So I'll do, I'll do four tonight, four tomorrow. How are you doing? Good. Everything good? Everything's good. New York Stock Exchange today? Yeah, man. That was cool. They're treating you well? Oh, yeah, for sure. PFL is definitely taking care of us. They had this, like, crazy uh, banner of us out there. It was, like, the hugest thing I've ever seen of myself. You're happy? Like, you're, you're, you're happy with the decision? Life is good? Oh, yeah, man. Life is great. You know, I just had a baby girl. Um, I see you with the playoffs the baby. now, in the playoffs. You rewound the tape. I did, That's man. That's what I say. Like, yeah, you, your, your oldest is how old? 11. 11. You yeah. went all the way back to all diapers. All the way back to diapers. But it's different now. Now, technology, I got a little camera that tells us. Right, it's I saw just that. breathing and all right. that stuff. It's crazy. Um, so let's talk about this because this is fascinating. You're fighting Stevie Ray, main event on Friday. You just fought the guy. Yeah. Like end of June, and that was shocking. Mm -hmm. uh, did not see that coming. Could you tell? So you, you lose via body triangle. What does that feel like? Because you well, watched it was that. Like a, it was a different kind of body triangle, though. Honestly, he had, he had something good set up for me. It's funny because early in the week, I posted an Instagram post, and I'm like, it works every time. My back escape. Because I've done it to Diaz, Oliveira, like some of the best and you guys out there. Um, so he must have been watching, and he you know had a plan for me. So like when when that when I initiated that takedown, you know, I, I had sloppy single leg. It was my my fault on a technical error. But he took he took my back. I gave him my back. I'm like, yo, I'm gonna take, let him give my back, and I'm gonna get the reversal, get on top, and win around on top. And, uh, you know, he caught me in a position that just, you know, compromised the rib. So what does that feel like? Does it feel like it's, like, popping? What? Well, it actually happened in the Dustin Poirier fight. So oh, yes. Poirier had me I in a body that. triangle, and I kind of did the same shit. You know, I tried to, like, get out get out of a body triangle without clearing the body triangle. Oh, yeah. We'll get it closer to you there. Oh, cool. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And uh, you, uh, so that, the cartilage and the rib popped, you know? So And and, and I it was weird because I've never had two fights booked back-to-back. -back. Like, I already knew I had this playoff spot confirmed. So right. like, that fight was, like, it wasn't a free fight, but it was, like, you know, I— don't don't get hurt. Points for the guy. Get out of there. Get a win. And uh, you know I, I got put in a position that I never got put in before. Did you perhaps underestimate him? You know he hadn't fought for three years. Came back, had the one fight. But you've been way more active than him. Uh, you're Anthony Pettis for goodness sakes. Like, did you think like, all right, I could, you know. Not not necessarily him, but just the fact that I had my guaranteed playoff spot. You know, I was uh -huh. like, this fight kind of didn't matter. You know, it was like, yo, that like I'm I'm in the playoffs no matter what. Whether it was him, how much to feel, like it didn't really matter to me. But getting motivated for that training camp was kind of hard because like I knew it didn't really matter to me. You got the win in the previous fight. Yep. You first round. Amazing. Did that feel like a weight lifted off your shoulders considering how last year went for you? Like, could you describe what that felt like? Because when I saw you there, I was like, oh, snap, like Anthony's back. Yeah, but last year was rough. Like the, the first season of the PFL, just because of the, the, the COVID thing, man. Like yeah. they, had us, they had us in hotel for like three weeks before a fight. And then we go back to back to back. So like I, I literally was at home for like three weeks at a time. And then right back to that bubble. Right. So I didn't I didn't like the way that went. I almost was, I even told Duke, I'm like, man, I don't know if this for me, like the way this this format is. No fans in the, in the arena. Right. This season we had the fans in, you know, I felt good. I was in Texas, you know, people came out support. Um, and I knew what I had to do. You know, I, I started training camp really early. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I made it happen. Okay. So you felt good and then you get the win and I'm sure there's part of you that's like, you know, I need to prove to these guys that I'm worth the money that mm -hmm. they're paying me. Right. I need to win. Most definitely. So did you feel like, all right, now I could breathe. Now I could be myself. 
you felt like that confidence back after the win? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you, I, I've been there before. You know, I've been on the Wheaties box to yes, losing four in a row, bro, like, you know, like at lightweight. So then I moved down to 45, fought Oliveira, got a win out against Oliveira. So, like, I've been in that position where, you know, you lose a couple in a row and you doubt yourself and you start thinking of the worst case scenarios. But um, I bounce, I'm the bounce back king. You know, I didn't even remember that. Right yeah, there. Man. And we got the bobblehead, too. I see. Look at that. I'm on, I'm You're on represented. I love it. When did you find out about that? Like, when did they approach you about that? Uh, right at, oh, right before. I remember before, this was right before yeah, Melendez. Yeah, right before Melendez, yeah. But like, how did it all go down? Um, they were doing that next challenge. There were, like, four athletes were going to, like, compete, and uh, the UFC got a place on there. And I think I think John Jones did something bad to Dana at that point. Uh, and I was, like, the next guy in line. So really? He's like, yeah, I want you on this, you know, competition. And, you know, the UFC went out, and they, they, they made us win. So, yeah. Did you get paid for that? I did. You did? Yeah. Do you, do you have any bosses? Oh, I got a bunch of them. You do? Yeah. So th was it just for that fight that they paid you, or was it like a— Sponsorship promotional. deal. Yeah, it was a sponsorship deal. Really? Yeah. So they paid me for the they paid me for Melinda's fight, and then I got a uh, promotional deal with them. For wow. General that is, yeah. Does that feel like a lifetime ago? Oh man, it's crazy. You know, to see it, even to see it now, people still come in to, to, for me to autograph those things. I'm like, really? Man, I've been in the sport for a long time. It's been a crazy ride. Um, so then you have that, and now you get to rematch him. Did you realize right away that, like, based on how the seedings, because you're one, he's four, yeah, yeah. that it's going to be. Right. I mean, what was it like a month and a half? No, not even a month and a half. Yeah, a like six weeks, weeks ago, right? Six yeah. Weeks ago, yeah. Did you realize right away that that's what? Yeah, was I knew. Happen? Yeah, because then the lightweights went before us, so like we were on the, the next card after. So I already knew like the the, the format of the playoffs, and uh, it, it was just weird. I was already guaranteed a spot, so I'm like, I'm going to that fight. Like, you know, I don't really have to. I don't have to do anything in this fight. It's just I'm guaranteed this fight. What's right. the one that matters? And now he put me in that position, and like when I'm in that position, it was like. A split instinct that I was like, yo, should I let this rib pop and fight through this? Because I probably could have fought through the body triangle. But I'm like, man, I'm this fight the one that matters. And like for oh. me, it's like the play, the, the championship was the goal the whole time. So I was like, I'm not going to get hurt in that fight. So this fight, I'm going to be good. The million dollars. Of course. So, so you get paid the same. What's that? Like you get guaranteed money. I There's no win money. show. Get guaranteed money. That's the worst win show. <laughs> when are we going to get rid of this nonsense yeah. win show? Oh, you man. guys deserve to know what you're getting when you step in the cage. For sure, bro. I've been I've been part of that format for so long. Right. Like, you know, when we when I became free agent, you know, that's, that was kind of the big thing I wanted was a guaranteed a guaranteed purse, you know, and guaranteed, you know, show and cuz like a lot of the stuff in in other organizations are like behind the doors, you know, like hey, we'll give you a, a good job check and a bonus check and like it does equal a lot of money, but you got to earn that. Sure. Um and it's, it's you know, us as athletes, you know, the training camp is just the same as a loss as a win. Right. And then I th I feel like the promise or at least the hope of getting that, you know, good job check is yeah. what keeps everyone in line, right? For sure, man. Like that 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 good job check, that that the locker room check, you know, that right. mail, the mailbox money is what we call it. You know, you, you you go home and then you get a check showing up and you know, it's definitely it's, it's great to get, but like it's it's not written in a contract. It's right. not it's not, not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. You can't it's plan out your life. Exactly. Yeah, you, it's just it's it's up to them pretty much. Have you gotten those? Um, oh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's sure. the most? Um, guaranteed like a locker room. No, thing. like that. You were just like open your mailbox and it's like, oh, snap. DC told me a <laughs> oh, million man, one got, time. Yeah, I got a million. You got a million. I got a million. Yeah. You just sure. op you just open, open them my mailbox. Yeah. Come on. They used to like before they would wire the money. They would send it FedEx. Really? Yeah. So show up at your house. <laughs> so get a little package. Open it up. Any note? Uh, just or is it just just, just a memo on the check? You no, know, like crazy. Yeah. What fight was that? Um, I got one for actually I got it twice. Uh, ben Henderson and Melendez. My two title fights. Oh, Henderson in Milwaukee. And, and then Melinda's uh, in uh, yeah. my, my title Oh, wow. Fights. That was like, th those were pretty close to each other, right? Yep. No, I, I took a year off. Remember we did the Ultimate oh, Fighter right, season? Oh, right. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then like during all that time, man, like too, you got all the sponsors that come with that. Also, them are mailbox checks too. So, yeah. Wow. That is crazy. And when you when you get that check, do you call someone? Do you say like, yo, like, thanks for this? Oh, yeah. Dana, or? Dana, man. Dana, yeah. Me and Dana are still cool. You, know? you guys are still like, cool? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's like, good. No hard he, feelings. No, not at all. Like when I, when, when I decided to become a free agent, you know, I, I, I spoke to him first. You know, I was like, hey, this is where I'm at in my career. This is kind of where I wanna, wanna, what I'm deciding to do. And uh, they gave me that Alex Morono fight to make this happen. Right. And he was like, cool, man. Oh, yeah, for sure. We're still friends, man. I still, I, I see him in Vegas. We gamble together still. Yeah. Really? Definitely. You're a big gambler, man. Yeah. I see you I posting well. those slips. I do well. <laughs> Uh, we had, uh, who is it? Uh, oh, James Krause was on the show on Monday. Yeah. He says he makes more money off of MMA gambling than he does anything. Coaching, fighting, anything. That, real I believe estate. it, bro. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, it's, it's quick. I mean, it, if you know the fight game and you know what's going on, like the last PFL season, I picked Taush and uh, Ray Cooper. That was like a, like a $52,000 win. Really? Yeah. Damn. And will you ever bet on your own fights? No, you can't. It, is that not allowed? Yeah, he's not Even allowed. if it's for you to win? Not allowed. Not allowed. Not but allowed. you could bet on the rest of the card. 
I don't bet on my cards at all. Like I'm so focused on these camps. You just don't want to have I don't that. even deal with it. Yeah. Okay. But like when I'm when I'm out of the out of the gym, I mean I live in Vegas, so it's I drive to the casino and put picks in like nothing. Right. And what about non MMA? Do you do that? Oh yeah, I do everything, bro. Tennis, uh, really? Baseball. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. What's like? What's your favorite non MMA sport to? I'd say tennis on? is probably like one of the guarantees. Tennis, tennis yeah. Why tennis? I, I got a guy that just gives me my picks. I pay a guy that gives me my picks. Big Bag Betting, Las Vegas. Shout out to him. Wow. I pay him monthly. He sends the picks, and you just go in and put and them in. Like, what's your your record? Like, what? How good is he? Oh, he's really good, man. The Devin Haney fight. I I, I was a, a six figure payday. I did hundred thousand. That come uh, on, hundred thousand. Yeah. What What was the pick? Him via decision. Just, him via decision. That's, yeah. That's the lot. That'd be the last time Devin Haney would be that close of. A, sure. A I picked him too. Yeah, for sure. It was like a plus one ten or something, yep, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, I, I was a six figure payday for me. Wow. So you bet a guy to do this for you? I pay a guy to do this for me. Sorry, you pay. So a guy I pay to do for this. his picks. Oh. And then he sends me his picks, and it's up to you to put him in. That's and do you like tennis? I, I don't even watch it. <laughs> you don't even, I don't even watch it. Really? If, if I bet on it, I'll have it up like on my on my browser yeah. and stuff. But yeah. But isn't that like the fun part of betting? Like to actually watch the game that you have money invested if, in? Once you start doing it a lot, it's just like if, if you do it like, you know, two or three times a week, it's like you don't want to sit there and watch every game. Right, and, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So like now. What's the worst one to bet on? The worst? Like baseball, terms- man. Baseball is hard. It's hard? Baseball is hard. Why is that? It's because like the, the team that's supposed to win would be up like four runs and all of a sudden the last inning. They, the, the team that's supposed to lose right, they hit six back. rounds. Yeah, it's like, what the heck? Yeah. So baseball is hard. What's uh, the biggest bet you've won ever, all time? Oh, man, I don't even know. That's that's hard to say. Not the Devin Haney one. Nah, there's bigger you had ones. bigger ones. Yeah, parlays, man. That, that, was a straight, that was a straight pick. Right. But like, f- for like, guarantee, like a percentage-wise, you know, putting down like 10 Gs to win, you know, 120, 150. Right. But that one, I put down 85 to win 100,000. Wow. Yeah. The, the, Haney the Haney Yeah, yeah. What about the fact that you're an underdog? Crazy. See that? Yeah, crazy. What do you think when you see that? Um, shit, people should put the house on it. Do you feel disrespected? Not at all. No. I think, you know, Vegas odds, I mean, it's crazy where these Vegas odds come from, you know, like, and they're actually, they're always like on, pretty on point. Yeah. But the last fight, like I said, bro, it's like, this This will be a totally different fight. You know, the, the, I was, I went out there in a karate stance. I was throwing jump kicks, spin kicks. Like I was trying to point spoil the guy and this fight, I'm going to go out there and try to knock this dude out. Okay. Um, so at this point, so you have this fight, do you know when the championship would be? No. Yeah. Oh, you do know? I do know. It's no Friday after Thanksgiving, November 25th. Oh, wow. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I love it. You're okay with that? Yeah. I, I need a little break actually. I've been okay. in camp since December, bro. So like going back to back to back is, you know, weight cutting and all that. It's hard on the body. Yeah. Um, did they tell you, I, I was asking Peter about that. Did they tell you, if it, is it going to be on pay-per-view or ESPN? I don't know. I, don't, okay, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought that about that. Yeah. As well. <laughs> I was yeah. trying to f- figure that out because they say they're going to get into the pay-per-view business. Oh, that's dope. I hope are so. You, I are, hope you, so. are you down with that? You oh, think they're yeah, ready man. for that? I think they are. I mean, they, they have a, a good team of guys that aren't MMA guys. You know, like they're, they're coming in with a different mindset. So that you know, they're putting on the good fights. They're making the right relationships. I mean, you got like some celebrities that come out to these fights sure. that are, are broadcasting this. So it's, it's bringing in a different audience. Uh, I asked him about Nathan Diaz, your old friend. Yeah. Um, he's about to become a free agent. By the way, how do you feel about the way, like, they gave you Alex Morono on the way out. Yeah, They're giving bro. him Hamza. Man, that is crazy. You know, I respect Diaz, though. Now, now that we fought, you know, obviously we had our, our beef, you know, coming up. But yeah. uh, I respect him. And he's a, he's a fighter. He's a fighter. You know, like, he's he's not afraid to take the risk. And he, he always says it. He's like, there's not real fighters left in MMA. Like, when I fought, I fought everybody. You know, I wasn't, I was, I, I would come off a loss to Ferguson and fight Wonderboy. You know, like, that doesn't really happen like now. There's there's more businessmen in, the, in the MMA now. Like, it's kind of like not becoming boxing, but but it's more politics involved. Like, right. they're, they're trying to build guys up. Where Diaz is like, yo, give me the next best guy in line. So, yeah, I respect that. That. But they know he's not re-signing, so they're giving him the toughest guy. I don't know if they're giving him that. I think he picked that fight, honestly. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, like, if he would have said, "Give me, you know, someone else," you don't think they would have? I don't know. You know, you I'm, know? Not, I'm not sure how 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 his relationship is with you know mm-hmm. UFC and all that. But I think, um, you know, it, the fight that he's getting is definitely a tough fight, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the worst possible match for sure, man. He's like a, a minus. He's a monster. Like I saw the guy training at the PI, and he's huge, right? I fought at 170, and like sit, sit, standing next to him is like, yo, this is a it's a different level right. of dude. So uh, Peter Murray just said that they're interested in in Nathan Diaz. Oh, heck yeah. What would you say? Because I, I am continuously shocked by fighters who don't test the market. And I don't think that testing the market is 
in MMA, for some reason, it's viewed as insulting towards the UFC. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I want to just, I just want to see what's out there. Mm -hmm. And maybe what's out there is best with the UFC. Like, it doesn't matter. But for some reason, it's almost viewed as like an insult. And I feel like, I was like Anthony Smith, I was really surprised. He went all the way to the end and then he signed the day before. Maybe that was what he wanted and it was strategic on his end. But I think more fighters should test the market like you did, like other yeah. fighters did. It's weird. Why? Like, I think, I think the fame that comes with fighting in the UFC, like these fighters are addicted to that. Like they want that more than they want the guarantee. You know, they're, they're like, I'm willing to risk not getting paid a certain amount to, to get the fame that comes with it and the recognition that comes with fighting on a UFC fight card, you know? So the, the, the general public looks at the UFC like that's the best place to fight. It's the only place to fight. But like as fighters, you're supposed to take care of yourself, man. There's, you, m most guys don't get to fight as long as I got to fight, man. So I got to like f see all the phases of MMA change, you know, from when the UFC got bought out from the WME, like how them changes happened. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, fighters definitely should test the market. And there's so many more organizations coming out now that are, are paying good guys, you know, even Eagle FC, Khabib Show, like mm -hmm. they're paying these guys good money. So was there a part of you, like back in the day, were you one of those guys like, oh, I, I want to be in the UFC, I want to tell people I'm a UFC fighter, like there's a prestige that comes with that, right? Uh, man, you know, I got I got to become the champ really quick. You know, I right. came from the WEC off the Showtime kick and then boom, right to the, the, the two years later, I was, you know, the UFC champ. So I I didn't really, I didn't need that, you know, like it kind of just naturally came to me, mm -hmm. but I see a lot of other guys that are like, I'm, I'm in the management business. I got fighters that will say no to more money just to get on a contender series fight. Really? Yeah. Do you want to shake them? Oh man. And you can't really do anything. Cause you're right. like, yo, like this is like, you're, this is guaranteed money and you can still build yourself. You can build your career. And then if, if that's what makes sense for your career, then you go to that. But, um, right. I think, I think eventually, you know, once, once. Once the pop, the general public, you know, stop get, pushing that on fighters, then we'll see we'll see fighters making different decisions. Considering you were so young when you became champion, like I, I I've talked to Tyron about this about yeah. like the mistakes he made when he was champion. He wishes he could do things a little differently. Were you like that too? Oh yeah, man, for was, sure. Was it bad? Oh, it was bad. I was just actually talking to my nutritionist about it, uh, Ian Larios. Like he oh, he's built man, to me from like. Ian. Yeah, Chef Ian, bro. He's yeah. been with me since like the beginning. So he's out here right now with me. And I'm like, bro, like the way I was at at 25 and where I'm at at 35, oh, totally different. Totally like different. What? what were you doing? That was just so a wild boy, man. You know, yeah. I was out there partying and, you know, enjoying enjoying that scene of like what I earned, you know, like sure. to, to, be, to be, I mean, living in Vegas, you're like, you know, you know how that goes. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was, I was, a, I was a wild boy out there, you know, and, and then I met my, my fiance, my soon to be wife and kind of calmed me down and changed my, my perspective of life, I guess. And then you have kids and then you, know, right. you gotta, you gotta change, change the way you think. Do you regret that? Like, do you wish? No, it, I don't. You don't? I don't, man. No I, regrets. I had a good time. My life was, everything that happened in my life was supposed to happen. I lost my dad at 15 years old, you know, sure. and then bringing Sergio to see him become a world champion. It's like. Everything just keeps falling in place, man. So I'm I'm blessed. Do you think you could have been champion longer had you taken things seriously? If you're... I, I I I just was contemplating that question. It's the lightweight division is just so stacked, bro. Like there's so many good guys at lightweight. Look at Oliveira. Like he where he was at losing, and now he's just on his terror, and and he's looking like one of the, one of the best right now, and and making himself one of the in the conversation for one of the greatest lightweight of all time. And right. it's, it's crazy. You know, I fought him a couple of years, like at 45, I fought him and, and to see where he's at. But yeah, the lightweight division is so stacked. Um, yeah, maybe I could have, you know, had a, a longer run at, at champion, but uh, everything happens for a reason. I remember that night, 185. Oh yeah. That was crazy. It was shocking because you were on such a roll. Mm -hmm. And then wasn't there something about like, no one took you to the hospital. Oh man, so I I just I was rushed. So like I, I won the Ben Henderson fight really quick, and right. I tore my PCO. And then I took the year off, and I fought Melendez in December, and then I fought RDA in March. And that was the mistake I made. I was going back really really quick, trying to fight like from a training camp to a training camp. I should have right. took my rest. I should have took a break and you know decompressed and then did it again. Um, and uh, you know RDA was just a hungry dude. You know, but I fought him like I hit him with some some big stuff in that fight, and he was walking through it. So. Yeah, like it was. It was. Why did you come back so fast? Uh, I was I was out for a year, right? So you and I was like, yeah, I was like, I want to, I want to fight some fights. You know, I was like, I was pretty active in the in the WEC. I was fighting, you know, five, four or five times in twelve months, right? And then the UFC, they slowed it down a little bit. You know, I fought Guida, and then I had my little my my run that I went on. But uh, yeah, I was the champ, and at when you're the champ, you make the most money, obviously. So I was I was trying to get to that spot. But that night you went to the hospital, right? I did, yeah, yeah. I, it was a little bit of my fault too, but so like after the fight, the, the doctor looks at you and he says like, I recommend you go to the hospital or you don't go to the hospital. And I'm like, yo, I just want to go back to my corner and just decompress. And I had a concussion and I didn't realize I had a concussion. So like I get back and the lights are like hurting my eyes and I'm like, I start throwing up. And then Duke, my coach, Duke's been with me forever. Like he's a father figure for me. He's like, man, 
like, this kid's sick. Like, we got to get him to the hospital. And it was already too late, I guess. Like, I was the main event, so, like, everybody had left already. So I'm in the back throwing up, and yeah, it was it was some people got fired for that. Yes, yeah, a very I won't say, but like a very notable yeah. person. Yeah, sure. That was a crazy. I, I was hearing about that the next day, and I was like, damn, this is a mess. Yeah. Did you have to stay in the hospital? No, I didn't. I just okay. had to get to the hospital, and like the ambulance service was already checked out or something. Yeah. I, I forget, and I'm like, you ought to call my own ambulance, but. Yeah, it is what it is. It happens. That was a tough night for your family because your brother fought and then you said, never again. We're not doing yeah. this ever again. He got knocked out and then boom, I, I go out there because I was, I was watching his fight, you know, at the hotel room and then oh, I had geez. to go right out and go after that. Um, you tweeted something. Oh, actually, I think it might have been Sergio tweeted this recently. His first interview for UFC, he was super drunk. So you did it for him. <laughs> is that yeah, true? We both were drunk. We were in Vegas. It was like fight. It was like an international fight week and he just got signed and it was like his first big interview. And I'm like, yo, let me do this for you. So I get on the phone and yeah. yeah do you remember who it was with? I don't even remember who it was with. And the person couldn't tell. Couldn't tell. It was tell. just a phone interview. Couldn't tell. I was, I was super cocky and confident for him. <laughs> <laughs> but you were drunk too. Oh yeah. We you both didn't say were. that yeah, in we, the tweet. We both were. Yeah. We both were drunk. Wow. And he I we, it was International Fight Week, so we were just like, I think we were at the Mandalay Bay, actually. We had a suite, and we were like, my, my agent at the time had interviewers coming through, and like, we had right. a long, busy day. And then he had his interview, and I'm like, give me that. And you did it for uh, How was he feeling? He's doing good, man. I think, you know, being in his position he's at right now, becoming the champ, um, and then having that knee injury, bro. I've been there before, having that year off. And that's why, that's why I, I kind of shared him. I'm like, yo, take your time. Like, find out who you are outside of fighting so you can not just be identified as that fighter. Because once right. you identify like that, that's where anxiety, depression, and all that starts playing and in, plays into it. Cause you, you, you get on social media, everybody's talking trash. Everybody's like the naysayers. Like, so he's, he's finding who he is outside of the cage, man. Like he's, he's got a beautiful fiance. He just bought his house. He's you know about to be 29 years old. Like he's in a good spot. Uh, when do you think he comes back? Probably after this this tournament, you know. Okay. Our teammate Rafian Stotts, you know, yeah. killing it over there. Too. What a character this guy! Uh, Rafian's the man. Yes. Me and Rafian had conversations when he was up and coming. He was just coming off a loss, spin back for his KO. Yeah. And I was telling him, I'm like, hey, this is gonna happen fast, bro. Like when it's your time, take advantage of it. And he's he's taking advantage of it. So you think he'll you think he'll fight again this year? Or nah, no. I think they're gonna wait till after the the, 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 the tournament. And okay. I think they still have one more round before the, right. Yeah, the championship. Um. So all right. So at this point, you have this situation with PFL, and then are you? Do you have another year with PFL after this, or are you done? After? I have this. This is my season with PFL. This is it. Yep. Holy smokes. Yep. So this is this is this is a big one for me. Pressure. Yeah, I'm always under pressure, bro. Every fight's the biggest fight, you know. And I think um, people expect a lot from me from from what I've done in my career. So, uh, th I mean, this one this one it's a totally different focus than I'm, the last fight, obviously. Right. Like, that one was a, a, a non focus Anthony Pettis, but no, I know what I got to do in this fight. How many more years you want to do this for? Man, I'm 35, and I I, I, I still love it, you know. And I I, I don't want to like be at, at the house at 40, 50 years old and be like, man, I could I could have won a couple more years, or I, I could have had a couple more fights. So I think once once I know I'm done with it, then I'll, I'll be done with it. And are you full time 100 percent in Vegas? Full time 100. percent So how does that work with Duke and Rufus Sport? He comes out to Vegas. So, so I do my oh. camps more like a boxer now, like like, like it's just you, just me. Yeah, yeah. I got, where do you I, do it? Uh, all the dudes in Vegas. Okay. We, extreme Couture. I, I go to Syndicate for some sparring, depending who's in town. UFC PI. Wow. Jorge Capatillo, the boxing, my boxing coach is out there in Vegas too. So we, uh, we just go to the gyms that we need to go to. I got my coaches that come in, uh, Diego Marias from Brazil, fly him in for the whole camp. Duke Rufus. I had Eric Koch here with me and Capatillo. Wow. And, and PI, you could use it. Yeah. Because you're just boys. Yeah, I guess. I thought it was just for UFC fighters. I mean, I, I, I go or there all the time. Yeah, You I just go, walk in. Yeah, go And they're cool. Time. And they're cool. Man. Yeah. I've done a lot for that company. You have done a lot. I'm happy yeah. to hear that. Yep. I'm happy to hear that they're they're cool with that. You didn't burn any bridges. There's a didn't lesson there, no right? Bridges. Yeah, man. I went out, the way I went out, I, I honored my contract. You know, I fought my fights out, and I made a decision after I was done to move, move on. Right. Wow. Uh, do you ever go to Milwaukee? Like, do you have anything? Yeah, yeah I still have a house in Milwaukee. Oh, you do? Okay. My daughter still lives in Milwaukee. Okay, so, okay. So, so yeah, I, I still go back and forth. But full, I'm I'm a resident of Vegas full time. And and when's the wedding? November. November? Yeah. November so, 11th, two weeks before the, the championship. Damn. Yeah. How do we feel about that? I love it. You're okay with yeah, that? I'm okay with it. It won't be too... Life, life for me is totally different. You know, I'm not like losing focus quick and you know my wife keeps me up well, my fiance soon to be wife keeps me on track bro so yeah I, I, there's a lot to look forward to in this year for me honeymoon after the fight honeymoon after the fight not before the fight that would yeah that would be and we got the baby too so it's gonna be yeah be hard will you even me. take a honeymoon i'm not sure we, we haven't, we haven't discussed it. that yeah we're always on vacation so that's true that's true <laughs> yeah. and and what about you you were very open about 
uh, you know, you mentioned depression, all that stuff. Yeah. Spoke yeah. a lot about that. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate you doing that. How is that going for you? Um, to do that, the UFCPI, I still see him as well, uh, Micah. Okay. Uh, he's one of the, man, he, he introduced me to, you know, mental health. You know, before that, I didn't know about it. I was like just navigating this by myself, you know, and social media is just one of know, the worst man. places to, to, to not be in a healthy mindset for it. And uh, once I was, you know, understood what anxiety and depression was and how to handle my actions, feelings, and, you know, the way I can make live my life, you know, it changed, it changed my whole perspective on all this stuff, man. So is this something that you're actively, actively still, still doing? Still yeah, talking? I saw him last Friday before I left. He just texted me two days ago. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and you, it has changed. I recommend it to all fighters. Right. Yeah, all athletes, bro. Like we're, we're under a lot of pressure, especially as fighters. Like they look at us like these macho people that should like have no feelings and go out there and kill the guy in front of you. Like we, we go through it just like everybody else, man. Like we have the anxiety, we have the, de- the depression, we have the, uh, the, the pressure of performing and, uh, you know, you get 15 minutes to do it, 25 minutes if you're lucky. And if it doesn't go your way, you don't get to fight for a long time. That's why I kind of like this format. You know, I, right. I lost, I lost five weeks ago and I'm right back at it. You know, the season format's cool. And then you wake up and you see people being like, you suck and all retire. that. Retire. I see that all the time. And I hate that when I see like a guy losing, they're like, oh, you need to retire. He's right. done. Like they're fans in the MMA write people off so quick. And, uh, it's it, you know, we're people too. How's the management company going? It's going great, man. I started with uh, some some ground up guys. We went to the to the the base level. I recruited a bunch of guys. Um, I'm having APFC in Milwaukee. You see August that? 12th. Right. A lot of guys fighting on that card. So uh, yeah, I'm 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 building slowly and small, but you know we'll, we'll get there. How do you have time to do all this? Good business but, partners. Okay. Good business partners. How active are you in APFC? Very active. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was in Milwaukee, man. So I, I set up the I set up the venue. I set up the sponsorships. You know, we we crushed it in sponsorships. So shout out to everybody in Milwaukee. Uh, we we almost did a hundred thousand in ticket sales. So wow, we're doing well. And then in terms of fu- uh, signing fighters. Like how, how do you go about that? Like who? Because I see I got a team. You, I got a team of guys that that, that who are looking. That. Yeah, they're looking at talent, and you know we're going to the ground up. Like we didn't go and try to steal guys and like right, right, right. convince guys to move over. We started at the ground up. You know we're in the local level right now. We're we're getting some good guys, and now I have a platform for them to f- perform on. But I see you. Sh- like I saw you mention a guy who fought for KSW. Yeah, oh man, we we got guys all over the place. Right. Yeah, yeah. So like you're not just. These guys aren't fighting like local shows. No, well, they're fighting local, local, mid-level local shows. Sure, I, I mean, mean KSW is pretty big yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, but we're not. My 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 first guy that went fought on APFC signed with the PFL. Argo Husik. Wow, he was on a- APFC in uh, Florida and he signed with PFL. Fought Brandon in the Laughlin. They had a great fight. Right. But yeah, it's cool to see. Like my the whole thing I want to do was give these guys a platform that was you know able to showcase their talent and it's it's happening, man. So it's cool to see. So this is great because again, like I spoke to James on Monday and he was talking about like, you got to prepare for life after. Yeah. I feel like you are still in your prime. You're still, you know, you're about to fight in the semis, maybe the finals, if all goes well, mm-hmm. but you've got all these things that once it's over, once the music stops, it will stop. Yeah. I know that, man. I knew that way back when I opened up, you know, my first businesses, you know, I had a sports bar, barber shops, yeah. you know, gym. I said my gyms. Um, I, I knew, I know there will be a time when you know, fighting will be done. And, uh, I've been blessed to be able to fight, man. This has been like my 17th year fighting, you know, professionally right. at the highest at the highest level, man. So like I've been blessed to be in this position. So yeah, I've had a lot of time to make things happen. So uh, Friday, Hulu Theater, rematch. Uh, you're pretty good in rematches, right? Yeah, undefeated in rematches. Undefeated in rematches, underdog yep. at the house. My guy, GC in the back, Connor, you'll is, see him on the way back. Uh, he's a big time better. Oh man. And uh good value. He 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 put a few units on you. Good value. So it's good value there. Don't tell yeah. Stevie that when he comes by. <laughs> uh but yes, he he's picking you. So I wish you the best, man. It's so Thank good you, to man. have you good in to see you again, man. Yeah, you're the man. Yep. Anthony, uh wish the best for you and your family and uh good luck on Friday and good luck with the wedding too. Appreciate it, bro. Thanks. Uh we've got Josh Silvera coming in any moment here. You could just get up and leave. That's how we do this. It's like two ships in the night. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, good luck with the weight cut too. Thank you. There he is, Anthony Pettis, the former uh, WEC and UFC lightweight champion, and he'll be fighting on Friday at the Hulu Theater here in New York City. And uh, there's there's rumors that we'll be in attendance. I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, haven't been to a, uh, a, a an MMA event since March 2020. How are you guys? Good. I got some I got some guys just chilling here. Who are you guys? Social media PFL. Social media. But with who? The PFL. But PFL. You're Andrew. Diego. And what's your name? Jeff. Jeff. Oh, Jeff. What's up, Jeff? I didn't recognize you back there. This, I didn't know you work with the PFL. Okay, cool. Uh, well, welcome. Eric's not here. No. You should have come on Monday. 
Monday is when he shows up. He only works Mondays. Um, well, good to have you guys here. And in a matter of moments, we're going to have uh, Josh Silvera here, who's fighting in the light heavyweight uh, tournament, if you will, the light heavyweight semifinal. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him very much. His dad is a very, very influential and famous person in the history of the sport, the great Conan Silvera headman over at ATT. He's an undefeated prospect, 9-0. and He's a product of their uh, Challenger series, but also a former uh, two-division champion in the LFA. Massive prospect, uh, relatively young, like I said, undefeated, and wasn't going to be a part of the tournament. Um, but Antonio Carlos Jr., a.k.a. Shoeface, uh, ended up uh, getting injured, apparently injured his knee, and now he's in as the fifth seed. Going up against Omari Akhmedov, by the way. Omari Akhmedov, longtime UFC vet, uh, who is, uh, it's five, I think it's two and five, right? Or am I wrong about that? Three, one would be four. I think it's two and five, yeah. What's that, Mysterious Frank? I said, hey, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Oh, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, it's always very fun when we have the... Uh, the institute. Am I doing well with the microphone you're situation? You're doing great, thanks. And if you want to continue to do that, that'd be really helpful. What, telling them to yeah, talk? Yeah, just kind of square up on it. Yeah. yeah. What about all that ice on uh, Anthony Pettis? I mean, That was quite nice. The bling. Did you tell him, GC, that you bet on him? Oh, yeah, we just talked about it. You did? Yeah, he said plus 105 was crazy. Is he... Uh, is he it's easy money. Yeah. Look at that. You see, I'm trying to get you over with the betting community, and I feel like you're reluctant. No, not reluctant. We had a nice conversation. Did you start your, uh, did you take a picture with the, f the fist? Yeah, we, I literally took one with him, yeah. Let's go. And we started talking. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah, you got to get the pick. I mean, I was like, showtime. I was like, I've never talked to someone that I gambled on before, like, <laughs> an event had happened. This is like a trip. <laughs> like, someone telling me it's easy money, like, after I place a bet on them. So, yeah. Uh, we'll find cool. out if it is, in fact, easy money. Yeah, this dude was on a, a Wheaties box. I don't know if you know this. I mean, that's crazy. Right we were looking there. up the outfit. We're guessing somewhere in like the $25,000 plus range. Oh, that he was outfit. rocking? Yeah, the Fendi sweater, the, yeah. the the diamond necklace, diamond Rolex. Oh, uh, I, I don't even notice these things. Oh, yeah, a lot of money on them. Really? Yeah, I mean, when people, the movers and shakers come in with these outfits, it's it's fun to see how much they might cost. The, uh, the the diamond Rolex, huh? How much do you think that is? Probably twenty thousand plus. Oh, I thought you said the whole outfit was twenty. You're saying just the watch no, alone? No, I'm saying the whole outfit it was easily twenty five thousand dollars plus. Right, right, sweater's right. Sweater's like seven fifty. We found <laughs> the exact sweater. You did? Uh, yeah, 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 the Fendi, <laughs> the Fendi sweater. Uh, chain is is probably another eight to ten grand. I mean, what about the glasses? The glasses were probably another. What were eight. those? I don't know. I couldn't tell. The 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 arms on him were too skinny to see the brand. Wow. Oh, I thought you meant his actual arms. I'm like, those are fighting words. <laughs> you're like, wow, you're calling Pettis small? Uh, Anthony Pettis, so much ice you can skate on him. Remember that line? I yeah. think that was, uh, who was that? Was that Little Wayne? The block is hot. The block is hot. The block is hot. Ha ha. The block is hot. The block is hot. Yeah, we're micing up Josh right now. All right. Uh, Josh Silvera going to join us. And then after that, Stevie Ray, the pride of Scotland, going to join us. Uh, where exactly in Scotland? I couldn't even begin to pronounce this correctly. Kirk Caldy Fife, Scotland. Kirk Caldy Fife, uh, a.k.a. Braveheart, former uh, UFC fighter. Yeah, you could bring Josh in. Looking forward to talking to him. Undefeated, sensation. Uh, Challenger Series product, and now on Friday, biggest fight of his career by far, uh, going up against Omari Ahmedov as the five seed. Uh, I am looking forward to this chat. Mr. Josh Silvera, how are you, sir? You, Welcome. Hey, brother. Thanks for coming on. How you doing? Thank you. Appreciate it. How are Thank you? Thank you. Good, have, good. Have a seat. Have a seat. Yes, sir. Josh Silvera, the man, undefeated 9-0. Yeah. and Welcome to the program. Yes, uh, Repping ATT, of course, as All always. Day. You could bring that uh, close to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. How are you, sir? All good. 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 How you doing? This is crazy stuff. This is good stuff, yeah. New York City. Right. Hulu Theater, MSG, yeah. fifth seed. You get the call. Antonio Carlos Jr. out, teammate. Teammate. And you're in fighting a vet who and, has like... And another teammate, yeah. And another teammate. Yeah. This is weird stuff. <laughs> uh, what was your reaction when you got the call that you're in with a chance now to win a million dollars? Man, my, my reaction was like, uh, at first, you know, um, it sucks to see a teammate hurt. Um, but it was one of those things where um, when, 
when I uh, got the knockout in that last round, um, I knew what I did what I could do. You know, there's really nothing. There's like a point system. So when they gave me that call, they told me, hey, just relax. There's always something that happens. You never know with the PFL season. So when they gave me that call and, and my dad hit me up, he said, hey, we're in. I was like, oh, let's do it. You know, let's, let's, let's go. Let's mix go of emotions, it. right? Because your teammate who got hurt. Yeah, it was a mix of emotions because I knew he was kind of hurt before. Okay. And uh, to, to be honest, Omari broke, he broke his nose the last fight. Everyone saw it. He got hit in the nose. So I saw his nose in Atlanta. So everyone was kind of telling me, hey, man, I don't know if he's going to be able to fight. He has a broken nose. So at first it was almost like get ready to fight shoe face in a way. Just get ready in general. They told me to get ready in general. So I thought I was going to fight shoe face. And then two, three days later, ended up being Omari, you know? But I had a fight against Corey Hendricks already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no, of course. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how do you feel about the teammate stuff? Like, is that weird? Um, it's, uh, it's, it might be, it's more weird for the coaches. Um, Cause like the coaches are, I've known these guys since I was like six years old. So for them, it's like they're training a guy to go beat up like their nephew in a way. Right. Um, even the boxing coaches, they're brothers, they're legit brothers. So it's like more torn between them. Like, oh, this sucks. But me and Omari were like in the sauna the other day, like chatting. And really? I shake his hand all the time. Yeah, man, he's my brother. <laughs> but so not awkward. Like, did you see him at the gym as you were? Yeah, I saw him yesterday. We see oh. uh, like uh, I'll be at one end of the gym. He'll be at the other end of the gym. Um, every once in a while, the other Dagestanian guys will come with the cell phone. Keep going. Keep yeah, going yeah, like, yeah, during yeah, my yeah, break. Yeah. And then uh, I'll walk over there and my my dad sometimes will be like, hey, uh, you guys are done training. You know, after his, his training's over, kind of like, oh, I missed the training. I, I wanted to see it. You know, Pahumpa is always talking about it too, like coming to see our trainings. But we we joke about it, man. It's uh, to be honest, it's uh, it's just business stuff, you know. Okay, so you're yeah. you're okay. It won't be hard for you to punch a guy that you respect, that you're friends with. No, man, no. And I and I think it, I expect the same thing from him too. You know right. what I mean? And he's a tough guy too, man. I know him personally too, very well. Trained with him a lot. So crazy year for you. You get in the Challenger yeah. Series. I have to say, uh, obviously, we knew of you from LFA. Yeah. Knew of you because of your dad, the great Conan Silvera, yeah. for many, many years. Uh -huh. Legend. I'm going to ask you about him in a moment. Yeah. But you're on this um, PFL Challenger Series show, I believe in February, mm -hmm. on Fubo, and you don't get the deal. I don't get the deal, right? Which was super weird to me. I was like, how are they going to pass up on this guy? I like, know. You had it all, undefeated. It was, it was a weird fight, man. It was a weird fight. I know, fight. the dude was fish hooking fish hook, you. Fish yeah. the cage. He, he bit me a couple times. Legit. Yeah, he did. I was in uh, the mount position getting the arm triangle choke, and, and I just would feel the his teeth trying to grasp something, oh you know? Oh, my God. Just left me kind of like, what the hell is going on, you know? It was a weird fight, and I think it was a weird fight for everyone to watch, and I think the PFL wanted to see finishes. They're trying to push for finishes, you know? And right. that guy got that flying knee. <laughs> we ended up being both, both, of, both of us were in the tournament. Did you feel weird that you, like, I mean, you're... You're like a huge prospect. How do you not get the contract? Yeah, it, finish it was, or no finish. It was a little. It was a little weird. You know, I remember, um, like walking off, and my dad and I. I kind of looked at his face, and he was kind of like, "Well, that that was kind of weird." Yeah. And, and the the person who was most fierce was Dan. Dan Lambert. Lambert, really? Yeah, he's mad because he's known me since I was a kid, man. So he's like, oh, you know, what the hell, you know?" Then uh, two or three days later, I get the phone call, and then they're like, "No, you're in." Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so was there a moment where you were like, "Man, I don't want to be with these guys." No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was just uh, for me. It was I see. I was raised with MMA, you know. So right. I see these organizations as they're cool, they're nice. But I was raised with like when there was no organizations, there was none of this stuff. So. MMA for me or valitude or fighting is kind of like a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just like, oh, if it doesn't work out, I'll go to somewhere else. You know, I knew I knew um, Eagles was in Miami all the time. I was right. thinking uh, maybe I'll just get a, another little fight at Eagles MMA or or just wait for somebody else to call me, you know, because uh, I just got great guys around me. So I knew that it was just a matter of time of something happening. So your dad, Conan Silvera, yeah. former MMA fighter, black belt, uh, under the Gracie family, and then uh, has fought in the UFC, but you yeah. know, gained so much notoriety and uh, attention as a, a coach at ATT, mm -hmm. one of the head guys over at ATT, if not the head guy. And yeah, so he's the head coach. Head he coach. is the head coach. Yeah, he's the head number coach, co-founder, yeah, co-founder yeah. along with uh, Dan Lambert. Dan right? Lambert, yeah. And and so you're like when when he went to ATT when he started there. How old are you? Man, so uh, 
uh, when you're ATT, 29, right? 29 when ATT started. You're yeah. asking ATT started in 2002, so I was, I was maybe like uh, that was eight, 20 years ago. You're eight nine years old. Yeah, I was eight eight or nine. But I, uh, before ATT, it was called Severa Brothers, mm -hmm. and Severa Brothers was like that little gym that Dan used to go to. Uh, it was my Marcelo Severa was my uncle and my dad. They had that little team. You know, and that's where it all came from, Severa Brothers. Okay. And then there was Brazilian Top Team, and then like, hey, let's do this thing here, and that's where American Top Team came along. Do you remember your dad fighting? Um, uh, specifically, uh, I don't have like like great images. I have picture images. I remember when he fought. Um, I believe. Um, Marie Smith back in the day, you know, I remember that was like a grudge match. I remember the battle cade. I remember uh, the mats being yellow, big yellow mats, you know, and people just going insane, you know, and no gloves, things like that. But, um, not understanding really, you know, I just kind of like look at my dad's face. He had like cuts and, and stitches and stuff. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? You must've you know? thought he was like Superman, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's all, yeah. He's still Superman to me sometimes, That's right. you know, but, uh, yeah, no, dude, it was, uh, it was an interesting thing growing up. I always thought everybody understood it. Mm. Like, Oh, you don't jujitsu. You know, you don't, yeah. arm, you don't arm bars and, and you don't pass guard. Oh, that's weird. You know, cause it was just so involved, you know, it was just so involved in it growing up. Uh, he had a very famous night in Japan with uh, Sakuraba. Sakuraba. Yeah. yeah. The two the, fights in one two night. Fight. Yeah. You weren't born then, right? Um, I was not born then. No, I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't because it was weird. My dad was a coach first, had a gym, and then he became a fighter. It usually works the opposite. Right. You start as a fighter. So um, I, I I wasn't, I, I don't think I was born then. It was like 95, 96 off top no, of No, I was born. I was born. Then. Okay. Yeah. And, and John McCarthy, Big John was, yes, uh, and yes. I remember talking to him, dude, uh, back in the day, it was a lot different um, th than the, the UFC is now. You know, I remember him winning the first fight and like Big John had to go in there and tell my dad, like, dude, no, they're, they're outside the locker room and you have to fight again. <laughs> you got to go out there and fight again, you know? So it's kind of sketchy, right. you know, you can't even find that poster. Really? I, I don't think. You've looked you for it? I've tried looking for it and stuff. Uh, it's ve it's very under the rug. Right, right, right. right, you right. Know? That was like the first you Japan. Yep. You could find yeah. the clips online though. I'm you sure find you've the clips. seen them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of a uh, a bad stoppage, but that happens all the time. We right. see it till you know we see it now. So it's I don't know, man. The Japanese guys. I don't know who was back there. They made my dad fight again. And so, do you remember like being four or five years old? You're in the gym. Like this is just your life. Like yeah. you know nothing else. Yeah, I remember just. Uh, this was like my playground, you know what I mean? Uh, the smell of the gym, the the kimonos, a lot of kimonos, you know, just just being washed all the time and, and the tape, you know, and g just these guys, you know, Vitor Belfort was around when I was a kid. Carson Gracie was here, Carson Gracie Jr., um, Ralph Gracie. The, the, it was just like a family thing, you know? And I, I kind of remember more like outside the gym, like the barbecues. And I was uh, like, man, I'm with these freaking badass guys. You know, they're badass, but then they were normal to me. They were just regular guys, you know? Uh, I remember, like, my dad going to Publix to weigh himself, like, in a Speedo and stuff like that. Why? Because like, we didn't have, like, didn't scales at home. Really? Yeah, like, it'd be a line of Brazilian guys, like, weighing at Publix. Come on. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was just kind of like a uh, free-from, man. Vale tudo, you know? <laughs> we're showing, like, old-school footage. Oh, you, you just missed it. I, I think oh. you posted it on your Instagram. Could we run that again uh, of you as a... Uh, as a youngster. Yeah, that was 94, man. Two years old there. This is you? Yeah, that's me. Man. Little blonde, baby. The, they called me Alemão, the little German kid, because all these Brazilian guys, tan, is, and you see this little blonde kid walking around looking like, whose baby is this? Right, right, you right. <laughs> you have siblings? Yeah. H how many? So I have Jago Jr., Max's, Jessica. Well, you got to count? Yeah, I got I to count sometimes. I got five. Five? Five brothers yeah. and sisters. Five brothers and sisters. They're 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 from different uh, parents and stuff. Okay. But, but Do they yeah. fight? No, I'm the only one who does this. Okay. Yeah. Who um, does anything in martial arts? The only one. The the only one who did was the one right below me. He did a little wrestling. Okay. Um. But yeah, I'm the only um one who does this. And and to be honest, I'm not the craziest one. The other ones are a lot crazier than me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one in California. He's super chill. Got dreads all the way down. You know, he's like the California lifestyle. Like lives. He chooses to live in his van. Like he does it very professionally, which I think is crazy. You wow. Know what I mean, he so, lives in his van. Lives in his. What van. kind? Of, is it like one of these vans that I have here? Yeah, it's kind of like one of those. Okay. Man. And and uh, he sends me pictures like, yo, I modify things, and it looks it looks legit, man. You know what I mean? And he's super into that. So. 
props to him, you know. I'm, uh, I think that's a lot more ballsy to do it than what I'm doing sometimes. So when did you decide, like, okay, this is something I actually, I want to follow in my father's footsteps and become a fighter? <clears throat> Man, um, growing up, I always felt like I wanted to do this. Like, it was always in my mind. So my mother would always, she would see that, like, this kid wants to fight, keeps talking about it. So she would always tell me, like, try to find something else. Like, try to maybe see what you like. So growing up, it was always trying to find something besides fighting because I, I, that was just always in my mind. You know, and I think that's like a, it's a blessed thing to have because I think we, we go throughout our lives not knowing what, what we want to do. And I think growing up, I'm just like, no, this is exactly what I want to do. So what age are you around this time where you're like, this is what I want to do? Man, I remember going to like career day <laughs> and, and, and having to explain to the kids that it's cage fighting. Vali tudo. I would say vali tudo. And like I would do like elbow. Yeah. Like what the hell? I was like rear naked. And they're like, what's going on? What is that? I was like cage fighting. I don't know how to wow, explain so the, it. Because so, MMA, the word MMA didn't exist. Then, right, right, right. You know, so uh, I just always wanted to, man. Like ever since elementary school, I guess, you know, running around the gym. You've just, never wanted to do anything else? I tried thinking about being like a veterinarian or something like that. Right. I'm not too good with like... It's kind of funny. I'm not good with like blood and cuts, but when I'm wow, in there, it's, it's kind of like it doesn't respond. Like I don't respond to it when it's happening in the moment, but like watching it and stuff, I'm not too good with that right. stuff. Um, um, like I, I've thought about like business and stuff like that, you know, like a company and things like that. And I'm just like, man, I just can't wrap my head around it. You know, I feel like I'll be able to open doors with MMA right. to go do other things. But I've always wanted to do this. It's a strange Strange thing, you know, I'm an MMA baby. So you went to uh, Arizona State. Arizona State. Part of that, I think, uh, was South Carolina? North or Carolina State. North Wolfpack. Carolina State, yes. Yeah. But then you transferred, and you, tran you, you wrestled for Arizona State? So I wrestled for Arizona State. I started at North Carolina State, yeah. ACC school. Um, uh, shout out to Lee Pritz, you know, he got me out there. And then, um, you know, I was like the first college kid in my family, like, like, uh, like, college kid to like leave and sure. uh, let alone us uh, athlete shit was kind of like new to me so it got a little rocky and then i ended up going to iowa a juco uh, yeah you know, junior college and, and yeah. jcaa yeah. um called ellsworth community college and then i ended up winning a national title for them um and then from ellsworth lee pritz the same guy who was at north carolina state went, was at arizona state and loyalty man he he re-recruited me thank god wow you know and uh, that's how i ended up at arizona state and then I ended up uh, <clears throat> being trained under, eventually under Zeke Jones, mm -hmm. which uh, everyone knows. Yes. You know? He's the uh, Jordan uh, Burroughs. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You weren't there when like Kane and all these guys were there, right? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. But I would always see Bader and CB. Those right. were those were the guys that was always around. Um, um, you know who I was always see? That legend, man. The, him and the Japanese guy that beat each other's face. Oh, Don like, Fry? Don Fry. Yeah, see, yeah. Bro, he is something else. He's yes. a lot of energy. Man. Uh, but I would see Great him. Mustache. I would see Dan Severin. Wow. It was funny because my dad fought Dan Severin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was always fun to talk about, you know. And uh, and then when you graduated, you stuck around in Arizona. And didn't you train at Arizona Combat with uh, those guys? No, no. So I, I was at, I, I bounced around. So I, I made it sure that to everyone that I'm an ATT guy. Okay. Um, and I talked about it with my dad. And I was like, hey. Um, I'm going to chill here, you know, because uh, the amateur for Florida is like the pads and stuff. Mm. So I was like, yo, hang out there, get some am amateur fights, um, get feel for like not having no pads or shin pads or anything like that. So I stayed there and then I started going to power MMA at first with right. Bader right. and then CB and Aaron Simpson. And then um, I just started like bouncing around because I felt like nobody could tell me really what to do. Like I didn't have my dad there and I wasn't for sure not going to let... You know, people try to, because that's what happens. Like, these coaches try to take control of you sometimes, you know? So I was like, yeah, I just want to make sure to everyone I'm bouncing around. And then eventually I would bounce around to Arizona Combat Sports. Got it. And that's where I kind of learned how to spar t hard, man. That was, they were, they were brutal out there. Really? Yeah. But you always knew in the back of your mind you were going back to Florida. To ATT, always. Yeah, yeah. But I stayed uh, about five years um, in Arizona total. No, no. Yeah, about five or six years, you know? By the fifth, sixth year, my dad was already calling me like, hey. It's time. Let's just get, let's get it going now. You know, which was a great, it was a great transition because I think if I would have gone to American Top Team right away, mm. it could have been bad. Why? It's just, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a shark tank. It's a shark tank there, man. It's, I see you guys go in there and it's like, you have to get ready to go there. You right. just can't go there and get ready. It doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? Just everyone's, and everyone's cool, man. So it's a, it's a great system we have. 
But everyone's tough, man. Everyone is like striving for something there. And when you graduated, you knew for sure this is what you're going to do. Oh, for a fact. By that point, you're like, I'm yeah. all in. Yeah, yeah, for a fact. And, and I went through phases because as I got older, I, you know, you start to like realize like, oh, crap, the sport's developing. These guys are throwing heel, like wheel kicks and uh, Anderson Silva's leg broke. Like, yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah. there's a lot of like stuff where when you're a kid, you kind of think you're tough and you're just going right. to see through that stuff. But I went through phases like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? And my dad called me. And he broke it down to me. He said, this is not easy stuff. He's like, we're lucky enough to to make it somewhere sometimes. You know, you could be tough. If nobody knows you, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So there's a lot more than just the fighting aspect to it. So he broke it down for me. And and, and I'm blessed, man, to have these guys behind me. Having you know? that famous last name, famous father yeah. as your coach, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. You feel that pressure? I, I feel, feel like you don't want to let him down. You know, it's 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 different when it's family, right? Yeah, you know, I I feel the pressure, but I like my parents came from Brazil. You know, um, they didn't have much, so me just being where I'm at, that's already like I feel good about like just uh, giving back to my family. You know, like we're we're not we're not where we started. That's for sure. You know what I mean? So I think for me, it's just kind of like the 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 pressure is there, but um, I love it. I love it because uh, if you ask me at the end of the day, are you going to do it or you don't, I'm going to do it again over and over again. You know, it's just, uh, I love it. I feel like I was made for this. Um, like I said, I feel like my family's done so much already coming to this country and doing things that this is just, this is just like extra happiness, you know? What's it like at the gym? You have all these guys, legends there, right? Like some of the toughest yeah. dudes on the planet, but you're Conan's son. Yeah. Do you feel like they <laughs> take it easy on you? No. They, are they harder on you? Like what, no, what, no. what is so, the dynamic so the, like? The guys at the gym, they're they're cool. I'm, I'm pretty good at not being Conan's son. Okay. Know? I'm pretty good at not using that, um, that advantage. But they know it. Yeah, they know it. They know it, but... Um, my dad, um, if anything, he, he is super hard on me in front of them. You know, I, I'm a, I have an issue with being on time sometimes, you know, okay. it's, it's Brazilian just, time, Brazilian time. Brazilian. Yeah. That's one thing that I got. Um, and, uh, he chews me up in front of him and the guys lo will look at me like, holy shit. He just yelled at his son, like, like dad and son, not wow. coach and son, you know? And, uh, I think they, when they see that we're, we, they, they kind of don't think like, oh, that's the coach's son. He does what he wants. You okay, know? I'm okay. fair. You know, there's one guy who called it Maluco, the, the Joker guy. He calls me Prince all the time. The Prince is here. Uh, the Prince. I'm like, come on, dude. Yeah. Like, please. Do you, no. do, you, do you live in the uh, the dorms? No, I did. Not you anymore. did? No, I did live in wow. the dorms. Wow. Yeah, yeah. For how long? Was, for for a while, man. I would say maybe like half a year. Wow. I lived there when there was a bunch of Russians. I I, was, I got really uh, good friends with Nikita. Nikita okay. Nikita Kurilov. Or, yeah, yeah me Kurilov. And, yeah, me and him became really good friends wow. in that dorm, yeah. Uh, what you, now? What about this Amanda Nunes? She has said some things about your, uh, yeah, your father man. and stuff. What's uh, up with that? Um, they were so close. Yeah, she reached the mountaintop. She was the goat. She yeah. is the goat. And then one loss, and then everything is blown up. How do you yeah. feel about this, man? You know, um, it's kind of one of those things where, uh, being as the coach's son, I don't really ask my dad much personal things, but um, you read things online and yeah. stuff like that, and um. I don't know. I think growing up and watching fighters uh, to go through their career, I think we all they all have a certain uh, superstition, maybe, or something they need to do perfectly to to have success. You know what I mean? So maybe she went through some stuff and and, and felt like she had to make some changes. And, and I felt like she said she said what she said because um, I think that was just something she had to say. You know, but I I know for a fact that my dad has helped her. Her, through her prime. You I mean, the I mean? proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Look the at what they did you know, together. My, my dad and her conquered some things and, and nobody could take away that, take that from him, you know, but if she felt like she had to think because my dad, what what was it that he had to pull her out to fight or something? Yeah. It was uh, the coach's, you know, like right. the coach's fault. You know, I think one thing that coaches do, a good coach will do, he'll listen, he'll listen to the fighters, you know, so I'm sure if she said, I don't want to fight, you know, he would he would he would be okay with it. The first time they fought, the um the first time she pulled out of a fight against Valentina, mm. um, my dad like said don't do it. That was like the it. day of the fight. Yeah, my dad's like, don't do it. You're the champion. Don't don't do it. If you don't feel good, oh you don't, don't don't take the fight. Don't take the fight. Yeah, yeah oh, really? don't yeah, my dad's already helped her with that. My dad is my dad 
has issues sometimes with um, promoters. Yeah. Because it's like, hey, if, if they give you a problem, tell them to call me. Oh. You know what I mean? Because, yo, we, we want to go to battle knowing at least, no, it's, it's a water of unknown, right? The least we could do is at least be ready for it. Right. You know, so I think when that article came out, you know, I was a little, I mean, I don't care about it really because it's not my career. It's still your dad. It's my dad, yeah. though. So I do have a little taste in my mouth sure. about it. But um, he's a great coach, man. He will never push a guy uh, to go do something that they don't feel comfortable about. That's a you great know, point, though. Especially a championship fight. Yeah. The ball's on your side of the court. You know, she could have, I'm sure if she could have, it, it could have been some issues, but I'm sure they could have found a different main event, you know? There was a different, it was Poirier Oliveira. Oh, Poirier Oliveira. Yeah, yeah, they so were, I'm sure, it would, I'm sure, I mean, people were crazy for that fight, too. Of course. You know, so it wasn't like the card was going to go to. No, they weren't even the main. Yeah. It wasn't like the card would have. But that's a great point about 213. It was UFC 213. It was her versus Julie, no, uh, against Valentina. Yeah. And then they had to bump up uh, the Whitaker fight. Yeah. And she, I remember uh, Amanda. She pulled out the day up. The day up. That was, was the huge. only time, that was yeah. the only time I think she didn't bring my dad along. So it was a phone call. Wow. It was a phone call. Why didn't she bring him? Um, like I said, oh, superstition, no. you want to yeah. change things up. You know, um, I've seen fighters do things that are like awkward, like, yeah. whoa, but maybe in their mind and their soul, that's what they need to do. You know, but it was uh, it was like a phone call, man, because I'm sure she was asking everybody, what should I do? What should I do? And she's like, well, let me call him. And he told her straight up, you know what I mean? Is he hurt by this? Um, I don't think he's hurt because, yeah, the guy is unbreakable. Yeah. The guy's really, he's been through a lot more, you know. And I think when you're dealing with fighters, pr pros, not just fighters, pros, right? This is different than the collegiate athlete where there's scholarships hung over our head and we could get kicked off. These are pros, man. You know, if... If you want to do nothing and get ready for the fight, like a coach accepts that, you know, we don't, they can't do anything about that. You make your decisions, you know? So I think, I think he's upset, but man, he, he, not so much upset. He's moving on, you know? Okay. And I think it's just an, it's just like any article, man. You know what I mean? Now, what about this Colby Covington? I mean, this guy's a real problem, right? In yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, man. I used to train with him tons. Really? What is his main training partner? Me and Johnny Eblen used to train with him a lot. Bellator champion. Yeah, Bellator champion. Yeah, we yeah. all used to train tons, 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 because a lot of wrestling. What was he like? In the, was he the the guy that we see on TV or completely Man, different? Uh, he he wasn't. At least in front of me, he wasn't. You know, quiet. Uh, he's more you know quiet to himself. I'm sure he was felt a lot of tension in the gym. Right. You know, I'm sure. So you were training with him even towards the end there with all uh, the stuff with Jorge and Dustin. Yeah, I was. I trained with him for that la uh, the first Usman fight. Really? Yeah, Usman, wow. Robbie Lawler, um, um, another fight. I think he was getting ready, but it didn't happen. Yeah, I was training with him a lot, and for the simple fact, because a lot of guys don't want to train with him. Okay. Too. <laughs> and why were you the guy? Because I think I'm I'm pretty neutral, you okay. know. And it wasn't just a lot of guys. Some guys did want to train with him, but it was should we? Because they might want to hurt him in training. Wow. It was that so too? He, there had to be trust. Yeah, he rubbed a lot of people off wrong. Right. You know, I mean, for me. You know, I, I, I've, I, uh, it doesn't really affect me. Okay. You know what I mean? Even he, training with the guy, I'm, I always tell people, hey, I'm just training with him. Don't take it personal or anything right. like that, you know? But a lot of the Brazilians in the gym were upset, right? The filthy Brazilians, animals. Brazilians, Russians, they don't like, right. yeah, they don't, they never liked, the, not that they never liked them. They en ended up not liking Right. Yeah. Did you feel the heat for that? Oh yeah. I felt the heat. You, you know? did? Yeah. Yeah. Or, people were mad at you for training with them? Oh no, no. Not me feel the heat. No. I felt the heat in the gym. But there was. No, no. I think that, I think people kind of liked, enjoyed me more. Like, oh, this guy could be able to do this and he's still hanging out with us. Okay. You know, I'm very neutral there. That's like, uh, I got the Brazilian culture in me, but I was raised here in America. So I understand a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, different types of people in a way, right. you know? So, um, I didn't, I, it didn't affect me training with him at all, but um, it would be kind of weird. You see how nice he was when we were training together and stuff, and then I would go see an interview and, you know, he's telling Joanna to fuck yeah, off yeah, or something yeah. like that, or, or telling, talking, to, really talking about like kids and people's wives. That's the part that kind of like, ah, right. you know, I prefer the other stuff. Yeah, there's yeah. a line. Yeah, you know. Um, um, and and so when he left, did things get better? Um, like, could you tell? Yeah, I could tell things got better for sure. People were definitely happy that he left. Um, like like I said, for me, it was a training standpoint. The guy has a great cardio. He's a machine. Yeah. I, I, I learned a lot training with him. You know, so I, I, I got things out of it. But, um, yeah, when he left, I, I didn't really feel uh, – I didn't feel so much tension, you know, especially between him and, and George. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I've known those guys. Uh, it's funny because for me, 
I've known those guys since I was like 15 years old. Wow. 14. Like when Kobe was fresh out of college. So I would see them literally best friends coming into college, goofing or coming into the gym, goofing off and stuff like that. So I remember bringing Jorge aside one day and I was like, Georgie, we call him Georgie. Georgie, seriously, like you, you guys aren't fucking with us. Like be like, seriously, tell me, tell me. At yeah, least. Yeah. And he's like, Josh, I wish I could like tell you this was all a joke, but it's not. Mm. And that's when I realized I was like, damn. It's like that's serious. serious stuff, yeah. You know? Yeah, we saw on your Instagram, uh, you've rolled with Shaq. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Shaq showed up at the gym at one the time. Gym. Yeah. Uh you have a picture there with Kimbo when Kimbo was there. Yeah, the, man. Kimbo was the, the man, man, man. I got to meet I got to get to know him a little bit um during his little MMA what um, a legend, huh? journey. A legend, a super nice guy. Right. Like when you talk to him completely, like you might have like this vision or this thing of what he might be. You get to talk to him, it's like wow. Teddy bear. Teddy bear, yeah. yeah, yeah Super yeah. cool guy. Down Very intimidating on the surface. Very intimidating. But then you, and you're like, like, yo, there's his teeth are all shine everywhere. And you get close, you're like, oh, he's not that bad, you know? But you you think of the guy, the the guy punching the dude's eye out. Sure, sure, That's sure. the Kimbo I see, you know? <laughs> um and and did you like did you have aspirations to go to the UFC? I know you say Valley Tudo, this and that, but really yeah. didn't care. So so to me, the UFC, like I'm grateful the UFC's been around, you know. Yeah. We, we need them, you know. They were like um without them i don't i don't know where the sport would be um so i i had a dream to become a champion you know and then i see all these shows coming you know building up and i and i did have like yo ufc would be cool ufc is the the mission and then i would get to know these fighters and i'm like man um this guy's living pretty well in the bellator you know and yeah. a guy that left the ufc go to the pfl man this guy is doing a lot better for themselves and then i go talk to these guys and i pick their brains a little bit and, and uh eventually just became more open you know i want to go somewhere where i'm valued somewhere where someone's going to want me where they uh enjoy me there we can make money together obviously and and uh change the world a little bit i guess you know for for the better or, or however you know and you feel that at pfl yeah man i feel like pfl is a, a new a new thing you know and um I think you have choices where you could like kind of jump on something good already or, or kind of build something, help build something. And, right. I, and I think at the PFI, I could, I could help build something a little bit over here, you know, and I don't know what the future holds, but this is a good start. And you're two fights away from a million bucks. From a million bucks, yeah, man. Crazy, That's insane, man. right? A year, well, less than a year ago, you're fighting on the Challengers. In Challengers front of, series, like, getting fish hooked, and now I'm, I'm fighting for... for bit. Yeah. Rocking a sweet mullet. Me, yeah, man. It's great. Uh, Brazilian with the mullet over here, huh? I love it. I love it. <laughs> What's the, what, what do you think happens on uh, on Friday? What's the prediction? Um, You know... Um, You've sparred him? Oh, many times. We oh, my sparred, gosh. We trained. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. This, we <laughs> sparred. We trained. He he tells me all the time, you know, hey, this is good. He, t- he tells me yeah, it's going to be hard sparring. Hard okay. sparring. I was like, oh, for sure, hard sparring, you know? But um, to be honest, you know, I, I'm sure um, a fight's a fight at the end of the day. You're going to feel that process, right? Uh, when I look in there, I think I'm going to have to get over that little hump first. We're both going to have to get over a right. hump, you know? Um, Got to get through this. Let's get it on, you know? But I think... Um, once it starts going, man, we're we're both gonna be in the in the zone, and I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but I know that he's been around the block for a while. You know, he's been fighting for a long time, a lot of wear and tear, a lot of hard fights. So I'm just gonna go push his push the pace, get after him, and, and uh, make him go to work one more time. You know I what I mean? It. I love it, man. Great <laughs> to sure. meet you. Thank you. I brother. wish you Great. the best, Josh. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it a lot. A lot man. of fun. Thank you, Thank you so much, and uh, keep it up. Definitely, brother. Appreciate it a lot, man. Good luck to you on Friday. There he is, Josh Silvera, joining us. Uh, a huge name, a huge prospect, nine and zero. And our last in studio guest. Let's keep the train rolling along. My old friend Stevie Ray. There he is. Hello, Stevie. Long time no speak. Oh, yeah. Everything good? Yeah, good, man. Thank you so much oh, yeah. for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, have a seat. The pride of Scotland. I was trying to. Uh, did I pronounce Kirkcaldy Fife? Kirkcaldy. Kirkcaldy yeah, Fife. Yeah. What is Fife? Is that like the town? Fife, yeah. So it's the town. It's like in between, it's close to Edinburgh. Edinburgh, okay. Yeah, yeah. How's life? Yeah, good. Yeah. You had that crazy Very submission? Well. Yeah. I mean, your story is amazing and uh, it's it's great to be able to catch up. But, you know, we've talked in the past about, you know, the ups and downs and everything. Longtime UFC fighter. Didn't fight for three years. You, you, uh, you actually announced your retirement. You had the knee injury, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I believe you were in your car when you announced it on one on one particular Facebook Live session. You seemed I, I rewatched it yesterday, yep. and like the frustration on your face 
was uh, was palpable. But then you get this opportunity with PFL, and that's earlier this year, and everything has changed for you. First fight didn't go your way, but the last fight certainly did. Yep. How did the whole PFL, like, how did they get you out of retirement and get you back on track here? So after the whole thing, you know, with the UFC, because um, obviously I left the UFC on the biggest win of my career, I would say. Um, at, the, at the time, when I beat Michael Johnson, I signed a new four-fight deal. Um, you signed the four-fight deal after the win? Yeah, after the win. Right. Yeah, so so you're thinking a, like... I signed a new four-fight deal after that uh, fight, yeah. Um, and then I was scheduled to fight Mark Diacase in London. But I then, yeah, I had to pull out. Um, so I pulled out, I think, for the first time in my career um, due to the knee injury. And this had been going on... I mean, I had problems even before the Johnson fight of this knee injury. Um, so, yeah, I pulled out the fight and then the whole show ended up getting cancelled. This is March COVID. 2020, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, then I remember, um, you know, that whole process where it was all a bit confusing. I wasn't sure what was going on. My manager was saying um, maybe a bit signing elsewhere and, and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, when I, when I went as a free agent um, at the time, I uh, emotionally retired. So when I retired, I was never like you know, set in stone and retired. And I think it was just emotional. Okay. Um, I had just left the UFC. I was a bit depressed, maybe. But why did um, you leave if you just signed a new four-fight deal? Uh, well, that was just the, the agree. So Ali said to me that um, uh, it was because of my knee, basically. So okay. because the the doctor, it was, it was really confusing at the time. I wasn't really sure what was happening. Um there was talks of signing elsewhere and I, I said that I didn't really want to because I had a I had a deal with the UFC. Um, but, um, yeah, to, to be honest, my knee was bad at the time. I f from what I've heard, the UFC didn't see it as a quick fix. Uh, there was no, like, quick term. Um, and the doctor, I uh, can't remember his name, but one of the doctors at the UFC said that um, it wouldn't be like a a quick fix. I, I shouldn't fight with money, basically. Um, so what them, was the issue? Uh, it's just cartilage. Just okay. like yeah, just the Painful? fact that yeah, just arthritis, like bone on bone. It's kind of something that's like you kind of get a surgery and get fixed. Um, so yeah. Um, so there was then the talks of uh, going as a free agent, but it was COVID at the time as well. You know, there wasn't going to be promotions taken on. Um, so that happened. And then, yeah, and then just my knee was bad at the time as well. You know, it was bad. And I was just like, I remember just being emotional. I was just like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm done with MMA. Because as most people know, the amount of, you know, sacrifice and the years that you have to put in, um, to get to the top and then I got to the top and then what happened on the biggest win in my career or after that and it was just like my life just came crashing down um, and it almost feel, felt unfair to me, you know, but I know life can be unfair sometimes but yeah, it is what it is um, and then it wasn't until a wee while after that I was like, shit, what, what am I going to do with my life now? Wow. You didn't have like, anything set up. Yeah, because I'm, just, uh, you know, my, it was like my career was over. Right. Was, uh, you know, How old were you? I, I've tried to point. explain it to some people. It's like, it's like imagine the whole, the only thing you've done your whole life, you've then, you're then told you can't do it anymore. It's right. like, what do you do? Um, so yeah, emotionally retired. And then, then I'm like, what am I going to do now? Uh, and then I realized that, you know, I do still want to fight. And uh, yeah. But what, what, so you were so right now you're 32. So you, what were you like 30? Yeah, I would have been. So it was just after. That's a Johnson scary thought, right? Yeah, start you have of, kids. Start of COVID. Right. Yeah. And you're like, what do you? You had n nothing set up for the future. Yeah. Well, I, I've kind of got my own gym at home, so I probably would have went down that line. Um, because after the Paul Felder fight, when you know I rest, I went in a kind of free agency. Um, after I lost to Paul Felder in Glasgow. I started doing a bit of coaching and then I've built up uh, my gym at home, Braveheart MMA, and it really took off quick. So yeah, for the last 
since then I've been coaching and uh, fighting as well, which is uh, yeah, it's been really tough. tough thing, but, right? Yeah, but when I'm fighting, I, I, I've now built up a, a good enough team where I've got uh, so, some really good guys where um, I just get them to handle it. You know, I've got guys taking the Braveheart MMA classes and I just go and focus on the gym. So I'm staying at higher level MMA in Bathgate and I, and I stay in the gym um, there because they've got like, you know, beds and kitchen and all right. of that um, so I can focus. So then you yeah. get this opportunity with PFL, big time promotion. Yep. What was it like when you got that contract? They're like, all right, I'm back. You know, there's the promise of the million dollars. You had these feelings, FMMA, I'm done with this. You get, you know, COVID, unfair, bad luck, whatever you want to say. But now you have this opportunity. Like when you got that, because, you know, there's a chance you could say, hey, I'm back. No one's offering you a deal, right? Or maybe you're getting a small time local show deal or something like that. So when you got that initially earlier this year or late last year, what was that like for you? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's like the highs, highest to highs, lowest to lows, and then it wasn't the best time either, like I said, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be, you know, shows were getting cancelled. I mean, that was now a, a thing that was really used to happening, like the UFC cancelled their whole show, and, um, and yeah, so that's probably why it took a lot longer for me to get back fighting. But, uh, yeah, my manager, Ali, he... Uh, he again came to the the rescue and um he uh, said you know i've got you you know a, an opportunity with the pfl um so yeah that pretty much how that came about i, I was always waiting anyway um I, I figured out like i said pretty quickly after um i retired that i wanted to fight again it just took so long because of covid so if not for covid you would have been back sooner yeah, yeah okay you were, yeah. and how was i was need? always training still so. okay it's not like I took this big long time off. I was still training, but obviously I had the ring rust because I hadn't fought in two and a half years when I fought Martinez. Right. And uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if I really believed in ring rust, but and then when I, you know, when I was in there against Martinez, you know, it did feel a bit different. I'm like, oh, this, even just cutting weight after two and a half years, I'm like, I remember how miserable it is. Right. Um, you know, having to watch your calories and all that stuff again, but. Uh, yeah, I got that one out of the way, and then obviously um, got the big one, the last one. How was the knee? So the knee is completely uh, healed. It's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't limit you, doesn't give you problems? Uh, not recently. Okay. Um, so for the past maybe year, it's been great. Probably not compared to a completely healthy normal knee but nowhere near uh, what it was even before the Johnson fight. Um, because, I, I mean, I fought just in a yare with, with a bad knee. Um, I remember having to go swimming a lot, you know, so I wasn't uh, running or making it worse. Um, the Johnson fight, the, the Cajun Johnson fight, like so many fights I fought with bad knees. Um, and yeah, now, my knee, so... Uh, some rehab and a lot to do with yoga. Uh, mm. I do I do Bikram yoga um, every every week, at least once a week. But that is just completely f fixed and healed my knees. Really? Uh, yeah, because it was kind of both of them. Sweaty. Like how hot does it get in that room? Uh, Forty degrees. Wow. So Forty degrees. It's ninety minutes. And, Damn. Uh, yeah, and it's tough. Like anybody that so Bikram yogas, I feel especially the ninety minute Bikram yoga. It's so different to other yogas. I mean, it's you're getting a really hard workout. Uh, like it's tough. I've brought some of my training partners there for the first time, and they've had to sit out. Um, really? Yeah, like twenty to thirty minutes before the end. Uh, maybe I'm actually like the heat and the, you know, how tough it is. Um, but uh, but yeah, so. Um, you're you're getting like heat acclimation, so the. Uh, getting good mobility, you're getting a workout. Um, yeah. It has changed you. Okay, so you come back, it doesn't go your way in the first fight, but then you were fighting Anthony Pettis, legend, former UFC champion, and you submit him with the, would you call it a body triangle? Because even he said it was like, there's there's elements of the twister in there as well. Yep. well. What would you call that? So I would call it a modified twister. Modified twister. Yeah. This is something you've actively worked on? Yeah, so... 
There's a picture of it right over there. I uh, can't show the footage, but uh, yeah, I so mean, that because, thing is brutal. I mean, I'll try and explain it. Please. Um, and the first time someone ever hit it on me, it was at Extreme Coutures in okay. Vegas. Some guy I was rolling with, um, I'd done the same thing as Pettis did. So somebody's on my back, body triangle, legs on the inside. It's MMA sparring, so I've turned to get up and guard. And then all of a sudden, I'm tapping because the horrendous pain in my spine. And then I asked the guy after it, uh, he had longer hair, I'm sure, um, a thin guy with long hair. But uh, yeah, I said, what was that? And he, he was just saying it was a type of twister. Um, so yeah, I basically stole it from him. Wow. Um, and, and in terms of like applying it, so obviously you have the, the body triangle locked in and you're pressing, like it, it should hurt your ribs, right? That's what Anthony so, said. So yeah, it can hurt your ribs, and it, but it's kind of the spine as well. So you got to think like, what is a twister? It's, it's twisting the spine. And um, Damn. and then when, when I've got the, the body triangle with the leg on the inside, because I've not got the body triangle just completely on his back, like trying to get a rear naked choke. It's almost like I'm side on. Um, a little bit like I've, I've allowed them to shrimp I've got my leg hooking the inside rather than the outside leg as the inside leg um, and I'm keeping his lower body in this case because the way it was to the right and then when he's turned up on top his upper body is turned so his upper spine is turned to the left his lower body uh, or lower spine is still facing the right because of the lock I've got on his lower spine. Wow. And the inside control. And then, uh, and then yeah, then I'm extending as well to also stretch, but there's the twist and the stretching. Uh, Jeez. Yeah. So you, you, did you plan on this? Like, what, at what point do you realize I can hit this? Is this so, something that you felt that you could get? Because Pettis mentioned in the Poirier fight, you know, his 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 ribs were compromised. Different yep. move completely. But like, yep. did you feel like this was something that would be open to you, or is it just something that happens in the flow of the fight? So the one in the Poirier fight, that was more an accident where he injured it. Uh, whereas when I done it, uh, that was like the only reason he got up on top of me is because I allowed him. Mm -hmm. I allowed him to turn up on top, and and everybody thought, you know, Pettis is oh well done, he's turned up. But no, that was because I allowed him and then submitted him. But um, yeah, I've landed that. I mean, all my training partners watching it were probably knowing exactly. One of my teammates, Kieran, um, had sent me videos of a... So I, I'd already watched the footage. I knew that he escaped the back that way anyway. But Kieran said to me, he sent me some, a couple of videos and he's like, by the way, you could totally hit that twister that you do to everybody in the gym. Because um, I land it a lot in the gym, obviously a lot more careful, but he's like, you'll be able to pull off that twister if you get his back. Um, and yeah, then just when I got the back, I knew that he would uh, try and do that. And he actually posted that. But I know he thinks that maybe him posting the video a couple of days before that that's maybe why he got caught but you know i was i'd already studied them and but yeah he posted a couple of days before it saying it it works every time he put the clip up of him escaping and said it works every time uh -huh. but uh but yeah i was going to be doing it anyway regardless and could you even describe after everything you had been through to get a win like that that kind of sub against a guy like Pettis, what did that feel like seconds after when you were? Yeah, uh, well, you could see it. You could see it in the video, like yeah. a stand up. I'm, I'm almost in a bit like, even though I, I was confident. I mean, in the interviews, I said before it, I'm like, I, I believe I'll stop him uh, within two rounds. I'm sure I said, um, and yeah, and I did. And so I, I was confident, but it was almost in disbelief, you know, that I just pulled it off. I managed to pull off the kind of submission that not a lot of people knew what it was and uh yeah it was just unreal i've landed that before as well by the way I, I, on you know the grappling show polaris yes so i i submitted a guy craig yours um slightly different because craig yours didn't turn up on top of me um i've more forced it so it was more like the traditional way of hitting the twister but still with the body lock mm -hmm. um that's where you competed against patty right yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my party with this. Isn't that crazy now? Patty's become this huge name. Yeah, yeah. A few years ago, like no one's talking about him. You know, they're, in Europe they're talking about him, but now he's become this gigantic yeah, he was, star. He, he always had like the same. He always had that kind of big hype about him in Europe, but yeah, yeah. now obviously he's uh, 
you know, free and all in the UFC, and he's kind of went mega worldwide. Does it surprise you? Uh, not really, to be honest, because he's, you can tell he's got that type of personality, you mm -hmm. know, kind of like McGregor, like polarizing. He's, uh, you know, so many people hate him and so many people love him. Um, and, you know, you're either watching him because you want to see him get knocked out or because or you want to see him do well. So, I mean, that that's what it's all about. He, he's getting, regardless if you love him or hate him, he's making you want to tune in. Mm -hmm. So um, we just we just spoke to Anthony uh, before, and I know he's done media and stuff. And, you know, I, he's not dismissive of the loss, obviously. He gives you credit, but he did say that, you know, the fight didn't really mean anything to him. He was kind of looking past it because he already knew that he was in the the, the, the playoffs, the yep. semifinals. He had the... The, the the full points from the finish in the previous fight. You've obviously, I'm assuming, have heard some of the things that he said. Do you feel like he is not giving you, you know, full props for this? What do you think of what he's saying uh, about the last fight? Yeah, so he's obviously saying that to try and reassure himself, I think, and, and you know, whether he believes it fully or not. I mean, when you're in a kit, when you're in the octagon um, or... or um, you know, in a fight with another guy, it doesn't matter what the um, <laughs> the circumstances are. You're trying to win, right? Because like, he was saying he was playing it safe. Maybe he was playing it a little bit safe, but he was still hitting me with. You know, he was still trying to finish me. He was hit hitting me with everything he had, um, and I was still pushing forward. I feel like even before, you know, the the submission that. Um, it wasn't going as well as he's making out as it, as it was. I mean, I feel the first round was pretty close. Um, he landed some decent stuff. I landed some good shots. I was forward pressuring. Um, and then obviously if I didn't get the submission, I had his back. And I would have still been on his back. I only allowed him to come up into the guard, if you like, uh, because I'd done the submission. So I'd still be on his back with a body triangle, probably punching him in the face, <laughs> winning the second round. So... Um, yeah, I mean, he's going to say, obviously, that he, he, he makes some good points. Like, uh, he was the one that initiated the, the ground game. I mean, I, I went for a couple of takedowns, but I wasn't really, I wasn't too fussed about getting it down there. I mean, I was forward pressure and, uh, and looking to strike. Um, a couple of takedown attempts from myself and same from him. He tried to trip me one time. Um, well, I know, so kind of judo... Uh, uh, move and yeah then eventually the takedown that led to me being on his back and I kind of got my leg stuck um, I eventually got it out but uh, but yeah I think he's going to see on Friday that you know he, he's going to get some reminders that I'm here to fight um, and yeah this time it's just a normal fight we don't have to finish each other we just need to win but right. Yeah, I think it's going to be the same outcome. What do you think the difference is between Anthony Pettis today and maybe five, six years ago? Uh, the big one, uh, money, money. Uh, maybe, I could be wrong, but there's they're supposedly a saying, it's hard to get out of your bed and, and I love sell sheets or, yeah. or something. Marvin Hagler said, uh, it's hard to wake up at 4 a.m. to pound the pavement to go running when you're waking up in satin sheets. Yeah. So you think that has affected him? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I don't think it, I mean, I think these people like to try and act like or convince themselves that it's not, but it's true. I mean, like Conor McGregor's, you, everybody could see it with McGregor as well. I mean, how hunk, it's like hunger, hungry, you know. Uh, I mean, he's he's already the rich. You can see it sitting here with his big gold chain, his watch, and it. Um, you were? Did you uh, see when he, when he was yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, I kind of seen a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, just I, I never listened to the whole thing because I just got here, but I was tr trying to listen to a little bit. But I just think like, you know what? He's he's obviously trying to convince himself that he's maybe still as hungry. Maybe he is, uh, but he's already rich. Um, he's got so much other stuff going on. He's got a show next week. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's going to be distracting a little bit. I mean, you, I heard you asking how involved are you? And then he's like, I'm, he's been really involved. Right. And it's like, that's got to be a bit of a distraction for, for this. I mean, the only thing I've been focusing on for, for you know, the last few months or what feels like since January, because I've been on fight camp right. pretty much since then, um, is just this, fighting and that's it. And I think that sometimes is the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
I mean, did you see what he got paid uh, fighting me? I mean, I'm no. What was I, this? I, it was seven fifty, right? Seven hundred and fifty k. And you got eighty. Yeah, I got forty and forty, so I got eighty. So you get the win and show model. He doesn't. Yeah, I'm not sure if he just got a flat rate. I don't know yeah. if he got more or if he won. I think it was no. He said flat rate. rate. Flat rate. But you have win and show. I don't yeah. like win and show. I yeah. think you guys deserve guaranteed. Yeah, this is probably. Crazy. Um, but I suppose I I understand that and I get why he's, why he's getting paid more than me. He's but when you see, I mean, that's a big difference. Yeah, you yeah. don't need me to tell well, you. That. Now, well, now that I know, you know how much they can pay. Yeah. Because I thought you know forty and forty is a lot of money even to me and but. How did you feel four, when you I've saw that? I've got four kids at home, um, and uh, when I seen how much he was getting paid, I was just like, "Wow!" Now I'm pissed? like, "Nah," because it's one of those ones. Like, just because I've beat him doesn't mean I should get paid more than him. If he's selling, if he's making the PFL way more money than I am, mm. even though I beat him, then it doesn't mean that I should get paid the same. But if I, when I win on Friday, I've got two wins over him. I want a pay rise. Yes, that's for sure. Uh, well, first comes the million dollars, hopefully, well, yeah. after that, yeah, right? Yeah, that's it. That's the, the main focus is that. But and then, yeah, of course, then yeah. I'd like to get paid more. Per How big of a deal well. would that be for you? A million dollars in addition to what you're making, right? Yeah. So Considering how the last couple of years have gone, this is life-changing. Life Absolutely life-changing, yeah. I mean, not a lot of people get a chance to win a million dollars, and, and it's over the space, of, you know, um, not that long, like within a year. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just crazy, especially when, like you said, when you look two two years ago, that I thought everything was you know done. It's all like just a complete roller coaster of emotions, and and that's what MMA is at yeah. times. But you know the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. I feel like you in particular. I mean, you have you've you've dealt with the full gamut. Yeah, well, retirement, thinking my career's over. Right. The the wins, the losses, the. Uh, the injuries, the losing, the kind of career with the UFC, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm trying not to think too much uh, of obviously the million dollars sure, because sure. even though I've said everything about Anthony, um, like I know he's going to come and bring it. He's no, he, you know, he, he's going to come. He's going to come and try and fight and win. Obviously, um, so I've got to just put all my focus on beating him again. Um, and then, yeah, then it's the the final. But um, any hard feelings towards the UFC for how it ended? Eh, sometimes, yeah. Like, but yeah, I kind of get, I get, I understand. Like, I understand it all. They're a business. Like then I honest, said, I don't really understand it. How do you come off a win, sign a four fight deal, and, not, and get cut? I don't get that. Well, it's just what they, they... So I spoke to Shelby after it because cause I, even before the PFL deal, I asked, I was like, you know what, I do want to fight again. Sure. asked if they would have me back and Sean actually said that they would. They, oh. would take, they would take me back if I could prove that my knees were better. So I think they wanted like a... So he actually said if you can prove that your knees are better or that you've had knee reconstruction. Um so I said, I've not had knee reconstruction. I replied back to that email saying, I've not quite had knee reconstruction, but my knees are better. I've healed them, like the yoga and rehab has helped heal them. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the last we spoke and then the PFL thing happened. But I mean, if fighting three times in four months doesn't prove that sure. my knees are good uh, because people don't understand how, how tough this format is as well with the PFL. Yeah. It's, it's as good as it is. It's like, you know, fight camp, a couple of days off or a week off. You're back. Fight camp. Yeah, I've been on fight camps for like <laughs> forever. Um, so yeah, but obviously I'm happy with the PFL now. I've, I've, uh, I'm getting paid good per fight and I've got the chance to win a million dollars. Do you like the fact that it's, I mean, the, the, the fight with Anthony, the first one was I think June 24th. And so now here you are, early August. Not a lot of time for him to regroup. I feel I, from the outside looking, I feel like this this benefits you, right? Yeah. Get right back on there. He yeah, didn't. that's it. I think I think this benefits me more this time because I'm not even sure like why he ended up later because he was supposed to fight 
on PFL, like when I fought Martinez, he was supposed to fight the same right. night. I think he got hurt or something. And then right? yeah, I heard rumors that he was struggling with making weight, or maybe oh he was, my. or or maybe he was injured a little bit. Okay, but not too bad. Where I'm not sure what happened, but then he was fighting uh, two weeks later because he was fighting Miles Price. Yeah, and I was speaking to Miles Price, and he was not sure why they changed it either. Huh. Uh, we were speaking like through Instagram and. Um, and yeah, uh, so that got changed. And then because obviously he was then two weeks after us, um, when I fought him, uh, that was a week after the original other lightweights. Um, but yeah, maybe karma, I don't know. But uh, it's no work to... I would say it would, it's worked to better for me because he looked like he... Well, he was injured. I, right. I know he said he wasn't, but he was obviously a bit injured after that fight. He's down holding his yeah, ribs, yeah, yeah, and I know how brutal that submission is. So he'll know he'll know himself that for the first few weeks of this fight camp, he's probably have been sitting at home resting. You can't go straight in a sparring hard and taking body shots and grappling and wrestling when I've just done what I've done sure. to his rib. And he'll know that in his head. And obviously, I remember listening to an interview he said before that confidence comes from, you know, your work ethic and how hard you've trained. He's going to be battling some uh, stuff in his mind when he walks out on Friday, knowing that uh, he's not been able to do everything. Because he, he said, I think it was an old interview before, saying he's not held anything back like he was... Uh, for the last one, the first one that I fought. Right. Um, but even if, you know, even if he was, I beat him completely healthy and sure. where he felt at his best the first fight. You you so. listen to your opponent's interviews a lot? Uh, yeah, I like to hear what they're saying, yeah. You you gain insight uh, from this? Yeah, it's just like... To I peek mean, into their it mind. It matter, but yeah, right. but just to see what they're... You watch their footage a lot? Uh, yeah, I like to I like to go and kind of see what they're up to and, um, yeah... And yeah, he, he was awfully quiet the first few weeks of the fight camp, that's for sure. No really never really posted very much at all. Um Did you realise right away that you were gonna fight him again based on the seedings? Uh so I got told, yeah, I think I got told just before uh, the fight that if I won in the first round, um within a certain amount of time, I think it meant I fought Olivia. Okay. Um if if obviously I won by decision or or lost, I wouldn't be in the tournament. I had right. to stop him. Um, so it would have been a uh, Raush Manfia that that was fighting Pettis, I think. Yeah, there was a few different circumstances, but uh, yeah, I knew that it was going to be an immediate rematch. By the um, way, were you bummed at all? You know, they're going to Cardiff, they're going to London. I'm assuming you would have liked to fight closer to home, right? I mean, yeah. MSG is cool. You know, New York City is Pettis, but would you have preferred to be on one of those? Uh. Probably no, to be honest. I mean, really? Just because, like, whenever am I going to get a chance to fight in Madison Square Garden main event? Yeah. So, yeah, it would have been cool to fight on the London card for my fans. Um, like, a lot of people would have made it down. But, um, yeah, it's just so cool to fight in New York. Here, yeah. I know I'm going to be walking out and getting booed maybe again. And, you know, he'll because the last time I was a wee bit unexpected that because uh, I didn't think there would be much fans but he got quite a good cheer and I got maybe a few booze um, so yeah I'm expecting that again and uh, on Friday but well I'm looking uh, forward to it great to catch up with you uh, welcome back thank you for stopping by uh, that's I mean I, I feel like come December we're going to be talking about that finish as one of the subs of the year uh, there's a few in the running right now but I think you're at the very top of the list no doubt about it and I'm looking forward to seeing what you uh what you do on Friday, you're the favorite, the betting favorite going into this fight against Anthony Pettis. Yeah, Who would have thought, huh? Yeah, they're giving me some respect now. Imagine yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Two years out of the game, two and a half years out of the game, now you're getting some respect. That's that. Well done, Stevie. Thank you so thank much. You, I appreciate you coming in. Yep. All the best to you. Good luck, and uh, thank you for doing this before the weigh-ins as well. Thanks, buddy. All right, there he is, Stevie appreciate Ray, the, the pride of Scotland. Joe will walk you out right over there, so all the best. And uh, you can see yeah. Stevie uh, fight uh, Anthony Pettis this Friday on ESPN and ESPN+. Plus. Uh, from the Hulu Theater here in New York City, the MSG Hulu Theater. So that was a lot of fun. Oh, i got to put my headset on here. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you stopping by. PFL Invasion on the program. Uh, a lot of fun.
And uh, we appreciate them uh, checking us out here in studio. It's uh, it's a little different when you get the in-studio guests. And I had not talked. Stevie Ray had been on the program a lot in the past. Been a while since I spoke to him. Very happy for his success coming back. I know he was very frustrated about everything that was going on. Um, what is this I see in the chat? I, I shook... I shook uh, Pettis' hand. What are you guys talking about? People saying I didn't shake. Uh, I didn't shake Pettis' hand. Of course. I don't know what you guys are saying. All right. Well, thank you very much to uh, Peter Murray. Thank you very much to uh, Josh Silvera, Anthony Pettis, and the one and only... Stevie Ray for stopping by. A lot of fun to have them. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think I'll be there. Hopefully, if everything goes to plan, I think I'll be there on uh, Friday at the Hulu Theater. So my streak of uh, not going to an MMA event since March 2020. No real reason for that, by the way, but I've been to wrestling, of course. I've been to boxing. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to go to MMA. Of course, I was at an MMA event. It was back in July, International Fight Week. Um, a non-UFC is what I'm talking about. Uh, that might come to an end. Anyway, all right. Still a lot more to come. Uh, we got to answer your questions on the nose. Everyone's favorite shoot segment of the week. So stay tuned for that. We're going to answer your questions. A lot going on, of course. Earlier today, uh, broke the news about Michael Chandler and Dustin Poirier. Uh, close, likely, for Madison Square Garden uh, in, 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 in November, November 12th, uh, to be exact. Did I get that right about the November 12th? Let me see here. Yes. Um, we could talk about that. We could talk about, obviously, UFC event. We could talk about this past week, UFC 277. Some interesting thoughts from Josh Silvera about Amanda Nunes and his father, Conan Silvera, and they're split up. But uh, coming up next, it's the third official MMA Hour Parlay starring the great mysterious Frank and, of course, GC's picks for the weekend. Before we get to all of that, of course, got to tell you about our good friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. Get in on the hottest sports action for your shot at cold, hard cash with DraftKings Sportsbook. But in your favorite sports all summer long and gear up for football season. Right now, new customers can get a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. Just make your first bet. Up to $1,000 hairs. And if it doesn't hit, you'll get another shot at a big win. Feel the thrill of every sports season in a whole new way by betting on baseball, golf, MMA, and more. Of course, NFL coming up, college football coming up shortly thereafter, NHL shortly thereafter, NBA, a lot going on, boxing as well. That never ends. Plus, with same game parlay spreads, money lines over unders, and props, your betting options feel endless. Best of all, DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Deposit and withdraw cash whenever you want. So all you got to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THEMMAR. Very important because if you do that, they know we sent you and then they like us even more so. Make your first deposit, deposit get a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. That's promo code THEMMAR. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right. What do we got, gents? What do we got? Is everyone here? Is the gang all here? Um, mostly. No? I said mostly. Well, who's missing? GC? Take a, take, take a guess. I no, guess guess. I'm looking at Rick right now. He's here. What are we talking about? Why are you being such a hater? Rick, man. Was, we Jeez. haven't checked him in yet. I, I'm told that uh, New York Rick is here. New York Rick, GC in the house. Are they there? All right. What's, what's, Rick, are you there? I'm here. Uh, we're all Hello? accounted for. Oh, there they are. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello. Doing great. How are you? For some reason, wait. New York Rick, say hello. Hello. Frank, I feel like uh, the mic doesn't sound as good. What did you do to it? I, I know that you're doing this to mess with me. No, I swear. <laughs> we were trying to check him in when you were like, where's Rick? I didn't get a chance to... to oh, him in. do you need to... I, I, I'm no, sorry. it's all good. It's all do, good. Do you need to troubleshoot something? No, no. I think um, <laughs> we're quite all right. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. Do you understand what's going Jeez, on? Jeez, back to this we go. I don't know. I mean, uh, I didn't understand. That's a little rough, huh? 
How was the backstage with the guests? All good? Yeah. Yeah? Did you take pictures with anyone else? No. Okay. Josh Silvera was chilling. He was just right. hanging out. Snacking, yeah. Uh, your boy was here, Eric. Yeah. No, no, my two boys. Oh, I didn't realize. Diego and... Diego oh, that's and, that's uh, Diego Jeff. from the PFL. Uh, that's, he loves GC. That's PFL Social Diego. He loved, he, he's a big fan of the show. He's a big fan of he's all of us. He's always clipping yeah. off Diego's your the picks. With him. You can't drop him now. It's not me dropping him. It's, uh, but there's, if I, if I would say right now, present picture, if I would say right now, I like to keep things up to date, you know? All right. I mean, if you, if you really were watching, I mean, we switched from contender series to PFL, just like, oh. that. I mean, we stay up to date around these parts. Last night I was on uh, Twitter very briefly and I see everyone going, like, oh my God, this is the greatest. People are saying it's the greatest contender series card ever. Oh my gosh. Come on. Guys. Dana sent a message and that message was delivered. Yeah, what was the message? Uh, he wants finishes. If you're not Everybody watching. beat Joe Pfeiffer. Hey, I'm, it I'm was a good card. It was fun. I'm happy at least that he uh, corrected the record on poor Anthony Smith. I mean, said that he didn't break his ankle, then went back and said, oh, actually, uh, broke his ankle. Uh, no credit, though. I felt like I should have gotten some sort of credit, like, oh, as first reported by Ariel Hawani, something uh, like that. No? Uh, that's, uh, you know, status quo. All right, so we got the MMA Hour Parlay. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing a new wrinkle, guys. I just want to let you know. Mm, um, please. I, I have decided to make the executive decision that... Uh, Frank is going to get, at least for now, Emeritus, I believe it's called, maybe not, for the time being, until decided otherwise, we'll always get the first pick. And then between the three of us, yeah. So I pick four picks just, just for now. No, I, 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 think, I think you deserve a shot at, you, you guys don't like this. We, we narrowed it down to two, Frank. But uh, Wow, wait, you guys don't yeah, like this. Might it's the special treat. I hate this. Why? I hate this wrinkle. Why? If we're going to do it, let's do it. What, what do we need this? I feel like, like some training. I know, do we need to baby fine. him? Yeah, you can. should be offended, Frank. Oh, I was trying to be I, nice. Yeah, I don't want to. No, we're, this, is, this is not about nice. Okay. Let's just make some money. All right, I take it back. Frank, you're yeah, in the you're in the, kinda, you're in the draft. I was kind of happy that you did that. But, oh, really? I mean, a little bit. Why? Well, More pressure? Felt, I mean, yeah, There's a. I was talking to GC about this. Like, I'm not trying to come into here saying that, like, I have all these stats down. I know what I'm looking for with everybody. I was trying to help you out, man. This let's is give me him, agreeing we, with you. Let's give Wait, him did, one more. Did we, did we not Let's agree be. that like you could opt out if you're not feeling one, and then you could opt in? Yeah, if I was you trying are. to help him out. I was trying to you know increase. So his... I'd say, look, if you if you need to not be in one, don't be in one. All right, fine. But this this not being part of the draft thing, I mean, gee. Let's do the draft. All right, here we go. So Wait, again, the draft? we each pick. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, GC does it. We each pick a. You know, you know by now. We each pick a leg of the parlay. We're two and zero right now crushing it we've won you all a lot of money you're welcome and uh there's some there's some tasty picks here so without further ado wow tasty josh silvera picks. favorite how about that pretty large favorite yeah minus 180 oh on DraftKings, he's minus 205 i don't know what books you use but uh, i'm looking at DraftKings right now oh best fight odds uh you gotta you gotta go to DraftKings website sometimes best fight odds can be a little Post bit slow. slips bro uh here we go number one frank any sort of drum roll no, actually, you're not going to like this. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Should have taken the deal. Eric. Oh, nice. Okay. Followed, followed by Ariel, followed by Connor, and last but not least. Whatever, Frank, man. You should have taken the deal, Frank. Eric you should have taken head. the deal. Eric got in my head. Now. Uh, I'm nervous. Oh, oh my God. Maybe. Wh maybe. Wh what position did Frank have? L last. last one. Last, fourth. I'll fourth swap. Pick. I'll swap. Oh, I'll take, no. I'll take oh, wow. Yeah, he what, did. What, he you did you swapped last before. week, Ariel. You can't, uh, you can't but swap you just, it. You just, you just argued against it. Listen, we're trying to, we're trying to win here. Rick, Frank Rick must have something he likes. Rick right. must have something he likes. I got a few. Uh, I got a few I like, but I will, I will swap if, if uh, that'll make everybody feel one, better. One, one thing that I, I do want to present here is uh, DraftKings has not fully updated like the props. Like we can only get like inside the listen, distance. We got to deal with fights. Well, we, listen, get on the get on the horn with DraftKings and say it's time to show some love around here. Okay? I mean, it is crazy. I mean, I see them showing love to everyone else. I'm not going to say that I'm getting tired of it, but I'm starting to get tired of it. Okay, the lack of respect is getting to be a little much. Can I get a banner? I mean, can we get no. an MMA Hour banner? Can we no. get something? 
<laughs> no, it feels like we can't. We've, uh, uh, we've circled back now that we're two and oh. So yeah, hey guys, we're two and oh. No, I'm seriously. We're, we're, oh really? No, we we actually we actually did. <laughs> we said we're two and oh. Let's get some boosts. Let's get a banner over here. All right. I mean, to be honest, look, we gave them we gave them three to one on their money already at this point. Come on, like we're we're doing the dang thing here. All right, so Frank's first is official. Frank's first. Frank's first. Frank's I'll, first. Right. I'll take Rick the will be last. Ariel two. Yeah. Honor three. I'm ready. Oh, you know what? Um, I took that tension music out of here. Oh my yeah. god! Oh, I don't know. That's part of the draft, man. I know. On Monday, I was so like, dry. "Oh, that was so last week." And now, wait, I'm you got rid it. of it? Well, I could replace it. Give me something. Um, here's a drum roll. <laughs> Brian Battle, Pooh Bear himself. Can you, mm. Frank, you have what? to understand the art of entertainment, okay? You can't just be like, <laughs> Brian Battle. I mean, like, can you give us something with the first pick? I mean, there's... I mean it's like, it's so <laughs> underwhelming. I, I want to kick you out of this already. Oh, my God. I mean, it's that the most, so quickly. This is like, this is the, we're, we're, doing, we're doing entertainment here, Frank. This is one the number I couldn't one remember how long the show was for. in You're mixed so... martial arts and combat sports. I don't even know. All right, if, let's just do it again. Let's just do it. By again. the way, right now I close my eyes. If Brian Battle walked into my house and said, "Here's your pizza, nine ninety nine, I would say thank wow. you and goodbye. I mean, who's yeah, he fighting? Oh, that's going to be fighting for our know. money on Saturday, and this is how you treat him. I mean, Takashi Sato. Okay, also, cool. we're going. Uh, Brian Battle. Because you don't watch Tough though. He's uh, he's the yeah, tough winner. Right, he's right. he's look. We, we I've got a long history with Brian Battle because I watched all of that season. So I'm I'm a Pooh Bear fan. This so, yeah, is a tough don't fight. Have, don't have that. Don't have no, 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 no. This is not a tough fight. He won. No, no, he, a tough he won fight. already. Hmm. He won already. He won the year that uh, Casey won. Volko. Casey? Casey. Uh, Tercios. Uh, uh, Ricky. Ricky Tercios? Oh, Tercios. <laughs> 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 uh, Ricky didn't win. Um, did Ricky he? Did. Wait, did Ricky yeah, win? He did yes, win. he did. He did. Yeah, it was the. It, those were the two winners. Ricky and, and Brian. Okay, so give us... Can we get some insight here? Can yeah, we get so, the thought process... Right. Yeah. So he's moving down to welterweight, right? This is nice. I like this. Okay, okay yeah. <laughs> this is what I want. Okay, go ahead. Continue and then uh, Sato lost back to back two fights. Yeah. Know, and this is good. Pooh Bear is up, you know. And why is he called Pooh Bear? I, okay, I don't know that. You can't. Uh. You know, <laughs> just want to see how much you actually uh, researched. This guy. is the second pick. Or we'll this have is... the music. We'll, you know. Okay, so fun. your official pick is Money Line. Money Line. Brian Battle Brian. minus 255 against Takashi Sato plus 250 in Money Line. Exactly. That's your pick officially. Official pick. There's a lot of directions that I could go with the second pick. Do we have yeah, any man. music for that? You already, you already said what you were going to pick. Yes. I know this already. Oh. Do we have any music for this? Started that a little bit earlier. I haven't decided what I'm going to go with. Oh. I'm thinking of fading Sam Alvey. I don't like the minus 600. I'm going to go to the main event. I'm going to take Jamal Sweet Dream So. Jamal, mm. that, it, by the way, it was actually down to those two for me. Tough to put your money on Thiago Santos right now. Yeah. I'm not saying he's not going to win, but it's the way he's looked of late. Uh, tough to The bet. way he's looked and, and the way Jamal's looked. It's hard to bet against Jamal right now. Two people I mean, going in, in opposite directions. Yeah. Five rounds going to be yeah. tough to avoid that. Jamal, Jamal, Jalen Turner. There's some of these guys who are not quite like, you know, the established names yet, but just absolutely destroying folks. Jamal Hill is a, is a solid pick. I You teased it for me, GC. You And and I'm glad you took somebody who wasn't like a super huge favorite because you, you teed it up for me. I'm going with Michelle Olashekchek over oh, uh, Sam Alvey. Yeah. That, that, I, that's got to be it. <laughs> I can't blame you. I cannot blame you for taking that free-flowing striker, yeah. proven power. He's a stud going up against the guy that hasn't won since 2018, eight, eight straight. Uh, yeah, fights without. I'm mean, look. I pull up the rear and I got left I, a good one. So I, I feel like guys, I feel so like that. I feel like Sam Alvey is. I don't know. I'm gonna pull it off. H I feel like he's due. I, I don't know. Oh wow! I feel like this he's is due. a take of all takes. I feel like he's due. I, I will say, I said this on the, you know, the No Bets Barred podcast, yeah. available now, uh, wherever nice. you get your podcasts. I do sometimes feel like Sam Alvey gets overrated with how bad he is. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these losses yeah. are split decisions. It's not like he's going out there and just getting nuked in the first round every time. Uh, nope. I don't understand why he's still in the UFC. I will say that. Um, but uh, yeah, I I agree with your pick there. The, the thing about Sam Alvey... 
if if he's in a firefight, he can win those fights. If he's just in a in a fight with a guy who's going to stand there and slug with him, I think you're right. Like Sam Alvey is almost like underrated at this point in that type of fight. I don't think that that's the type of fight he's going to get this weekend, unfortunately for him. Um, but I agree with you. I think I think there's an edge on Alvey depending on the opponent. But this one, this one, this one's not the one in my uh, opinion. All right, so four picks: Brian Battle, Terrence McKinney, Jamal Hill, Oleksiy Chuck brings us to plus yep. one forty-seven. Oh, nice. Let's well, go. Where were we last week? Plus two hundred seven. Okay. This is a middle ground. We had minus one hundred one. We had plus two hundred seven, and now we have plus one forty-seven right in the middle. Try and keep it rolling. Throw another unit on it. Frank, you riding again? Oh, yeah. Um, no props this time. Unfortunately, I, yeah. I I mean, I guess I would have gotten... This is the first time no props, right? Yeah, I would have gotten it taken from from you. I, I, I love the fight doesn't go to the decision as a as a parlay piece for the McKinney fight. Mm. Ah. Yeah. Can't really envision that one going to a decision. Whatever. Just give me the dub. Hey, plus 147. As long as we win, man. We're in. All right, so there it is. Once again, uh, the picks are in. Frank with the the bold pick. It was very dramatic. We were all wondering where he would go. <laughs> he dropped Brian Battle on us. Uh, I, I went feel with like you're throwing some shade. No, I mean, it was just, uh, we're doing TV here, Frank, okay? I all mean, right, this though. isn't uh, lunchtime chatter, all right? <laughs> well, uh, listen, <laughs> it's the inverse of last week, how beautiful it was that uh, it finished with Frank now he gets to start the show. Brian Battle will be up first on the parlay. Wow. He feels like more pressure. <laughs> brings us into leg two, or he kills us right from the start. I, I love where Frank's lined himself up lately. This is, I mean, it's very smart. And I tried to give you, you know, the first pick, to, uh, the first pick emeritus. Uh, you turned it down boldly. Uh, Eric gives you then, you know, the, the swap. Which was probably the right way to do it. Like, if you want to throw me a bone, switch me out. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Now, what was the deal, though? Was it just a friendly swap, or was it like a, a, a no, pick to be... No, he told me he had to, be... to wash his car. Okay. Yeah. Pick to be... Yeah, I'll, I'll take some cash considerations later. All right. Very noble about you, this. Rick. Very noble. All right. Uh, good luck, guys. We'll recap good it all on Monday. Too. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, and now uh, we got your picks. And also on Monday, we forgot to do something, GCS. Yeah, I forgot to shout out some people, man. I asked for all these slips, and then I don't even shout them out. I mean, I mean, come what am on. I doing? Uh, so, yeah, let's. I, I don't have a ton of picks this week. It's a little bit of a lighter card. Uh, but, uh, yeah, let's shout some people out before I go through the picks real quick. Uh, we can we can go to my screen here and uh, and get going with it. The DraftKings this week, uh, not the best picture uh, DraftKings has ever had, uh, but 2002 bucks gets it done with a great lineup, wins about $160. Um, so congratulations to them. Now let's get into the bets themselves. Uh, the shout-outs, tough to decide who's going to be the big hitter this week. If you didn't make it, I'm sorry. I mean, a lot of different people to choose from, a lot of people cashing out. First up, we've got Jan Ju. Uh, he, sits, he hits a seven-leg parlay, plus 3,900, turns 10,000 into 391,190 plus a 97,964 bonus. I'm not saying any currency because I don't know if this is dollars or what. There's no, uh, there's nothing that tells you what currency it is. Uh, but yeah, shout out to him. Seven legs. That is uh, fantastic. Next up, one of my friends sent me this one. Jordan hits a five leg parlay plus 1500, gets real nasty with it. Brandon Moreno, Amanda Nunez from the UFC, he gets a little F1 in there, Max Verstappen. Throws it to the PGA Tour for Tony Finau. And then why not? Let's add a baseball play in and uh, let's take the New York Mets. I mean, this is peak degeneracy right here, uh, especially because he threw $739 on it. That feels like a empty the uh, account type play right there. I don't know why you would choose $739 uh, right there. He turns $739 into $11,968. Uh, I mean, that's... That's a good Sunday, if you ask me. I, I love how it carried over into the next day, a two-day bet. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this. Another insane one, uh, JJ Parlays. This is a, it was originally 14 legs, but a few of the fights got voided. 12-leg Parlay starts with Kayla Harrison. I mean, this thing goes way back. Andre Muniz, Israel Adesanya from 276, all the way through to this weekend, finishes off with Sosi, Amanda Nunez, Magomed Ankalaev, $303 into $22,929 plus $7,468. I mean, sitting on that for that long, it's crazy, isn't it, Frank? 
I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is crazy. All right, let's keep it rolling. I got two more. I got a few more to shout out. Uh, Svet MMA, uh, he turns 100. I think these are Bosnian marks. I, I, I threw up the old translation thing. I think this is Bosnian marks, but he takes Pantoja by sub, Pavlovich, round one or round two, Brandon Moreno knockout. Turns, I, I want to say these are Bosnian marks, 100 into 7,020. I mean, this is, this is an international segment here. Respect to you for knowing that the Bosnian currency is marks. Google. And uh, it's all based off of rundi, meaning round in Bosnian. Wow. How about that? Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I could have explained that to you. Had you, you found your voice back. We, we didn't hear from you for a second. I don't know what you're talking about. I was drinking. <laughs> uh, next up, free money Bix. Two parlays. Amanda Nunez, Pavlovich, Pantoja by finish, Moreno by finish, and then he goes Pantoja inside the distance, Moreno inside the distance again. Turns 550 Canadian dollars into 8,100 Canadian dollars. That is a great weekend. And then last but not least, he has been trying to get on big hitters for as long as I can remember. I told him he was going to do it. He finally made it. It's Ben Davis, Ben the Ben Davis, eight leg parlay plus fourteen hundred. We don't unit shame around here. He turns a dollar fifty into twenty three dollars. Uh, yeah, nails eight fights. So congratulations to him. Congratulations to everyone. Sorry that I forgot on Monday. Uh, the people definitely let me know that I that I forgot. But uh, shout out a lot of people having a lot of really good weeks uh, last week. But that was UFC two seventy seven. Is now time to to move forward, to push ahead. Let's go. To UFC Apex. Let's go. 59. Thank you. Thank you for calling it as yeah, it I've completely, I've completely left uh, Vegas in the dust. Let's I mean, go. You showed me the light. I'm Thank done you. with calling it Vegas. Uh, it is Apex. It's proper name. We'll start it out. First pick, Ariane Lipsky. I'm going to take her on the money line against Priscilla Cachuera. I really think unless Priscilla Cachuera knocks her out, she uh, is going to get beat by unanimous decision. I might be a little jaded from the GE on Kim fight. I thought Kim clearly won that. Uh, I mean, thoroughly outstruck her every single round. Uh, I think Lipsy's just going to be the more technical fighter in this one. Um, she can mix in the kicks. She can mix in the ground game like she did against Mandy Baum. We saw her do it a lot when she was still in KSW. Uh, I feel like she has a ground game that can exploit Cachuera having essentially no ground game at all. I think she just has more past the victory, whereas Cachuera wants to come in here, make this a brawl. Uh, and she just comes in here to get hit. I mean, if you look at her four losses and the Kim fight, which is a fight that I thought she lost, she's been outstruck 515 to 268. That means on average, she's getting outstruck 103 to 54. Uh, she really doesn't have a ground game, so she's getting outstruck in, in all of these fights. Like I said, she could catch Lipsky with something, but I think Lipsky's just going to come in here, play it safe, play it smart, outstrike her, maybe mix in the ground game and uh, find yourself a unanimous decision one. All right. Next up, I only got two singles this week. Wow. Yeah, keep it in light, man. It's a tough card, trying to keep it tight. Uh, don't want to get overexposed on a card like this. Sakai Spivak fight does not go to a decision. Uh, I mean, these are just two heavyweights that more often than not don't go to the scorecards. You're giving it to me at minus 155. Sakai, 70% over his career, don't go to decision. Spivak, 82%. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the records too, Sakai, six of his eight UFC fights have not gone to a decision. The two that did was against Andre Arlovsky and uh, Blagoy Ivanov, who are just decision machines in the heavyweight division. Kind of the same thing with Spivak too. I mean, Marcin Tibera, Carlos Philippe, Philippe, every fight he had in the UFC was a decision. I just think Sakai either keeps it on the feet, knocks out Spivak, or Spivak takes it to the ground. Rains down ground and pound or gets a submission win. I, I don't see this one seeing the scorecards. At this price for heavyweights, it was just something that I felt there was value in. Mm -hmm. uh, those are my singles, parlays. Would you look at that? Uh, a lot of the parlay pieces that we uh, that we have in the MMA Hour parlay, so I'm going to be doubling up. There you go. Uh, I love it. Piece. It's literally this, but add Brian Battle in. Um, so that is crazy. Not, hopefully I'm not getting a double loss here. Stop it. Yeah, I will stop it uh, because I bring uh, to the next one. Brian Battle is in my second parlay. There we so, go. So, uh, yeah. If the MMA Hour parlay loses, I will also be losing another bet. Wow. So, uh, yeah, you talk about not wanting to get overexposed, and here I am. 
Uh, yeah, kind of what Frank said with the Brian Battle thing. Moving down the welterweight, I think he's going to have a huge size advantage. Four inches of reach, three inches of height over Takashi Sato. He can mix in the ground game. I mean, we saw him just get dominated on the ground by Gunnar Nelson. I know he didn't get submitted, but, I mean, by not getting submitted, he got thoroughly beat 30-26 across all the scorecards. Um, I think Battle's a better striker. He may not have the more power uh, in his hands, but I think technically he is better, and he can mix in that ground game. I think he does find a victory. Uh, and Spivak, I do think he gets that to the ground and gets the finish on Sakai. And then last but not least, Wit Quinlan. Fight doesn't go to a decision. Parlayed with McKinney Gonzalez doesn't go to a decision. The Wit Quinlan won. I mean, how does Wit lose? By knockout. How does Quinlan win? By knockout. I, I don't see that one going to the scorecards in the McKinney Gonzalez. I mean, McKinney, he's he's seen the third round one time in his entire career. He he fights at a frantic pace, is able to get knockouts, is able to get submissions. Uh, so I don't see that one going to the scorecards. Deeper breakdown, you know where to find it. No bets barred. Anywhere you get your podcast. Is it out yet? Oh, it's out. It's out. Right now. You can search it up. No bets barred. It'll be on the MMA fighting feed. You can find it there. New logo? Nope. That's why I uh, didn't put it up. Yeah. Oh, come on. Still What's taking so here? long? What's taking so long? With I always thing? forget until right now. Oh. Um, all right. So there you have it. And there nothing it on the PFL, huh? Oh, I do have PFL pages. Yeah. I just didn't make gra- graphics. As I mentioned earlier, Anthony Pettis plus 105. And then I did a parlay with uh, OAM, Marcelo Nunez, trying to remember this off the top of my head, and Rob Wilkinson. That pays out at like plus 154. Only threw a half unit on each. PFL can be very dangerous betting. Yes. But uh, rumor has it we might be in attendance, so uh, I had to get some action down. How about, uh, I mean, how about the fact that Josh Silvera is a favorite against Ahmedov, who has like 30 more fights than him uh, and is his teammate? Yeah. Pretty amazing. I wasn't expecting that, but he is a big time, I mean. Yeah, 9 and 0. He's a beast. Yeah. Um, all right. So, them's the picks. Congratulations to all who will eventually win because of all these picks that you made. I mean, it's an early congratulations. Wow, we appreciate wow, you guys. Putting a hex on me. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, I feel like we're rolling right now. We're rolling. I mean, James Krause knows about you. Anthony Pettis knows about you. Did you start your Discord yet? No. No? No, we're still working on that. Did you, th- did you check out his? No, but a few people hit me up and they were like, well, I'm in it. It's great. You know, it's nice to, to discuss fights. James Krause, by the way, killing the social media game. Oh, man. It's very, like, slick edit. I need to get someone like that. If Uh, anyone out there wants to do my social media, I'd I'd be happy to pay you. Did you see the post of uh, the retirement announcement? Yeah. It was great. had my thing, his thing. I was was like, wow, James Krause just killing it. Uh, How about retroactively after we talked about Pettis, me betting on Pettis on, on the show... Uh, oh no! I forgot Stevie Ray. Was he was there in the green room watching. Oh my god! I yeah, forgot. So I got a little nervous. I, I faked like I was doing a really busy on my computer when he was. Getting oh man! Like, hey, I should have brought that up. No, I'm glad you didn't. Oh he's my! He's pretty intimidating. Dude. He's intense, dude. Accent. Right? He's intense. He's like intense. looking at you like. That's what I, I was scared to look over. That he was just going to be staring right through my soul. Um, also, like sneaky big in in terms of like if you look at him, you would think maybe a featherweight, you know, but lightweight. Yeah. He's fought some yeah. tough guys. I mean, fought a who's who back in the day. For sure. Uh, Michael Johnson, Cajun Johnson, Paul Felder, Joe Lozon, Ross Pearson. Uh, the man has been around. Kurt Warburton Warbord- uh, three times has been around the block. So uh, looking forward to his return. And that is this Friday. Time now, though, for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time... It's time for a good yes. old-fashioned Q&A, MMA fans. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, some question. the Let moment me put has these, uh, to hear from the man himself, here. Ariel Moderator Hawaii. Lewis. Live from the box All right. in beautiful oh. New York City. It's, it's been a busy day, busy note. week. And now, to More to answer come. your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet because Thank you, yes. here he is, Ariel Helwani. Thank you very much, Mike Heck. Time to answer your questions. Of course, you left them all for me. Ariel Helwani does subsec.com everyone's favorite segment of the week where we tell it like it is, where we shoot from the hip, where we keep it real. A lot of people go here first, you know, they want the real stuff. They want the real, real. They want all of that. I mean, this is the opposite of when people do like the tweet and then the second tweet first reported by it. This is like the opposite of that. That's the unreal. This is the real, you get what I'm saying? 
You know, you ever see people do that? They're like, da 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 And then it's the second tweet. When there was definitely 240 characters, and then they do it on the second tweet. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Any? Yeah. That's called whackness. Uh, Brad Tyson leads us off. Hello, Ariel. There's talk of Davison Figueredo potentially not making 125 again. Is there? I mean, I feel like we addressed this. Why do you think that there has been no suggestion of a potential champ versus champ matchup at 135 like there has been with Volkanovski at 55? Also, what are your thoughts on a potential matchup with Figueredo versus Sterling slash TJ? Must say, I'm loving the MMA Hour multi and the banter between all of you guys at the top of the show. It's hilarious. Thank you. I enjoy it as well. In Australia, we have an age-old saying, surround yourself with goers and you too shall go. It's clear you have done this with the great team assembled on the MAR. Keep up the great work, guys. Wow, how nice is that, guys? It's a nice message from Brad. Nice Arm, thing man. I've heard today. Makes yeah. my dad. Uh, in any event, yeah, there's no real talk of. I, I want to see Davison go back down to 25. I want to see the conclusion of that feud. I want to see the fourth fight. Sterling's got a lot going on at 35. I just don't know if Figueredo's at the point now where people will be clamoring for him to fight. I think because he hasn't defended it as many times as Folk did at 145. Um, I think people want to see a resolution to this feud, rivalry, whatever you want to call it. I don't think there's anyone really clamoring for him to fight at uh, at 35 against Sterling or TJ. So that's why. Yes, he looks big. Yes, he told me 35. No, I don't believe him at the moment. He said he weighs 35, 135. Um, I think the biggest fight for both those guys is fighting themselves for a fourth time. And I don't think there's as much, even though he's the 25 champ going up to 35, I don't think there's as much of a demand. Um, so I think it would be in his best interest to try to cut that weight at least one more time, settle this with Moreno, and then deal with whatever comes next. Uh, Jan P. Ariel, is it actually possible to do side-by-side -side interviews with two fighters on the show? I think you mentioned how Figgy thought he was doing the interview alongside Brandon Moreno, and that made me wonder why something like that has actually never been done. Uh, it has been done. Um, I feel like those can be super fun, especially with the right fighters, i.e. Figgy Moreno, but I'd also imagine there would be a ton of logistical hurdles involved. Do you have your own reasons or has such a thing never actually crossed your mind? Thanks. And then someone else asked, why have you stopped doing the, we have our opponent on the other line routine? I mean, that question alone is part of the reason why I stopped doing it. It was never a routine. It was uh, the way the show was booked and sometimes it worked out where we had the other person on the line. I've done it before. I did it with Connor. Uh, and Cole Miller, we the most uh, famous one probably, and the earliest one was Ronda and Misha. They both knew about it, and Misha was the champ, and Ronda actually, believe it or not, was the one who convinced me to do it, uh, where Ronda was trying to get the title shot against Misha. This was late 2011, and we had them both on at the same time. Always pissed me off. I think we initially misspelled Ronda's name on the graphic. This was back in the AOL days. Uh, we've done it before. And we actually have the capability to do it now with the two Zoom um, screens. And I think there has been talk of doing it with MVP and Mike Perry before their uh, bare knuckle fight in a couple of weeks. I don't know. I just, I, I kind of like the the one-on-ones. It's hard to do it virtually or via the phone. Obviously, we've talked about Stotts and Sabatello in studio, perhaps. Maybe, I don't know, either side of the desk would have to block this off a little bit differently. But, you know, it was always funny to me earlier in my career when people would say things like, oh, you're instigating fight. And now you get asked, you know, why don't you do it? Because the fans always loved it. The fans always wanted to do it. They were they were almost like, I don't know, unaware or uninformed as to what our job was. And that was to ask fighters questions and not ask them about like how their training camp went or what they ate for dinner, or how they're going to celebrate their wins. And so I always was confused by that. Like, isn't that, like, we're about to watch two guys punch each other. Like, don't you want to know, you know, what the issue is here, how they're feeling, things of that nature. But, you know, people say stupid things. Anyway, if you'd like it to do it again, I could do it again. I could bring it back. It just hasn't really worked out that way. We, I think we did it also at ESPN a couple times. Brantley. Hey, Ariel, this didn't make the cut last week, so trying again. Going back in time a bit here. One of your most famous interviews was with Dana White at his office to announce the sale of Strike Force. As a longtime MMA fan, this still stands out as one of the biggest moments I can remember. Can you give us some behind the scenes details of the day of this day and the interview? I know interviews with Dana were fairly regular back then, but were you given any heads up? 
Do you have any inside information that Strikeforce may be getting sold beforehand? Walk us through what that day was like. Thanks and have a great Wednesday. Uh, yeah, cr that's a crazy day. And uh, the great Lewis has included a, uh, a screen grab of that day, of that interview. Um, this is March of 2011. Early March of 2011, I'm in... Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, KFC Yum Center. It's Martin Catman against Diego Sanchez. And I was working for Versus and I was doing their pre and post fight shows. And I remember uh, we were supposed to interview Dana White. You know, this was back when our relationship was great um, for the pre show. And I remember, I think we were going to do the interview on the Friday. We were either going to do the interview on the Friday or the Saturday. I think the fight might actually have been on a Sunday. Or it could have been on a Wednesday. I don't know. My memory's all weird. I have another funny story about that KFC Yum Center event. Anyway, the day of the interview, uh, he told me that he was sick and that he couldn't do the interview and that he had to cancel, which was very rare because he never canceled. And he told me that he would make it up to me and that we would do an interview within the next week. And I was like, all right, cool. And I was like, where are we doing it? Like, where do you want to do this? How are we doing this? What are we doing? He said, I'll tell you later. So, all right. Uh, a day or two later, he said, you remember that interview that I said I would, you know, do with you to make up for having to cancel the, the pre-fight interview? Uh, we're going to do it, if you want it, on Thursday of this coming week. And I said, cool. What are we talking about? Like, what, why do you want to do this now? He said, I can't tell you, but if you want the interview, I suggest coming to um, Vegas. Now, so I didn't know what was going on. And... I remember talking to, you know, the people that I was working with. And I think one of the jokes was like, is he going to announce a new toy line, a new video game, this or that. And I believed that if he's saying, Hey, you got to come here. It's a big deal. You know, it's a big deal. It's worth the shot. So I got on a plane JFK to Las Vegas without knowing what we were going to talk about, what the big interview was, what he wanted to share. And I remember uh, going into the room and I was there with Casey and Esther and I remember going to Zufa HQ and I remember going into his office and I remember him closing the door and saying, we just bought Strikeforce. And you have to remember at the time, Strikeforce was on fire. They had the heavyweight Grand Prix. Uh, they were doing big numbers on Showtime. Uh, they just had the event at the, uh, the Meadowlands in New Jersey. They had another event in Columbus. And there was no talk, no whispers, no scuttlebutt, no rumors, no nothing of them selling, let alone to Zufa. And I mean, there was, you know, they were owned by the owners of the San Jose Sharks, HP Pavilion. Uh, and it seemed like, you know, they were getting big names, free agents. They had Dick Diaz and Alistair Overeem and Daniel Cormier and Luke Rockhold, and they were rolling. They were absolutely rolling. And so I was like, what, that's this, I mean, no one saw this coming, this is crazy. So I obviously didn't prep anything. We did the interview and I just had to think of all the questions. And of course, you know, a lot of it was fresh, a lot of it was new. And the, the line that he kept repeating over and over again was business as usual. I remember there was that uh, really catastrophic uh, tsunami that hit Japan that day as well. This is in my, uh, my memory bank. Like it was just like a somewhat, you know, newsworthy, noteworthy, chaotic day. And I remember just thinking like, wow, I can't, I can't believe this and I can't wait to share. I mean, this is a massive, massive deal. Uh, a few months prior, we had done an interview about merging WEC and UFC, uh, which was big, but this was obviously seismic. It was gigantic. I mean, no one really knew about it. The fighters didn't know about it. Uh, the vast majority of the strike force employees didn't know about it. Like it really came out of left field. So it was a really big deal. And those are, you know, the moments uh, and the interviews that I'll always be grateful and thankful for. And, um, you know, things obviously have changed over times, but those are, those are big turning points. Those are big moments. Those are big, uh, you know, bookmarks, earmarks, whatever you want to call them in the career. Uh, I remember, I think I've told this before, like I remember seeing Scott at the, uh, the Meadowlands event and he was standing at the back 
like at the tunnel where the fighters walked out, he was wearing a long trench coat and usually Scott is, you know, sitting cage side. I remember him looking at the whole thing and, and admiring the arena it was close to a sellout. Fedor was on the card. A lot of big names were on the card. And I remember just watching him and being like, I wonder why he's standing here and looking at everything. And then I came to find out that at that point he knew that the end was near and that it would never be the same. And I think he was just taking it all in. That's a, an, an image that I'll never forget as well. I'll also never forget that Louisville card because that was the card right before that event. I went to Albuquerque to interview John Jones at the Jackson Wink Gym. And this was several, um, this was several weeks before the Shogun fight in Newark, which was March 19th or something like that. Um, March, March 20th, I don't know, some, sometime in March. I'm, I'm now, you know, forgetting the days, but sometime in March of that exact year. And, you know, he gets this title fight against uh, Shogun after Rashad gets injured. He just beat Ryan Bader. Super Bowl weekend, Joe Rogan in the cage tells him you're going to get a title shot as a result. He's emotional. We talked to him backstage. Rashad is injured and everyone's like, whoa, wait a second. They're friends. Rashad's his mentor. What happens if he wins this fight? What's going to happen to the title? And I remember going to Albuquerque to interview John Jones. We did it in the cage. And I asked him, if you win, will you fight Rashad? And he said, yes. And that was a big deal because up until that point, they always said that they wouldn't fight each other. And so that was huge. We do the interview. And as these things usually go, it's not like here where we just play the whole interview. It's live. They'll take these interviews and cut them down to five minutes. And I remember having dinner the night before the show. I think Molly Karam, who uh, hosts First Take, was the host of the pre and post show coverage that I was a part of. And I remember talking to the producer and saying, like, what made the, the you know, the, the, the condensed interview with John Jones, like what made the final cut? And I remember him telling me everything. I was like, wait a second, did the Rashad part not make the cut? And they're like, no, we didn't really see how it fit. I was like, that's gigantic news. That is, you know, seismic news. Uh, so then we aired the thing. It was too late to add it. We aired it. Then I came back on camera and then I set it up and then we threw to that clip. And that's really what set off the, uh, the issue between them. And then I interviewed Rashad after the um, the John Jones win against Shogun in Newark in the in the crowd when they let us do that back in the day. And he was also very upset afterwards. And that's when everything really popped off and they fought the following year, UFC 145. So anyway, crazy to look at this picture here with Dana. That was a, a long time ago, 11 plus years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, regardless of what has happened since, and obviously... Uh, it has not been great and it's been, you know, at times inappropriate. It's been at times crossing the line. It's been at times uncomfortable, um, unprofessional, all those things that you want to say. And then some, and, and y'all don't even know everything. One day I'll tell you everything. Uh, I'm still grateful and, and appreciative of these moments and look back on them with fondness. El Cubano. Hola, Ariel. Assume the main event between Tiago Santos and Jamal Hill ends in a knockout this Saturday and you had to play matchmaker immediately after the fight. Who do you see the winner fighting next if they win in an impressive fashion? With all the questions in the light heavyweight division, I'm curious as to how it will all play out in your opinion. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, if they're going to go with Yuri and Glover next, I think they should then do Jan and Magomed. Rakic is out. Smith is the next guy. He's going to be out for a while, needs the surgery. Then you got Tiago Santos, who then would, you know, if let's say he loses to Jamal Hill, which I think Jamal is going to win that fight. How about Volkan Ozdemir? I feel like that's the one. Jamal Hill, Volkan Ozdemir. Now, Dominic Reyes is on the comeback trail, and he's still ranked. He's still highly ranked, number seven, but... So it might be a tough fight to come back to, but to me, it would be Ozdemir or Reyes. Those are the fights. Uh, Man Diago, Dianjo. Uh, Good day, Ariel. Your discussion last week about Vince departing the WWE and the potential impact had me thinking. Although he has taken a major step back and is fairly removed from the day-to-day, -day, what kind of changes would you predict for the UFC if Dana were to retire or move on? My follow-up question is, what impact would it have on your relationship with the UFC extending to petty little things such as your tweets not being shown on the telecast? Cheers from Melbourne, Australia. First, let me just say, 
as a postscript to the Vince stuff, two things. Number one, obviously I was in Nashville last week getting a chance to talk to a lot of people taking the temperature. The, um, the morale and the positivity surrounding the product right now is very high. So that's really interesting. Let's see what happens. Uh, it seems like everyone loves Triple H and Stephanie. So I'm curious to see what happens there. Um, SummerSlam was a good event. Logan Paul, McAfee, main event was good. WWE, wrestling fans, wrestling Twitter, whatever you want to call them, they're a very funny bunch. I saw them like say that I glossed over the Vince. Like I have said multiple times that I thought the product was stale, that I wasn't watching the product, that Vince was out of touch. Like I don't think I could have said anything more, I don't know, negative, but they then assume to like, they, 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 they just kind of like assume like I'm not saying that or, or pretend like I'm not saying that. And then they're like, Oh, Ariel's out doing, you know, interviews with the wrestlers in character. They're not in character. N none of them are in character. And also his friend and former agent is Nick Khan. I literally say that every time I speak about this, I, 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 I throw out that qualifier I've said that I love watching AEW and Dynamite and I enjoy watching it, especially on Wednesdays, um, MJF, all the stuff that they've been doing. Like, it's amazing how people could just make up whatever they want, sort of like my friend with his emails last week, make up whatever they want just to make up some kind of story because they've got this preconceived notions or this self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but I have always kept it real, kept it 100. Even when I did the interview with Nick last year, the first thing I said to him was, yeah, you were my agent back then. I didn't know this would play out like this. Um, I would just say like, you you guys are looking for something that just isn't there. You're making shit up that just isn't there. And I feel like I kept it pretty damn honest in terms of what I think of the product and what I think of the product moving forward now that Vince is gone. What, what happened is uh, something that is ongoing and has just been uncovered. And I said, go check out the Wall Street Journal because they've done way more reporting on this than I have and know way more about it. But I think this is a net positive for the company. How could you argue against that? I mean, a 77 year old man shouldn't be booking for the younger generation. Now, how this pertains to a Dana White situation, I think is not apples to apples. You have to remember the UFC isn't pro wrestling. So the head of creative leaving is a massive deal. This is the guy who's writing the shows, putting together, you know, the actual direction of the company. UFC, it's matchmakers, but then up until that point, like the ship kind of steers itself. And as I've told you guys, Hunter Campbell is the guy who's really doing a lot of that heavy lifting. McMaynard, Sean Shelby are doing a lot of that matchmaking and signing. Dana isn't doing a lot of that. Um, so I think positive or negative, Vince leaving WWE is a gr of greater impact to WWE than Dana leaving UFC because Vince was literally writing the shows. Like obviously not just him, but he's head of creative. He's putting together the, the shows. There's a bunch of people working there, but the direction, all that, his fingerprints were everywhere, everywhere. Hiring, firing, it's a lot different in UFC. I, I, I think you're fooling yourself if you think otherwise. If you think Dana leaving UFC, right now UFC runs itself. Now, they'll lose the figurehead, they'll lose that face, they'll lose that guy at the podium, but honestly, how much is he, I mean, he's doing his media days from his office these days. Um, you know, he'll jump on McAfee's show, he'll jump on with this guy, with that guy. Uh, it's generally same old, same old. And I'm not, I'm not throwing shade here. This is like him talking about Cyborg yesterday. I saw that clip on Jedi's feed. I'm not throwing shade here, but them's the truth. Like what, 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 like what, what else is he doing other than showing up at a press conference here or there? Uh, every fighter that you talk to, the vast majority of them say, no, we don't deal with him. We deal with Hunter. We deal with Sean. We deal with Mick. Um, so I think Vince leaving is a bigger impact. I think it's a greater impact for the company. And Dana leaving is kind of like a net zero. The biggest loss will be you lose that face, that guy who did. And by the way, there's a great value in that. A guy who could go out, do the interviews as I was talking with Peter. There's great value in that. But in terms of behind the scenes, the company, the growth, the matchmaking, it's not the impact that you think it is. As for um, the follow-up, my relationship, I don't know. It would be impossible for me to guess. I've told the story of when Hunter was hired. He texted me and said, you know, big fan, you know, let's catch up, love what you do, blah, blah, blah. And then I never heard back from him again. So maybe, you know, things would change or maybe enough time has passed since then where, you know, things won't change. I don't know. 
I don't lose sleep over it. Everything's good. I'm happy. They're happy. We're all happy. God bless. We can all live harmoniously. The whole thing is dumb. The whole thing is crazy. I don't even know how we got to this point. Um, there is a little revisionist history because people think that for some reason they forget that I was going to events when I was working for ESPN. And even after those two days in 2016, I feel like people actually think I haven't been to an event since 2016, which is very weird to me. But alas, that is not the case. Uh, Adrianu, hi, Ariel. Sorry to hear that you won't be able to showcase how a real press conference should be conducted again this week. Thank you. Question is in relation to the main event and co-main event post-fight interviews. I know you have spoke about this on, on Monday, about the lost opportunity of Moreno and Figgy in their face-off. I feel like Amanda Nunes also missed a great opportunity of calling out Kayla Harrison. Not really. She's not under contract with them. What's she going to call her out? Create the narrative that she rejected joining UFC because she was scared of her. That's something you do in the post-fight interview uh, post-fight press conference, not the post-fight interview. You just want a huge fight. You just got your belt back. You just avenge your loss. I think that would have fallen flat. Do you think this was a missed opportunity? No. That wasn't about calling people out. Valentina is the next big fight for her, not Kayla. Um, I feel like we're just looking at rematches as an easy option because the other divisions aren't moving quick enough. And then Matt Mo said, what's poppin' Lord Ariel? Did Amanda Nunes regaining the title move the needle at all towards a possible Kayla Harrison matchup? Maybe it increases their interest, but I don't I don't see that. I mean, I think that going to be interesting to see what happens with Cyborg and going to be interesting to see if PFL makes a push there. Kayla's making so much money with the PFL, and I know that she you know, wanted to sign that Bellator deal because they were matching, but I think you guys are looking into this. Maybe in a year or two down the line, but it's not next. As far as when she would be free, it's in a little less than two years. I think it's like 18 months or something like that. David. Hi, Ariel. The more I thought about the cancellation of the Jake Paul pay-per-view, it seems that nobody's talking about the seismic ramifications from a financial perspective. Jake's last fight didn't do well as far as pay-per-view buys, obviously. Yes, but it didn't do as bad as people are saying it did. Like it did, it, it, people say 85, the the... The real number is under 500, but it's still in the three digits and it's over 200. Um, I know one is nothing to do with the other, but think of how the UFC bounced back after 151 got canceled. They threw John Jones a bone, if you will, and placed him on 52. So my question to you is, do you think Jake Paul and company can overcome this seismic loss or will this boxing experiment be looked at as a disaster? It, it's weird to me because even Dana was talking about it. He needs like some other people around him. And I talked about this on Monday. <laughs> with Nikisa, right? Like Nikisa, his business partner, who Dana's taking a shot at because he's the former CFO and chief strategy officer of the UFC. And Dana doesn't like the fact that someone who was in on the inside is daring to challenge them. And as New York Rick pointed out, um, you know, they have poked the bear, so he's allowed to feel a certain way, no doubt about it. But MVP is not the UFC. MVP has three fighters under roster. Um, Jake Paul, Ashton Silve, and Amanda Serrano. All three of them were fighting. And, you know, they're partners with Showtime on these events. So, yes, they are going to lose money, no doubt about that, because they're going to have to pay for fighters um, some were already in. There's the MSG component and all this stuff. But it's not like this thing is, you know, it's not like the ship is going to sink. The Haseem Rahman stuff is super weird. I was actually talking to him yesterday. He's telling me, that he's going to weigh in on Friday. Shades of Tony Ferguson prior to 249. He is going to want to prove that he could have made 205 come hell or high water. And I think the issue was the fight was supposed to be at 200. Then they pushed it to 205. Then there was some issues about 205. And I think once there was some doubt that this would be done in a healthy way, they felt like they needed to wash their hands. Right or wrong, that's the you know, story that I'm getting. Now, you could say, was it a mistake to even go down this path to begin with? Yeah, potentially. The guy never fought under 220. Huge question marks surrounding his ability to make that way. We talked to him about this on the show. Obviously, the best scenario would have been Tommy Fury. But I believe right now, Jake Paul cannot go back to this well. There is There are only two fights right now for Jake Paul. There are only two fights that he and his team need to focus on right now. Nathan Diaz 
Anderson Silva. And I would probably put Silva first because Silva's the guy who can fight in October. Diaz is going to have to wait for the whole process to play out. These other guys just can't be trusted right now. The Fury situation, for you know whatever reasons, has fallen through twice. You can't go back to that well. If they announce right now that he is fighting Tommy Fury, people are going to roll their eyes. Uh, if they announce right now that he's going to fight Hasim Rahman in September, people are going to roll their eyes. Anderson Silva is reliable. He will show up. Diaz is reliable. He will show up. You reignite the... Why do I keep hitting the damn microphone today? You you, you reignite the, the, the feud with MMA. They are commodities. They are box office. Those are the directions. There's only two directions. Um, he tried to go the boxing route. It fell through. You got to go back to, to Silva and Diaz. It does feel like a waste of a summer, a waste of a nine-month period. They got things done in April with Serrano. That was a huge deal for him. Um, but I don't, I don't view this as, you know, MSG might say, hey, you know, that's now two fights that have fallen through. But this isn't the disaster, I think, that people are saying it is. And, and again, it's not great, but it's not like the MVP ship is going to sink as a result of this. Uh, people could say, oh, he should have just fought him at 215. Why? So much to lose. So much more to lose taking that risk, in my opinion. Because you have the Diaz fight on the horizon, because you have the Anderson fight on the horizon, and maybe because you have the... Con if he gets brutally knocked out by Rahman, as we discussed on this show, why I thought there was more pressure on him than Diaz going into Hamzad, all that goes down the hill, down the drain. You can't compare UFC, UFC 151 at that point, UFC 151, the company was like 20 years old to this. This is a, a boxing promotion with three fighters on the roster. Not the same. Not great. I'm not going to say it's a great day at all, but it's not the same. And by the way, 151 didn't tank the company either. They bounced back and they've canceled events since then too. 51, 76, the, the, the January 2019 event at uh, Anaheim, whatever number that was, in Anaheim. Um, they couldn't find a main event for that. Like Events get canceled. It happens. Big money. Ariel, I find it fascinating that top-level UFC fighters are often left with nothing more than a hollowed-out hotel room for pre-fight training, sparring, and weight cutting. It's not really a hotel room. It's like a little bit... It's like a conference room depending on where they are, but it's not a hotel room. COVID days hotel room, but now it's like it's always been like a conference room. Certainly athletes of this caliber deserve higher level facilities, but I do get a kick out of seeing the teams adapt to this awkward environment. Groups gather together in a 12 by 12 space, punching, kicking each other while avoiding pending, pendant lights and kitchenettes in and out of a one person sit. Yeah, my question is, have you ever heard of these rooms getting damaged and or fighting, fighters getting injured due to the confined spaces? I mean, fighters have gotten injured, but I mean, there's the famous uh, Ken Shamrock one, but a lot of people don't believe that he was actually injured. They thought it was self-inflicted. Listen, you can complain about that. To me, what about the fact that they don't get like nice hotel rooms? What about the fact that they, uh, more often than not, are flying coach to and from these events? That's just as egregious, if you ask me. What about the fact that they have to pay for extra hotel rooms if they're bringing training partners and whatnot? That's, that's just as egregious, if not more egregious. Nim. Hey, Ariel. New York Rick's birthday montage video by No Context Ariel got me reflecting on some of the great people that have been on your career journey, journey, journey excuse me, namely TST, GC, Mysterious Frank, and New York Rick. How about that? He included you, Frank. Super exciting. What is your most memorable slash proud moments in their respective MMA and MMA media journeys? One each for New York Rick, TST, GC, MF. Cheers, mate. Have a good rest of the week, Nim. Wow. It's going to make me uh, say all these nice things. For me, uh, for New York Rick, I mean, there's a lot. It's been a long journey, 10 plus years at this point. The stuff that we did uh, in the first iteration of the show was huge. Uh, I always said, you know, the the loyal. I'm I'm a big loyalty guy. Um, I'm a big, you know, I have your back, you have my back guy through thick and thin. Um, the fact that he left with me to go and work on the ESPN show before even having a deal of any kind or any kind of guarantee or any kind of word or any kind of promise or any kind of anything was huge for me. Being there for the first show was huge for me. I was very nervous that day. 
And then the fact that, you know, he got the the digital, the social gig, the ESPN MMA gig without ever really having a background in any of this and didn't just take the baton and ran with it, freaking crushed it, killed it, became the 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 bell of the ball. By the time I left ESPN, New York Rick, way more liked there than I was. Um, cause there were no sort of like, you know, drama surrounding him, baggage surrounding whatever. Um, so I was very proud of that. Like, you know, that could have not gone that way. And he made sure that it was going to go a certain way and worked his ass off. And there was a period he was driving from his home to Bristol every day, back and forth, two hours, back and forth, back and forth, just to make sure that that was going to be a success. And of course he had, um, a fine young woman named Tessa Hirsch by his side, uh, they were a great tandem, but I was very proud of that for him. Um, and now great to have him back here crushing it on the social side of things and great to have him back on the show. For TST, I mean, I met TST when he didn't even know what MMA stood for, UFC stood for. And now the guy is like going to more UFC events and MMA events than I have in the last month. He's been to more MMA and slash UFC events than Dana White has this past month, for goodness sakes. Um, but he left ESPN with a dream of having more freedom and being more independent. And now he's absolutely crushing it. So uh, very proud of him for that. Uh, GC, you know, we met GC when, uh, you know, we were looking for the new producer of the show. And with the help of Corporate Alex and Brian, we were doing a bunch of interviews with people and sifting through applications over the summer around this time last year. And no one, no one fit. It didn't really work. I wasn't feeling the vibes. It just, it wasn't that. And big shoes to fill, of course, with New York Rick. And uh, then I remember TST telling me, you know, this guy that, you know, we did a couple of stuff on ESPN radio together was, you know, potentially interested. And it was perfect. Into the gambling stuff, big sports fan, seemed like a normal guy, seemed personal, seemed hardworking, was ready to move, was ready to switch it up. And I think about that all the time because there was one guy that we were close to hiring and I just wasn't feeling it. And thank God TST emailed me when he did because I think everything would have been very different. I mean, GC would be working on game night right now. You'd be getting ready for, uh, you know, uh, a fun. No, you think you would have been I had gone? a few prospects. Wow, okay. You weren't the only people. I wow. Who are you talking to? NPR. Well, that's not bad. And a uh, college basketball outlet as well. Let's go. Let me tell you something. Uh, if you would have gone to UFC Long Island, no one would have noted who you were <laughs> if you were working with uh, uh, NPR. Wouldn't have gone to UFC Long yeah. Island one. Do you think you uh, would have even like, I mean, think about how like sliding doors, right? Yeah. Different life. I mean, completely different life. LFA. Nope. Wouldn't have happened. PFL. I wouldn't even have known that LFA was taking place in Phoenix that weekend. That's right. Amazing. Uh, so I'm very thankful for that. And now you talk about the proud stuff. It's like now he's become, you know, the biggest baby face in the game, crushing it, own podcast, social media. What are we at? Like 12,000 now probably followers. I mean, just killing it, um, exceeding expectations. I don't think anyone thought that GC was as talented as he is. I think I think most of us just thought like you were an audio guy, to be honest. I knew he would do it. You knew? Oh yeah. All right. TST didn't know either. TST didn't even know. So that was huge. Very proud of that. And then Mysterious Frank came in, and then w when I met him, I I pulled uh, Corporate Alex to the side. And I was like, "Is there anyone else that we can get?" Because why am I not surprised? He's scaring the you children. You have a choice, and you just <laughs> you just go low. <laughs> He's scaring the kids. No, uh, I mean, talk about a guy just absolutely killing it. The attention to detail, the speed in which he turns around the podcast, uh, the little trinkets. And then for me, big Howard Stern guy, big fan of the show. And the t it's just great to have. I mean, I feel like you're, in many respects, my Baba Booey. And that's probably the greatest compliment that I could pay anyone. You know who Baba Booey is, right? Yeah. And Fafafohai, I'll take it. Um, Fafafui. Uh, there's a, a bunch of different monikers, but it's just great to have someone. I used to do a radio show in college, Saturday mornings. No one would listen to it. W-E-R-W, -E Syracuse. My mom and sister were my only listeners. And I think I've mentioned this, right? I, I had a fake producer on the show named Lester, Lester C. Dearson. And I used to talk to him. Of course, there was no one there. I was in an empty room. But 
this, like what I would do, I'd be like, what do you think about that, Lester? Oh yeah, he can't talk. He's behind the thing. You have become my Lester. And that's a, that's a great compliment. Oh, thank you. I hope you realize that uh, because now I can actually say something to someone and you can respond. So it's just been great. I'm very thankful. <clears throat> and I'm thankful that most importantly that I have met more people who are loyal and, uh, you know, um, uh, loyal is the word, but also like respectful and, and, and hardworking than the opposite, because I've certainly met the opposite as well, but they have been few and far between. Um, not to mention the great team at MMA Fighting and all the other people that I work with as well. Man, to come from the characters that I was around in a previous life to now, I am very thankful and I will leave it at that. So thank you for the great question. That was, uh, that was fun. Now, who's going to say nice things about me? Is uh, Should we go around the table? Yeah, I was no, wondering, are we, are we having a toast uh, to you now? Uh, Ali. Uh, hi, Ali. I hope you're doing well. Long time no speak. Hi, Ariel. What can be done to ensure more challengers outside of the top five get title fights too? Uh, title fight shots. Hmm. Uh, there are some killers out there outside of the top five, like in welterweight, Bilal, Brady, Shavkat. Yet we are constantly exposed to rematches. As a fan, I'd rather see the new different guys, like the ones listed above, given uh, chances than <clears throat> Masvidal, Covington, Edwards get rematch after. Yeah, I mean, this happens. This happens. They just got to work their way up and build their profile, build their name. This issue will never go away. By the way, let's not complain about Leon Edwards getting a title fight. His first fight was in 2015 against Kamar Usman. Pre-championship, prelims, that dude deserves it. Uh, Vin Diggy, happy warrior Wednesdays. All right. Uh, please rate these contemporary phrases used by today's generation. GC and Frank Mysterio can help conjugate from one to 10. How much do you like the term mid? Don't love it. Frank, what about you? Honestly, I don't like it. GC? I like mid. Yeah. You use it? Mid. Yeah. Every once in a while. I'm still in my twenties though. Telling someone to touch though. grass. I don't even know what that means. Does that mean go outside? Yeah, just like someone go like take a hike? hounding you on the internet. Yeah, go touch grass, bro. Like, log off. You like it? I don't use it that much, but I get it. Frank? I don't like it. I like, like Connor used the one kick rocks the other day. I thought yeah. that, was, that was more effective. Old school. Sus? This hate man it. says hate one it. you're intimately familiar with. Hate it. Yeah. GC? No, I don't hate it. I don't hate it either. Yeah. yeah, you guys can just go back to playing your Among Us. Frank is sus, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so so <laughs> great. great. <laughs> try hard? What's a try hard? Like someone just tries hard? Is there? I, I've never really heard that one as like yeah, a phrase. Uh, like a try hard. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Like annoying, like does too much, extra. Like a goody two top. shoes? Yeah. Oh, this is kind of ringing a bell. Is that you? No, I was talking, thinking, oh, thinking you, more GC, but... Oh, wow. I, th I thought you were taking a shot at BJG. You've wow. you've actually called him. <laughs> Coming in on crypto like that. Yeah. No way. Uh, you said this. No. This guy is freaking crawling. I see him. I'm he just put interviews. his headphones on to find out what's going on. He's crawling under the uh, the thing. He's yeah, freaking but, hanging from the Yeah, but rafters. that's not being a tryhard. Like, that's like... That's just working hard. Going above and hard. Yeah, working I hard. I agree. No, it's... Try hard is like you're doing too much. Yeah, like going on vacation. Like you're doing too much. Uh, filming. It's people like Frank that look down on that behavior. I actually applaud that behavior. Yeah, yeah but that's not what a try hard is. Try Got hard it. Is okay, like, okay, okay. My bad. What about yeah, yeah. dog water? I've never even heard that. Oh, yeah. What it's is that? like bad. Just, just bad? I've never heard this one. Say it to me in a sentence. All right, let's say where I like a... Uh, we ordered queso at a restaurant. It's just like, oh, man. You said queso? What? We ordered what yeah. restaurant? We ordered queso at a restaurant. You tasted it. Oh, queso. Chili con queso. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say queso or not? Just like, yeah, I ordered cheese at the restaurant. I don't think I've ever had queso that was a dog order. But I understand the sentiment. Hmm. Uh, Vinny says, uh, P.S. If you ever tell Walter to touch grass after he beats you in chess or coop, uh, you will have plus 100 dad points. I don't know if I can say that to my son. He told me to get wrecked. <laughs> That's still like a good one. That's a good <laughs> one. such a visual. Of them and this is after you guys played Coop? Yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'll, I'll say this. I don't block, you know, I've said this before. I don't block anyone on Twitter, except for if you're like super, super, you know, offensive. The only time I block is when you complain about the lineup of the show. And one person today said this lineup is mid. I'm like, yeah, sorry. The foreign studio guests weren't good enough for you. And so that was an instant block for me. So sorry, bud. McKinney, what's good, Ariel, and the entire MMA Hour team? My question today is regarding a topic that a lot of sports fans hold near and dear to their heart, particularly GC, that being sports memorabilia, that is being sports. Uh, I know that you're a big memorabilia guy yourself with constant additions to the MMA Hour set and fighter immortalizations. By the way, I'm still waiting for JRC's picture, but today I want to know what personal piece of sports memorabilia is your most sacred and why? For me, it would have to be my WrestleMania 20 T featuring Kurt Angle, HBK, Triple H, Chris Benoit, the legendary Latino Heat, Eddie Guerrero on the front. It is significant being that it was the first Mania I ever watched and loved ever since. Outside of that, my brother Sean and I got a signed picture with the Minch, Cyril Ganwell at the first UFC London card this year. Would love to hear everyone weigh in on this topic and all the best from Derry, Ireland. What about a guy from Ireland saying Minch? I love that. Uh, GC, you got one? Was his name Connor McKinney? Or just said McKinney? McKinney. Someone hit me up from Derry Island about their uh about their their t shirt store. I, I bought one. They have some really cool stuff on it. I think what do they it's have? the same guy. Just like cool graphic t shirts. Yeah, I oh. bought one. A place called Storefront. Favorite memorabilia. Mm. It's tough. I Probably my know. UFC Long Island poster. Stop. Uh, my dad gave me a signed Herschel Walker Georgia helmet. Uh, wow. How do you feel cool. about it now? I feel like it's been devalued a touch with his latest <laughs> antics, but uh, I mean, he's still like the greatest Georgia player of all time. So right. that, that was cool. I met Matt Ryan, Falcons. I oh. uh, met him, got a signed picture from him and everything. I don't have like a ton of like really cool memorabilia. I more of just have like the merch. No, no, I get that. What about you, MF? Um, for me, it's a uh, an Arsenal scarf that I got in London. Why? I wanted to go to an Arsenal game, and um, it didn't work out timing-wise, so I just got a souvenir and stuff. Are you an Arsenal fan? Yes. Wow. Have we talked about this? Uh, occasionally, yeah. Mm, I don't know about that. Thierry Henry? Is that your guy? Yes. Arsene Wenger? Yes. <laughs> I feel like you don't know who these people are. You know why, what? Why are you an Arsenal fan? <laughs> Everybody in West London... I'll leave it at that. All right, fair enough. Um, I have a lot. Very hard for me to choose from. I used to go to baseball games with my brother and get autographs, and we have binders filled with these cards, autograph balls, all this stuff. If I had to pick one, I used to love a player on the Expos named Lenny Webster, and Lenny Webster was number 25, and he was the backup catcher for the team in the early 90s. He was uh, Jeff Facero's personal catcher, meaning he would only... Uh, he would only play when Facero was pitching. So he'd only play every five days. And he was this kind of short, stocky guy. And he was just cute. He had like a little bubble butt. And I just loved him. I loved him. He was my guy. Like every time he played, I was like, Lenny Webster is clutch. I love this guy. And uh, I used to like shout him out, shout him out, shout him out, shout him out. And then one day he said, my man, I got something for you. And he brought me his bat. Uh, and then he signed it for me. And I still have it at my parents' house. It's broken. And uh, yeah, he saved it for me, and I thought that was awesome. So shout out to the great Lenny Webster. There's a lot. I have a Walt Frazier signed jersey, um, a lot of cool stuff. Batting gloves, balls, ton of, like I have a Cal Ripken signed ball that I got. Barry Bonds was a total dick to me, but still signed my ball. Uh, Tony Gwynn was super cool. I was wearing a Houston Astros hat, and he's like, I'm not going to sign your ball unless you throw that hat on the field. And so I just threw my hat on the field and then he signed it and then he got me the hat back. Great memories. By the way, shout out to the San Diego Padres. What did Barry Bonds say to you? Barry Bonds was the biggest dick. So I used to go to these games, thank you for asking, two hours before. And we'd always go to the visiting side because that's where the stars were and they were coming in and you could get the Expos guys anytime. So Bond, this is like, you know, Bonds, he's the man. He's on San Francisco now, no longer Pittsburgh. And all these kids are crowding over him, over the dugout, like, Barry, Barry, Barry. So I gave him um, my ball, and I had a Sharpie. Because you, when you give someone, you know, the ball to sign, like, you want it to be on a Sharpie. You don't want it to be with a pen or a pencil. And this guy was holding onto a pen, like a blue pen. And so I give him the ball, 
and uh, he's about to sign with the pen. And so I said, oh, do you mind just using my Sharpie? And he, he looks up at me. This is freaking Barry Bonds in his prime. And he goes, are you signing the ball or am I signing the ball? And I said, oh, uh, I said yeah, you are. And he's like, all right, I'm going to sign it with whatever I want. Then he, so like if you have a baseball, you know there's a sweet spot where the, where the seams come. It's almost like a, 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 like a sad face and a happy face. And there's that spot in the middle. That's where it's of most value. Not that I was ever going to sell these things, but it just looked the nicest. This guy... 100% on purpose, uses the pen and goes out of his way not to sign it in the sweet spot. Oh, man. And so I asked him, could you sign it in the sweet spot? And he said, kid, I'm signing this wherever I want to. And maybe it was a little ballsy after the, you know, the pen comment, but he was just mean. Now, to his credit, he signed. Ricky Henderson was also a dick. He just didn't sign and was just like mean to everyone. And then you had like sweethearts like Tony Gwynn. But anyway, great memories. That was kind of fun. Hello, Newman. Hello, Ariel. The acronym GOAT is thrown around a lot these days, but we recently lost two of the greatest of all time at what they did in Vince Scully and Bill Russell. Couldn't agree more. What a horrible last few days. Now, they were obviously older, and so it's not a shock, but these are, I mean, giants in their field. They are heroes, legends, world-renowned, universally loved, praised, better human beings outside of the arena, stadium, whatever, than they were inside. Just, I mean, absolute kings, in my opinion. Um, and the two, I mean, I mean, Vince Scully, best to ever do it. Bill Russell, you can make the same case for him as well. I subscribed to Peacock and watched SummerSlam this past weekend, and I was thoroughly entertained. I was a huge WWF fan as a kid. And in the early 90s, but I stopped watching around the time Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigler were the main event of WrestleMania because I thought it had gone downhill. A lot of people would agree. I never really paid much attention to wrestling since then. I missed the whole Attitude Era and never really watched The Rock or Stone Cold. With my Peacock, Peacock subscription, I've been able to go back and watch the events from my childhood. I watched the 92 SummerSlam from Wembley. What an event. And on Sunday, and it was incredible. One thing that really stood out was how good Vince McMahon was at doing play-by-play. -play. What are some other events or eras that I should go back and watch instead of the Apex card on Saturday? Golly. Uh, Vince was great, by the way. Vince was amazing as an announcer. I mean, uh, I guess mid-90s is when you stopped. You got to go watch SummerSlam, excuse me, Survivor Series 97, The Screw Job. Anything from 98, 99, 2000 was incredible. WrestleMania... 17 was maybe the best one, X7. WrestleMania 18 was incredible because it was Rock Hogan. Um, yeah, that, that whole era. Pretty much like up until the invasion. The invasion pay-per-view was fun, but then it got all jumbled. And then the brand split. It was like from like 98-ish to 2002-ish. And then it got all weird. That was the sweet spot. Go back and watch any of that. Mole, we can touch... Again, the subject of fights we never... Can we touch again the subject of fights we never got that we wish we did? The one I wanted, but never hear anyone else talk about, was the potential John Jones versus Yoel Romero fight at light heavyweight. Meh. I mean, great fight, but like, is that the one? Yoel always struggled to make 85, so maybe you could lend some insight to us as to why we never saw him make the jump to light heavyweight while in the UFC. Uh, well, they were both managed by the same guys at the time, so I don't know if they were pushing for that necessarily. They're both FRM guys. Even Malky. Uh, Josh, hey Ariel, after Mysterious Frank's suspect sleepover at GC's house the other week, it got me thinking. If you were the guest, who would be the best and worst host of a Helwani slumber party out of GC, Frank, and New York Rick? Considerations, cleanliness, betting setup, general banter, hosting capabilities, ambiance, etc. Much love to the crew, Josh. I mean, one guy asks me to serenade you guys. The other one wants me to crap all over you. What's up with that? Hey, yeah, you got to take the good with the bad. What am I supposed to say to this question? You just answer the question. No, I'm not answering that question. It's a horrible question to ask. So you let Lewis pick the question and you're saying it's a horrible question. Okay, what would you say? Uh, just do it at your place. No, he's saying if you were the guest, who would be the best and worst host? Oh, okay. Yeah, um... 
So Connor gets best guest. I mean, best host. Excuse me. Is it, probably it, best guest yeah. too. I'm bringing snacks and stuff. Yeah. Um, Who's the cleanest? Rick is the cleanest. Like if you ever look at his background, it's all blurry, like me, and makes me feel safe. Okay. And then you would be the most organized. Wow. Okay. I thought you were gonna say something completely different. I'm gonna be like in the corner. I'm not gonna bother anyone. I'm not gonna ask for anything. I'm not gonna make a mess. Um, I, I mean. I think I'll be the best guest. You won't even feel my presence. You won't even show up. <laughs> that would probably, yeah, that, maybe that's what you're going for. No, maybe. Uh, no, I feel like all three would be the best. I mean, I can't pick. It's too hard. Uh, Abay, greetings, Ariel. First of all, two fingers to those crying about you answering WWE question, especially because I often ask them. Yeah, two fingers. Yeah. My question today is, who do you see benefiting mostly from Triple H heading creative. I could literally name 20 superstars, but I've narrowed it down to three. Baylor, Ripley, Owens, Ciampa, Baszler, and Walter, not Gunther. Yeah, I agree. They should go back to Walter. We're poorly undervalued by Vince. Sorry, I know that wasn't three. <laughs> I was like, just thinking, that's not three, buddy. Who'd you add to the list? Also on a side note, under Triple H, I no longer worry about how they'll build Gable Stevenson. This is my point. There's so much positivity. There's so much promise, excitement. I mean, all these people, name them. Honestly, I'm curious to see what they do with NXT. I had a chance to, uh, I tweeted about this. I met Jacob Casper. Did I mention this on Monday? I might have. At the uh, tryouts, and he's trained with DC. He's helped DC uh, prepare for fights. He lived at his house. He and his brother, the Creed brothers, they're going to be huge stars they're in NXT. I just hope they go back to what NXT was. I mean, there was a time NXT was selling out Barclays Center. Now I don't know if they can sell out, you know, the studio here. I really just want to, uh, you know, I, I really just want to uh, see Bray Wyatt come back. Now I see some chatter here. I mean, do you guys want to take this uh, online or offline? Uh, New York Rick says Connor is the best host and guest, no doubt. Wow, high praise from New York Rick. What do you think of that, Connor? I second it in the chat. You said I'm typically a humble man, but I think I have to agree. <laughs> You're definitely getting a what should I bring text before I make my way over. Good vibe check on the overstaying my welcome. It's a, yeah. Do you think Frank would uh, would stay too long? Frank seems like an overstay his welcome kind of guy. Like it was supposed to be a Saturday Sunday sleepover, <laughs> and then he'll ask like, "Is it cool if I sleep over Sunday night?" I mean, a back-to-back -back sleepover would be the most insane request I've ever heard. Frank, I'm probably going to sigh before I answer he was going that. to ask to take a nap before going to work. I offer him all these private rooms. He denies them. All these private... I didn't know I had a pick of more than one. By the way, I'm the best guest. Someone invites us over for dinner. They, I say, what should I bring? They always say nothing. But you still have to ask the question. Then, you know what I usually bring? I'll usually bring like two to three bottles of wine... Two yes. six packs of something of like, even though I don't drink any of this, maybe a snack or two. That's a great guest. Banana bread. I'm a big banana bread guy. Make it yourself, store bought. Store bought. Yeah, I can't. Uh, no, I honestly feel like, like I have my birthday when I invited you. Oh, oh um, there's a great place, like a fresh bakery. Yeah, yeah, Sorry yeah. yeah. To interrupt you there, Frank. Yeah. Okay, that changes fine. thing. Yeah. I thought we were oh, just going oh, no, to no, no. I'm not talking, no, no, no. I'm not talking about like, no, I mean, this is like an actual high, oh, high oh, quality. That's actually bakery. probably better than getting it homemade. Oh, because people are like, whoa, this is amazing. Where wow. Well, wow, local stuff. One shopping center you can do all this at? No, uh, across the street. You make multiple stops. No, 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 no. One parking, one park job, across the street. Ugh. Same, Bush. you know, vicinity. Bush. Also, is this a thing, by the way? Um, the the liquor store, if you want to call it that. I don't know if this is like a staple, but mine sells these incredible, I don't know if it's Icelandic or Nordic, something like that, um, gummies in the shape of fish. Is that a thing? Swedish they don't, fish? No, it's not Swedish, but they look like Swedish fish, but they're just the highest quality gummies that I've ever had. No, you should bring some to us. I should. <laughs> it's only at the liquor store? Yes. Oh, that's, are they is that, wine no, gums? Or, is that yeah. like a thing that, that liquor stores do or is it just this place? It sounds like just that place. just sounds uh, like this place. You mentioned so gummies? Yeah. Uh, you know I live in a, a, a Jewish yeah. neighborhood down in Brooklyn. Yeah. I have fallen in love with these uh, kosher 
gummy bears sold at my oh, yeah. local store. Best High gummy quality. bears I've ever had. Ever had. Uh, do they have uh, gelt? Like chocolate gelt, Hanukkah gelt? I'm sure they do. Yeah. I've never, I don't know which, uh, what brand is it? It's not Haribu, right? No, 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 no. Like, the, like Haribu is like kind of see-through. Yeah. These are like... Haribu's not kosher because there's gelatin in it. Right. I think that's why I like them so much because there's not gelatin. Mm. Reminds me of the Scooby-Doo gummies. Real ones, no. Back in the day, the blue Scoobies. Great. I don't know what that Great is. Times. The blue you know, Scoobies. Like I said. What? Real ones, no. Real ones, no. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think I need to... Uh, I need to go back and buy those gummies and bring them in. They're yeah, fantastic. I, think, I don't know. And these kosher gummy bears. I mean, yeah, he's we could do a little. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll bring in a couple. Don't I mean, want I'm you telling to go out you, your like, way or anything. a little. An open pack is an empty pack of these gummies. Wow. So you know what? I like to push back. I think I would be up there. I, I have no doubt that you'd be a great guest. You'd be in there. You'd walk in. You say, "What's good?" You know, everyone's happy. Everyone's excited. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know, man. The pushback you gave. What pushback? Thinking of dropping down to number two. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you have in terms of what I'm getting, getting. Yeah, you're getting an entire collection of. I, I have the box. Like they, 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 they break out a box for me, and I walk in there with a the box. And everyone's like, "Oh, you've outdone yourself again." And my wife's always like, "Why are you buying all this?" Because I want when someone goes out of their way to make me a meal, or at least invite me over, I want them to say to their spouse when I leave, "Man, that Helwani is a good time." And I'm not a good time. Like I'm not drinking there. I'm not like. But you know what? Mensch. This guy went out there of his way is. to make there us feel Mensch. appreciated. That's all. Good manners. I know they do, you know, good manners, South, all that stuff, Southern gentlemen. You don't know about what it's like in in, uh, in Quebec, up North. Speaking of which, Xavier, 514, that's my area code. Salut, Ariel. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on a theory of mine regarding some of the unfair criticism you've received through the years. Oh, wow. How about that? As a native of Quebec, you have inherited both the, both the Francophone and Anglo-Saxon cultures that make up the province. Thank you. In the latter, interviews are seen as a platform for interviewees to promote themselves and usually consists of relatively easy questions. Conversely, in French culture, interviews are more of an oral match where the interviewee must put up with a barrage of hard questions and defend their stance. This is seen as a way to wade through the BS and provide authentic answers. While part of your audience may not be familiar with this approach, it has definitely contributed to your success and set you apart from the typical MMA interview platitudes. Wow. Continue le bon travail, mon homme. Wow, that's very nice. No question there, just a nice compliment. I appreciate it. Without a doubt, if you think I'm a good interview interviewer is because of one person and one person only. And that's my mom. My mom is a great listener and a great question asker. And I think I developed all of that from her. So all praise mama knows. Olajuwon, after an Ariel, yesterday's Nick Diaz. Uh, I'm reading these too quickly. Yesterday was Nick Diaz's 39th birthday. Happy birthday, Nick. Just wondering. What your favorite fight of his outside of his fight with Paul Daly and your favorite moment of his as well. Have a great show and day. Man, um, I, I think you got to go with Takanori Gomi, right? You got to go with Takanori Gomi. You got to go with the Gogo Plata. That's a great moment. The win over Daly, great moment. Robbie Lawler fight, tremendous moment. Beating BJ Penn. Where you at, George? Where you at, motherfucker? Where you at? Big moment. Someone's going to clip that off for sure. Um, yeah, the guy's the man. Elite XC. Uh, getting to cover a Nick Diaz fight in Stockton was amazing. He fought Thomas Denny. I was there. That was really cool. The Strike Force run was great. Cyborg. Uh, Zaromskis. There's only one Nick Diaz. What a legend. I hope he's doing well. Trey, shalom. Hopefully I can make it into the mo, mo Hopefully I can make it into the popular crowd this week. Anyways, I saw Tatiana Suarez make some comments that she anticipates a comeback before the end of the year. I hope so. She's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, what if in the history of the sport. How big will her return be for the strawweight division? And who's a great opponent for her? Just get her in. I don't even care. Get her to fight anyone. Give her the easiest matchup. Just get her mojo back. It's been so long. It's been three plus years. Just get her in. 
I've reached out to her. Maybe when she announces her comeback, she could come back on. Uh, but I really don't care. Like to me, get her the easiest fight possible. Just build her back up. Hi, Ariel from Taco Enthusiast. I'm interested in hearing your take on the events leading up to the Jake Paul versus Hasim Rahman cancellation. While I understand that Rahman signed a contract with stipulations that he wasn't prepared to meet. My opinion is that Jake Paul Camp negotiated exactly as boxing promotions always have in poor faith with stipulations that create unfair advantages. Interesting. For all of Paul's talk about changing boxing and prioritizing fighters and fighter pay, I'd argue that his camp's negotiation tactics were exactly the kind of tactics that have turned people away from boxing for years. What are your thoughts and how do you view the contract negotiations events leading up to the canceled bout? I wish you would have expanded on this because I'd love to know what you are referring to when you say they negotiated in poor faith. Didn't they agree to a deal? Didn't he sign a contract to fight a 200? And then didn't they agree to fight a 205? What's what's the, the bad faith? Like, I get the fact that the weight wasn't ideal for him, but it's not like the world was clamoring to see Jake Paul versus Hasim Rahman. Like, this was the opportunity. If he couldn't make that weight, he couldn't make the weight. But why should he fight Hasim Rahman at 215? So if you're implying that they did something shady or that they pulled the plug too early or that they knew it would turn out this way, I don't know why they would go down this path if they knew it was going to turn out this way, then okay. But I really don't see... I guess the only thing that you could say is they pulled the plug too early. Like they didn't sit around and wait to see if maybe they could come to terms at this weight or that weight. But there's so much for him to lose... I don't know, 200, 205, what are they going to do? So I wish you would have expanded on your comments so I could understand where you're coming from. Um, rehydration, all that stuff is, look, you have to understand in boxing, you're your own promoter. So of course you're, especially when you're that young and that early in the game, you're going to look for scenarios that favor you. Everyone does that. But there's nothing that I saw in the buildup to this that I feel like it was in poor faith. Like it was, they weren't, you know, tricking Rahman, swindling him, lying to him, or anything like this. Even the pay per view point stuff, like it's all there. It's like he found out after the fact. He agreed to it all before the fact. Wonka's made. Hey, Ariel, wondering why does the UFC like to do most of its pay-per-views on the West Coast and South, while the big sports cities on the East Coast, such as Boston and Philadelphia, rarely get pay-per-views or even fight nights. Uh, I mean, right now they're going to the places that are going to accept them the the, the, the easiest, pay them the most to come. Um, historically, it's always been a very West Coast-based sport, but this, which, I mean, this is just, you know, pandemic ages, like go look pre-pandemic, and they were pretty much all over the map. So Texas, Florida have now been very open to giving them what they want, rolling out the red carpet. So that's why they've been Texas, Florida. I mean, that is the East Coast. Florida is the East Coast. Um, obviously, Vegas is their home base, so they're going to do events there. But pre-pandemic, they were all over the place. Okay, just a couple left. Uh, Christian, Ariel, did you consider stepping in to fight Jake Paul on short notice after the fight against Rahman fell through? I can't imagine that you'd pass up the opportunity to headline at the prestigious MSG and show off that Helwani boxing. Uh, you know, there were some talks, some brief, very brief discussions, but no, I would never do that. I, uh, I was bummed. I will admit I was bummed. It was just such a great opportunity. Showtime, MSG, I love doing those in-ring interviews. Ugh. By the way, I sort of got over it, and now you reminded me of it, and now I'm sad all over again. I was really bummed. I was really, really bummed. Anytime I could work a show and not have to get on a plane and leave my family is like the greatest, and this one was like the greatest of all the greatest. I've I've been to events at MSG, obviously Nick's. As far as combat, you know, I did the the 205 event, I did the DC event, I did the um, George St. Pierre against Bisping event. I was high up in the rafters. I sat press row for Taylor Serrano, but never in the ring or anything like that at MSG. That would have been freaking cool as hell. Jake Draws. Hey, Ariel, a few years ago, I remember you mentioned that you had never touched a drop of alcohol your entire life. That is not true. I've never said that. But lately, it sounds like you've loosened up a bit and we'll have a beer from time to time. What brought this change and what is your favorite drink? I've never said that. Uh, when I was younger, actually, I used to, I mean, I was never crazy, but I had the odd Jack Daniels. They, I used to feel like I was cool 
by drinking Jack Daniels because Mick Foley used to talk about Jack Daniels and I thought he was cool, believe it or not. I read that in his book. Um, so my friends would be like, give me a Labatt. And I would say, I only drink Jack Daniels. I feel like Frank respects that, right? You respect that stance, correct? Um, yes. JD? I mean, I like Jack Daniels just fine. Give me an old fashioned. An old fashioned with Jack Daniels? I don't know. I just like saying old fashioned. Okay. Yeah. Um, but then for a period I stopped. But by the way, there's no real reason. I just don't really like how I feel like you're bloated. You're this, you're that. You're acting crazy. Um, now I'll have the odd thing if I feel like it, if I really want to have a good time. Uh, you know, oh, I think my go-to is probably Guinness, believe it or not. A nice Guinness is very refreshing. Good for you. Yeah, you, you like that? a Modelo? I do like a Modelo. It's a different experience though, right? It is, yeah. Modelo, very light. Um, Guinness and the polar opposite. Sure. It's like eating a steak. Love it. But... Then it very becomes refreshing. very refreshing. And right. That's when you know you have a problem. It's a what we call a pregnant pause. Yeah, just reading stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, I, uh, I don't love hard liquor. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that. If I had to pick one hard liquor, if you will, pro uh, proper 12 is probably my... Liquor of choice. Have you ever had Proper 12, Frank? I have not. GC? Yeah. Still trying to find Howler Head, though. <laughs> we need to have a like a, a get-together where we have some Howler Head on the thing. We have some Proper 12. Some Puncher's yeah. Chance. That's, yeah, Medellin's Puncher's Chance. Yeah. Yeah. I have a Puncher's Chance, and my friend was over, John Beer, and we had, because we had not seen each other in three years, it was the only thing I had. We took a shot of Puncher's Chance. How about that? Well, on a when, Sunday evening. When you text me... What should I bring? I'll text you back. Puncher's Chance? Bring the bottle of Puncher's Chance. <laughs> and Even if it's open? And the is, gummies. Is that poor form to bring a open bottle? No. In fact, just put it in a decanter. Mm. And then, so it looks all ornate. <laughs> but yes, I've never said that I... Puncher's Chance in a decanter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't it like a black liquor? Mm. It's, I think it's bourbon? Bourbon? I want to say it's rum. What's your drink of choice, GC? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I like White Claws. <laughs> you know, I just yeah, had. A, I just had. <laughs> I just had a White Claw for the first time in my life on Saturday. Pretty refreshing. I was at a barbecue and they had them. I said, you know, I never had this. It was all right. It was very like seltery. It's very. It's like a. Yeah, sigh. I mean, I love. During the pandemic, I got like addicted to sparkling water. Mm. Beer, though, I like Guinness. I like playing the Guinness game. You do like Guinness. Oh, wow. love it. Oh, you bring it down to the G. You try to get it in one with the, the letters. Oh, right. You know, my friends uh, from BT, they were playing this game where there was a, a cup of water and they're pouring the water and you have to get it right to the top and they're freaking out about oh, this I've game. Oh, I've heard of that, yeah. They were like going nuts like it was the, the World Series. It is an important game. Because you, everybody comes and dribbles a little bit in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then whoever spills it. It's like Jenga. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's your drink of choice, Frank? Uh, Spirit-wise, right? Uh, like a Yamazaki, Japanese whiskey. I knew you were going to have something like very obscure <laughs> that no one... <laughs> what are you talking about? First of all, what do you mean spirit-wise? Like You're asking what kind of spirit I like. Beer-wise, Miller High Life. Miller High Life, huh? Yeah, followed by Modelo and then Guinness. Oh, okay. Um, you're not one of these like IPA guys. Hmm, I don't like. I used it. to be stronger to them, but uh, why do people care so much about all this? That's what no, I want to. Like, know. You like wine, right? Not really. Okay. Well, have you ever been to like a vineyard? No. Nah. So people always talk about wine. They're like, oh, I like drinking wine because it reminds right. me of Tuscany and this. Right. Thing. I actually was hanging out at a brewery in Seattle, mm -hmm. and like you could smell the hops, and then you drink the beer that they make from the hops, and it's like this is one and the same, and you take a bottle with you, you know. Also, it smells pretty bad, right? If you don't like that herbal kind of earthy smell, sure. But. I used to live right next door to the Brooklyn Brewery in uh, Williamsburg. Hey, you didn't like it? it stunk. It you was horrible. <laughs> but a brewery, oh, you guys are talking IPAs. Right. I don't know what it was, but it was the horrible. The vineyard smelled great. So, I, isn't I it annoying? We talking like beer. Wine would be my... That's your number one? Oh, for That's sure. That's class. Red or Dude, white? Yeah. What's your I'm, go -to? I, I'm actually a white one. Really? Yeah. Pinot Grigio? Yeah, that Chardonnay, Riesling something. Wow. No wonder you were freaking living it up over there in Europe. I do like reds, though, fancy too. Fancy shoes. I like them both. Mm. 
Gun to my head, though. Yeah. Yeah, going white. I like a good Manischewitz. Hmm. You familiar with that? No. Really? I feel like you're lobbing something up for me. No, I mean Manischewitz. Frank, you know Manischewitz, right? That's the red wine. Kosher wine. Yeah, but it's still... There's like one... There's one in that market, and it's Manischewitz, and they freaking dominate everyone. And it still has alcohol in it, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can get the grape juice, or you can get the red wine. Now I feel very... I prefer a sparkling dry white wine. See, you know what pisses me off when you go to one of these places, and they're like, hmm, what would you like, uh, earthy? Would you like a fruity? Like, it's, it all tastes the same. Let's not pretend. That's not, no. Like, I think once you drink more of it, and you start to develop a palate for it. Is there anything more annoying than being with someone at dinner and they're like, "This is like a curb enthusiasm <laughs> bit." Like no, you've seen that, right? Seen, no, they're like this. I mean, that is no, but that's that's. Have you ever been with someone who sent yes. it back? Oh no, my god! Who sent it back? Oh yeah, of course. Really? Yeah. I would die. I would. I would collapse under the table. I would be so embarrassed. This is literally a curb enthusiasm episode. Never seen it. They're like, would you do that, GC? Would you send it back? No, no, I'm not like a, I'm not like a wine snob. Okay. It's just like, it's like the nice, it's a nice middle ground of potency between beer and, and liquor. I feel like Frank would send it back. Good. That's why you yes, said that. Frank I'm not a high level wine drinker, Frank but I understand why they do that. If it wasn't poured properly. Wow. I understand why they do that. It makes sense. It's their gig. It's their hobby. Why do they do that? They're like... Because they're tr they're looking for the legs on the glass. They want to smell it because most of the taste comes from the smell. What does the legs mean? The legs is like when you see it start crawling down the side of the glass. Like you will hear somebody say, oh, this has nice legs. It's after they <sighs> what? swish it around and they're looking for that viscosity on the inside. Of wow. The glass. It's a whole thing. It's like. This is actually dunking pretty on impressive. NASCAR, where like there's a I lot more a, involved in it than just like the there's no dunk. boxed wine. You know, people... I took a master class on wine. I'll, I'll give you my login info. Wow. Yeah. Do you know about the legs? Yeah. The legs, the tan. The fact so, that you don't is actually kind of surprising. So because you keep mocking it like this, I'm offended. <laughs> What are you looking for? Hmm, we have a uh, oh, 1967. This is so not okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, what goes well with that steak? Hmm, ah, oh, shut the hell up. Just take whatever it is. Does anyone ask any of these questions? Hmm, what goes well? No, you want your stupid drink? Just have your drink. I think all of that should be abolished. I don't think that should be a part of the culture. Oh man. Yeah. How about that? There's your hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last one, Aaron Pete. Good day, Ariel. Thank you for making my work commutes great. You're welcome. My partner and I go for night walks and talk about the show. Wow. Wait, wait, wait. Frank. What's wrong? I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. She thinks his partner, Aaron's partner, thinks the voice is hilarious. By the way, what about this couple that goes on night walks and talks about this show? I don't know whether to be like feeling like complimented or a little concerned. I think it's pretty cool. One quick question. You have a thriving podcast and a live YouTube show. I host a show myself. I'm trying to grow an audience and grow audience retention. Any advice on how to help listeners connect with the podcast and tune in proudly? Wow, what a great question, Aaron. Uh, well, first of all, good luck to you. It looks like you write the blog uh, bigger than something, but I can't click on it. Um, there's a few things. Consistency is key. If you say you're going to put out a show every Tuesday, you got to put it out every Tuesday. In fact, I love, you know, I got a boat to pick with my friend, uh, TST. I love the podcast cheap heat. And I like to listen to it on the commute to the studio Wednesday morning. Cause they come out Tuesday this morning. No cheap heat, no nothing, no heads up. Where's the pod? Where's the pod? Consistency is key. You need to put it out exactly, you know, we are on Mondays at 1 p.m. We've been on Mondays at 1 p.m. for as long as I can remember. And I remember talking to Patrick about this, Patrick McAfee. And he was like, you went head to head. I was like, bro, you may be more popular and more famous and all that, but like, I've been here. This is my spot, for better or worse. This is my spot at ESPN. Was, we're going to go down with this spot. 1 p.m. is perfect. 6 p.m. in Europe, most places, 7 p.m. some places, 10 a.m., Anyway, consistency, be consistent. Look at the landscape, look at what other people are doing. Take elements from here and there, 
take qualities from here and there, but create your own style. Be unique. Be different. Don't do what everyone else is doing. Um, if you want to be a great interview, be a great interview. If you want to be a great analyst, but be different. Good quality, right? Good quality audio, very, very important. Good quality video, extremely important as well. Uh, if you're doing a podcast, obviously the audio more important than the video, but it all has to sound as professional. If I see a podcast, I'm excited. Oh, this guy's on. And then I hear it's like super hollow, crappy audio. I'm not going to listen to it. Can't be bothered. So be consistent, be different, good quality. And then the big one is be a freaking beast. Work hard. And when you think you're working harder, work even harder and be professional. Reach out to people and be thankful and be grateful and then be professional even more. And then don't take up too much of their time. When you have a guest come on, have them on for 25 minutes so that the next time you want them on, they'll come back. If you have them on for an hour, they're going to be like, oh, that was a waste of my time. I ain't coming back ever again. Historically on this show, it's been 20, 30 minutes tops for the Zoom interviews. You can't have people on forever because you want them to come back. Obviously, every show is different, but that's the way I always... Uh, have viewed it. So um, you want to be respectful of people's time and you just got to work, work, work. It doesn't, I mean, it's not easy. I've been doing this now. I graduated in 2004. That's when I feel like the career started, right? And obviously it started in different directions and I was down the TV production route and then I went here and then I went there. But 2004 is a long ass time ago. It was almost 20 years ago now. And I really started this MMA thing in 2006, 16 years ago. So the biggest thing that I see from people out there is like they want things to happen tomorrow. They want things to happen next week, next month. It takes a long ass time. And guess what? I don't even feel like I'm even close to where I want to be. I just feel like I'm getting started now. Now it's finally starting to be in a spot where I can get started. The last 16 years, we're working just to get to this point where I can start the race. So you have to have patience. You have to work hard. You have to be professional. You have to be different. You have to have good quality stuff. You have to be consistent all these things together. And you know what? I never reached out to anyone to ask me or to ask them how to do this. You just kind of have to figure it out yourself. You just kind of have to recognize what you want as a consumer and then give that to your consumers. Um, and the more you do it, the better you'll be, the more reps, the more comfortable you'll be, the more comfortable you'll be in your skin with your voice, speaking. I'm still not there yet. Believe me, I'm still not there yet. It's, it's a process. Work at it, take it all in, consume other people's stuff, listen, be open-minded, be humble, be grateful, be appreciative, work your ass off, be professional, and uh, over time, you'll grow your audience. I think that's it. It's a nice way to end the show. What do you think? No? Oh, what's I that? that one. GC. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Oh, I'm doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, you just sent me the message. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. Listen, you sent me a message here. It's on hey, the air. Happy birthday <laughs> to Bridget Wolf. Yes. From Wild Wolfpack Treats. I mean, she, she she had her birthday on Monday. I missed her message, but she said it would just make her day if she got a shout out on her favorite show, The MMA Hour. Yeah, uh, and then I saw that she sent your dog some treats as well. My roommate's dog, yeah, London. Yeah. I saw that. I I'm sure like, he's wow. gonna love him. When did you get a dog? But it's the same thing. I mean, London you love is that the dog. people's dog. Oh, love that dog. What kind of dog? It's like a Shih Tzu Terrier mix. Maybe one day London and Macha can have a play date. Yeah. I mean, he's a clown, certified clown. Is that a good thing? Yeah, he's a how good old? Ball. Three. Frank's met him. Frank? Nicest dog ever. Nicest dog ever. Wow. Mostly uh, all mouth, but that's all right. That's weird. What yeah, do you mean like, by that? I was sitting there watching the fights. He just was all sitting over. there licking my elbow. Wow. Just a lot of licking, just a, a lot of just saliva. Just licking the elbow. Like, I'm like, yeah, he's, he's, he sneaks in a lot of licks. Okay. But he's gotta, very he's respectful. You're like, hey, to. I don't want to be licked. He's like, cool. And then he'll, he'll go away. Got to set the boundaries. All right. Well, happy birthday to Bridget Wolf from Wolf, Wild Wolf Pack Treats. Great product. And uh, she was telling me that uh, now her husband is saying that uh, Bridget and I are BFF because I interact with her on uh, the Instagram stories. So thank you for your service. Oh, yeah, you want to say something? I was going to say, weirdly, the Wild Wolfpack Treats sending uh, uh, dog treats. I also got a, me and Frank tested out a hot sauce this morning from <laughs> Wild Wolf Hot Sauce. What? Yeah, weird. They have the same names. It was a blueberry hot sauce. Very good. Where did you test this? 
here in, in the control room this morning. They sent it to you? Yeah, blueberry hot sauce. It's good stuff. Blueberry hot sauce? Yeah, blueberry jalapeno hot sauce. Wait, who sent this? It's, it's right there. I just can't. Who sent this to you guys? Uh, w- Alex is grabbing me the hot sauce right now. I'll, I'll put it up here. But it was a gift? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Someone sent it and they want it on this criticism. Here it is. Wild Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> this Wild Wolf also. Well, we already put a dent in that. What is this? I want to know if this is like a husband-wife thing. The wife does the dog treats. The husband it's got to be. You, the you, hot sauce. How is this? This is not. can't be that small of a world. Spelt the same? See, that's the thing. This is no E on the end. The dog treat no E on the end. <laughs> I can't believe this is like a real Wow. Thing. Wait, blueberry hot sauce? Blueberry jalapeno hot sauce. It was good. Very it's tasty. Good. Yeah. Really? That yeah, is, it is good, man. How come you guys didn't tell me that you got hot sauce? You were busy. You were on the phone. Uh, didn't really pay you as a hot sauce. Guy. I mean, by the way, love hot sauce, but I'm a... <laughs> can't I, eat a talkie. But I'm a, but I'm a one hot sauce kind of guy over here. What's your go-to hot sauce? You know what my go-to is. Dustin Poirier's hot sauce. That is a good yeah, hot sauce. me too. That's my guy. Volk loved that hot sauce. He did love it. Well, actually, it wasn't really his hot sauce. Yeah, it was fake. Old yeah, hot sauce. It was fake. <laughs> and by the way, Takis are great. I mean... They are great, but... Some of the in best... moderation. Some of the best uh, Australian delights that I've ever had. Oh, man. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. All right, we're out of time. Frank, you can hear my music. Time to go home starving all this food talk starving thank you to everyone who sent in questions appreciate you all very much so just to you would bring two or three bottles of wine to somebody's house but then criticize them for like trying to taste it what do you mean well because you were just giving people a hard time for drinking wine but then you had mentioned how you like to share wine with people i bring I, i bring them like an unopened bottle of wine i got you What's the problem? I don't get it. What oh, if yeah. they open it and they start swirling it and sniffing it? What are you going to be like, like oh, you know what, don't do God. that. that was- yeah. By the way, no one does that in their home. Only at restaurants do people do that. You think I'm going to bring wine to someone's house and they're going to do the whole bit like... I've been no. to wine tastings at people's homes. Yeah, but no one's going to do... Like, if I come over and say, here's your white wine, you ain't doing this. You're just going to drink it, right? Am I wrong? You, you know me. Am I wrong? You're not, you're not wrong. You see? So why do you do it in the restaurant? Come on, give me a break. It all it all tastes the same. You're not fooling anyone. You don't know what you're looking for. Earthy, fruity, this, that, and the other. Come on, enough. All right? No one's impressed. Uh, I'm impressed by today's guests. Thank you very much to all the guests who stopped by today. Peter Murray, CFO, CEO. Huh? I'm thinking about the accountants. CEO of PFL. Uh, good luck to them on Friday. Anthony Pettis, that was great to catch up with Showtime. Good luck to him on Friday. Good luck to Josh Silvera. Good luck to Stevie Ray. That was fun as well. Thanks to all of you for all your great questions. Thanks for watching this week. And of course, back on Monday, same time and place. Until then, we say, Ooh.